We're back. You're looking at the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, in just about uh, five minutes from now, Henry Hyde will gavel that Judiciary Committee to order. He has the votes, 21 Republicans, and there are 16 Democrats on that committee as they begin on this historic day. The question of whether Bill Clinton, President of the United States, is guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors, should this committee then recommend to the full House that it vote articles of impeachment. The House would then send it to the United States Senate for an impeachment trial. It's only really happened once before. It was President Andrew Johnson, the first president after Abraham Lincoln. He survived by one vote. The committee did vote articles of impeachment, recommended it to the full House in the course of Richard Milhouse Nixon, but he resigned before there could be a Senate trial. I'm joined now by two astute political observers, Jonathan Alder, Newsweek columnist and consultant to MSNBC, and also David Marinus, who has been working closely with MSNBC, widely regarded as the single most astute biographer of Bill Clinton, first in his class with the name of the book. Jonathan, let me begin with you. Do you think that this now means that impeachment will become a regular tool of American politics? Uh, actually, Tom, I don't think so. Um, even the Republicans have a sense that this process has spun out of control. It isn't doing them very much good uh, politically. And if you look at it constitutionally, lawmakers don't want this. They don't need this at this point. And I don't think you're going to see this as a, a routine tool. But there will be a lot of investigations by both parties after this. And David Marinus, the president, is famous for compartmentalizing his problems, setting them aside. He's in Japan today working on world financial markets, but he's got to be paying very close attention to these proceedings. Well, I'm sure he will be paying attention to them, not as he would have uh, if it had been like it was two months ago, however. It's amazing that he got to this point where now it's Ken Starr who has to go there and sort of defend his work against the man he's investigating, and his other nemesis, uh, Newt Gingrich, is gone. So Clinton will be watching it tonight, late at night, but it won't be with the same terror in his heart that he might have had. All right, David Marinus and Jonathan Alter, thank you very much. David Marinus uh, has written extensively about the ability to, of Bill Clinton to reinvent himself. Never a greater demonstration of that than this fall, especially after last week's election. We'll be back with more of the opening of the impeachment hearings on MSNBC and this NBC station in a moment. He's been the one asking the tough questions. Now it's his turn to be questioned. Witness Ken Starr's testimony on the impeachment hearings all day today on MSNBC, on cable and the Internet. Imagine TV. 200 miles of bad road. 600 bottles of nitro. One mercury mountaineer. That's nitro, highly explosive. Payment on delivery. Any questions? Yeah. Who's he? Hey, hey, highly hey Bones. Yeah? That would be your driver. <laughs> mountaineer? No problem. Number four, please. This is just too good to keep to ourselves. I know. We have got to let the people know. You're right. No, Everybody, I have an announcement. 10 10 3 2 1 is now better than ever. How's that? Now you save 50% on calls over 10 minutes. Half off 10 minutes? What about calls to Mexico? International calls over 10 minutes are half off too. Jimmy, <laughs> you forgot something. Double fries and make it fast. <laughs> storm system that brought heavy snow to North Dakota and northern Minnesota yesterday and last night, moving away on up into southern Canada, while another storm lurking off the Pacific coast will bring heavy rain and strong winds to Washington and Oregon tomorrow and tomorrow night. Pretty good temperature contrast across the country as well. Highs today in the southern states, mostly in the 70s, and a lot of 20s for lows up north tonight. is an NBC News special report. The impeachment hearings. Reporting from Washington, here's Tom Brokaw. Good morning, everyone. You are looking at the House Judiciary Committee hearing room in the Rayburn House office building. We're just momentarily now 
the Republican chairman, Henry Hyde, will drop the gavel to begin the proceedings to consider the question of whether President William Jefferson Clinton is guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors, whether this committee should recommend to the full House of Representatives that articles of impeachment should be approved, whether the House should then send those articles of impeachment to the Senate for a trial of the President of the United States. There have been so many changes in the political and legal climate of this investigation in the last nine months, especially at this moment. The momentum does seem to be in the president's favor, but we've yet to hear from independent counsel Ken Starr, who will be literally the star witness. He'll appear for about two hours with an opening statement today in which he will argue that this is not a private matter between the president, his family, and Monica Lewinsky. Then, in fact, he'll claim the president misused his authority as power of the president of the United States that he lied to a grand jury and that he obstructed justice. The decision will then be up to the members of this committee first in the full House of Representatives, but because this is a quasi-legal proceeding, those members in this committee and in the full House also will have their ear on what you are saying out there in the general public. And thus far, all the polls are indicating that a vast majority of the American public does not want impeachment proceedings to go on unduly long, and they do not think that this president of the United States should be removed from office. As they continue to gather there in the House Judiciary Committee hearing room, let me go now to NBC's Tim Russert, who is our Washington Bureau Chief, moderator of Meet the Press. Tim, under the best possible circumstances for the new leadership in the House Republican, they've got a new speaker in Bob Livingston. He's made it pretty clear that he'd like this to move along expeditiously. Do you think we'll have a resolution by the first of the year? I do, Tom. I think the Judiciary Committee will vote uh, for an article of impeachment or against it uh, early in December. If they vote for one, it will go to the full House floor. There'll be a special session of the House of Representatives and they will vote it down. It will never get to the Senate as we speak this morning. And NBC's Lisa Myers, who has been covering very carefully this investigation from the outset, what about uh, the tenacity, what about the fighting spirit of Ken Starr as he appears before this committee today, given all of the political winds of change that we have been witness to here in the past couple of months, Lisa? Tom, Starr is very eager to finally be able to make his case to the American people. I think on a personal level, he wants them to see uh, that he is not a, a sex-obsessed prosecutor out to get the President of the United States. He will make the point that in a number of his other investigations, he did not come up with any evidence against the President of criminal wrongdoing or of an impeachable offense. But he says the Lewinsky matter is different, that there is, in his view, clear and convincing evidence that the president repeatedly lied and obstructed justice and in his view that this is a serious offense because the president has his a duty to faithfully execute the laws he will say yes these are lies about sex but in a sexual harassment case in which the president's conduct with other women in the workplace was relevant evidence and lisa does he feel that his case has been diminished at all by the decision of Chairman Henry Hyde to broaden what was described as his original agenda of witnesses to include people who were involved in the Kathleen Willey case and other matters, possibly including campaign finance uh, and campaign fundraising? I don't think that he cares about the Republican decision to broaden uh, the scope of the evidence. After all, uh, Starr looked heavily at the Willie matter and uh, has not been able to prove criminal wrongdoing, but may in fact bring some indictments there. I think he has been quite distressed, though, at the way Republicans have handled this on the Hill, that they just dumped all the information out there, that there was very little uh, effort to present it in, a, in context. Uh, he just feels that he did a lot of, he and his prosecutors did a lot of work, and that it hasn't been taken with sufficient gravity. Uh, preparing for his appearance today, they did do, as it's normal in these kinds of circumstances, some mock run-throughs for Kenneth Starr. Can you tell us something about that? Well, about three weeks ago, they began the preparations, and basically, for hours at a time, Starr sat there and uh, fielded some of the most hostile questions his uh, fairly tough prosecutors could throw at him. What they tried to get him to do was be less verbose, less academic and less genteel and be more direct and clear so that the American people would get his message. He will, right. try, to try, he will try to stay above the fray, but he may push back if he feel Democrats, feels Democrats cross the line. All right. At least I just want to tell our audience that they were just looking at two of the principles on the president's side of the agenda there. That's uh, Chuck Schumer on your right 
who is a member of the House Judiciary Committee, but about to become a member of the United States Senate. He defeated one of the president's principal nemesis on Capitol Hill, Alphonse D'Amato, the Republican uh, from New York in the Senate race, and Barney Frank on the left, whom you saw just a few moments ago, who has been from the outset uh, one of the president's most vigorous defenders, and we'll be hearing a lot from him during the course of these proceedings, but probably not today. Today it's been arranged a little bit like a kabuki dance. We know who's going to speak and when. Uh, we'll have opening statements from the chairman, Henry Hyde, the 74-year-old Republican who is widely revered on Capitol Hill. He's a Chicago pal who played basketball at Georgetown. And John Conyers. John Conyers is a well-known liberal in the, on the House Judiciary Committee. He's from Detroit, and he has been an active defender of the president as well, frustrated by some of the rules that the Republican majority have been able to impose on these proceedings, but un unable to do much about it because in, on Capitol Hill, votes count and the Republicans have them. Uh, we'll have a two-hour opening statement from Kenneth Starr. There will be an examination of that statement by David Kendall, who is the president's lawyer. You may remember him from his brief appearance at the conclusion of the president's grand jury testimony on August 17th, one of the darkest days in the White House in the last uh, six years when a lot of people thought that the president had been pinned to the canvas by the Republicans and then he began his remarkable comeback once the Republicans decided that they would release the grand jury transcripts. That seemed to turn the tide of public opinion. Again, to show you what is going on in the House right now, that's John Conyers, who is speaking. Um, Michael Moore, who is uh, a man who has made a lot of populist films, very provocative, is here, and he's been involved in making a documentary about a lot of this as well. Um, you may remember his film about uh, Detroit and laying off auto workers. Most recently, he picked uh, Nike as a target. That's Henry Hyde. Henry Hyde, the member of the, uh, who is now the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, um, a man with very strong views about abortion. He is uh, a devout Roman Catholic. Uh, in most other matters, he is uh, thought to be more moderate, but he has been um, very vociferous about his strong feeling about the rule of law. And just to his right, in the beard, is Dave Shippers, a friend of his from Chicago a former federal prosecutor who is a registered Democrat but has been a bit of a bulldog as Henry Hyde's uh, counsel in all of this and he too believes that the president has been um, guilty of impeachable offenses and has made that case before this committee in some preliminary proceedings. Mr. Shippers will have an active role. Let's go now to the hearing room and let the process uh, begin about eight minutes late. And we begin with not a microphone on Henry Hyde. There is, a, we're now seeing, let's see Ken Starr as he enters on another camera. The man that uh, we have heard from only briefly in many instances as he's exited his home in the morning or has emerged from the federal courthouse. This uh, investigation that he's been conducting has gone on for four years now, at a cost of more than $40 million. He was originally appointed by a three-judge panel to look into possibilities of uh, federal law violations involving Whitewater. Whitewater, in his testimony today, however, will be only on the margins as it applies directly to President Clinton. Ken Starr is a former federal judge. A lot of people will be calling him judge. He, too, uh, has become a lightning rod in all of this, um, especially for the president's favorite political operative, James Carbo, who declared war on Ken Starr. Ken Starr will make the argument today in his statement, however, that this was not a personal vendetta, nor was it about sex and the per president's personal moral code. It was about the violation of the federal legal statutes. <coughs> This is, how this is how historic moments begin. First with uh, a delay, making sure all the systems are in place. Everyone has uh, picked out their ties carefully today. 
their wardrobes. Pursuant to notice, I now convene the committee for a hearing pursuant to House Resolution 581, the resolution which the House adopted authorizing an inquiry into whether to recommend impeachment of the President of the United States. The chair intends to recognize himself for five minutes and the ranking minority member for five minutes. Each member may be permitted to place an opening statement into the record. After the two opening statements, my own and the ranking members, the chair intends to recognize the witness, the independent counsel, Mr. Starr. Without objection, after Mr. Starr's presentation, the chair will recognize minority counsel, Mr. Lowell for 30 minutes to question the witness. Majority counsel, Mr. Shippers, for 30 minutes to question the witness. And subsequent to questioning by committee counsel, each member will be recognized to ask questions under the five minute rule. Subsequent to members' questions, the president's counsel will be recognized for 30 minutes to question the witness. And the chair recognizes Mr. Delahunt, the gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I have a motion at the desk. The clerk will uh, report the... Uh, why don't you read it, read it, Mr. Delahunt? Mr. Stark can report it. I move the counsel to the president be recognized for two hours to question the witness. Well, the chair uh, states that Mr. Starr is here to help us adduce and understand the facts. The hearing today is not a trial, nor is it White House versus Ken Starr or Republican versus Democrat. Rather, the hearing today is another step in our attempt to carry out our constitutional duty to determine whether facts exist, which indicate that the President of the United States committed an impeachable offenses. If this committee hours. and the full House determine the president has committed an impeachable offense, a trial may be held in the Senate. With this in mind, the chair believes the time allotments for questioning are eminently fair. As far as giving the president an opportunity to present his version of the facts, I would first ask the president and his counsel to respond to the 81 questions we submitted to him two weeks ago. This will go a long way to helping us gather and understand the facts involved in this matter. Furthermore, the president has a standing invitation to come before this committee for any amount of time and present us with his version of the facts. As I compute the timing for questioning the witness, the Democrats, including the president's uh, uh, counsel, have 140 minutes of questioning time, the Republicans 135. Uh, the Democrats are permitted two separate councils, that is to say the Democrat members, Mr. Lowell, and the President's Council. We have one. Our council will get a half hour, Mr. Lowell will get a half hour, Mr. Kendall will get a half hour, so um, uh, it's, I don't see any imbalance there. Mr. Lowell, the Democratic Council, will go before any of the elected members at Mr. Conyers' request, and I'm happy to grant that. The President's Council will have unlimited time to present his witnesses w at the end of our hearings uh, when uh, they're ready to do so. And, and uh, so the rule that we're operating under, uh, which is the same rule that was used in the Rodino uh, era, uh, Rule 4 of the Impeachment inquir uh, Inquiry Rules specifically St uh, states that the, the president's counsel may question any witness subject to instructions from the chairman respecting the time, scope, and duration of the examination. And so um, with that uh, uh, statement, uh, the gentleman's motion is denied. Mr. Chairman, I move to uh, uh, strike the last word. <coughs> Well, the gentleman's not recognized for that purpose. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman point of order, order on Mr. The chairman. Motion? Point of order, Mr. Chair chairman. What, what is the point? The point is that the gentleman from Massachusetts made a motion. The chair then spoke to the motion and has denied under the rules the right of the gentleman who made the motion to, in fact, respond to it. And I make the point of order that the gentleman is entitled to his recognition. I'm sorry, I didn't. I was distracted. What is the point of order? The gentleman made a motion. Yes, the chair I know recognized the gentleman to make a motion. He then, the chair then spoke to the motion and is now denying the maker of the motion the right under our rules to speak to his own motion. 
and the gentleman has a right under our rules to be recognized to speak to his motion. Well, I'll, I'll recognize the gentleman. Go ahead, Mr. Delahunt. Thank you, but Mr. But I have ruled on the gentleman's motion, but go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The committee has given the independent counsel a full two hours to present his version of the facts, a version which most Americans are already fully familiar with. At the same time, the majority has seen fit to give the President's counsel all of 30 minutes to question Mr. Starr. This is meant to be the President's sole opportunity to confront his accuser during these proceedings. Would the gentleman yield for just no, a I second? I will not yield. I submit this as a grave disservice, not only to the President, but to the integrity of these proceedings. It is a complete and unwarranted departure from the precedence of this House. During the Watergate hearings of 1974, President Nixon's counsel, James St. Clair, was given all the time he needed to respond to the evidence and cross-examine witnesses. This is as it should be. We are talking about the impeachment of the President of the United States, a grave constitutional moment in our national history. I know that some members of the Watergate Committee argued that the President's counsel, Mr. St. Clair, should be given limited time to speak, but those views were wisely overruled in the interests of fairness and decency. President Clinton is entitled to the same consideration and respect shown to President Nixon on that occasion. No more and no less. The record of the Watergate hearings make clear that at no time was Mr. St. Clair given a time limit for his presentation or his examination of witnesses. Is there any legitimate basis for a different rule today? The majority may point out that the Watergate testimony was heard in closed session. Well, today we sit before the cameras and the American people. Yet that being true, it is more important, not less, that the President be given a full and fair opportunity to respond to the charges that are being leveled against him. They may argue, as they did in a recent letter to the White House, that the President and his counsel are here, and I'm quoting, only as a matter of courtesy and not of right, end of quote. In other words, be glad that we are letting you testify at all. With all due respect, Mr. Chairman, if the goal is justice, this cannot be a satisfactory response. A 30-minute presentation is especially inadequate when one considers that Mr. Starr has been, has been preparing for weeks a presentation that the White House saw for the first time last night. According to news accounts, the witnesses spent the better part of the past several weeks conducting videotaped practice sessions. The President's counsel has had all of 16 hours to prepare his response. Precedent has been abandoned at almost every turn. We rushed to release Mr. Starr's transmittal within hours of its receipt before any review by this committee or the President's counsel. We posted thousands of pages of secret grand jury testimony on the Internet, and we abdicated our responsibility to make an independent examination of the facts before voting to commence an impeachment inquiry. Let's do this right. I urge support for the motion and yield back the balance of my time. The uh, gentleman uh, has made a point that uh, uh, the president needs more time to present, uh, you said present. Uh, he will be given all the time in the world to present, unlimited time. Point of order, Mr. Tod Chairman. Today's hearing is to hear from Judge Starr and to question him. Point of order, Now, the Mr. chair, I don't yield for any points of order. I would like to make my statement. I thought you had already made your statement, Mr. Well, I Chairman. know that's what you thought, but you couldn't possibly know when I'm through with my statement or not, so please let well, me... Well, under the rules under me... which we're operating, Mr. Chairman, we don't know anything about the, the process. We had regular order at one point. We are, I'm asking for regular order. I'm requesting regular order. Regular order is we get five minutes to address this issue. The Chairman has already had his five minutes. Now, I want to tell this committee, and especially the Democrats, I had a meeting with Mr. Conyers and Mr. Frank a couple of days ago, and I suggested I would be very liberal with the gavel. 
And if Mr. Kendall is on a line of questioning that he deems pertinent, I don't intend to shut anybody off. Now, you are, you are, you, you are disrupting the continuity of this meeting with these uh, uh, adversarial We're motions. disrupting a railroad, it seems like, Mr. Chairman. That's what we're disrupting here. The, the gentleman will observe decorum, uh, and I would appreciate it if you would be, speak when you're recognized. I have not recognized you. Mr. Chairman, I have a Can point of information. Those? I'd like a point of information, Mr. Chairman. I finished talking. Appreciate being recognized for a point of information. Now, I'm trying to be cooperative. I said I would be liberal in giving people time, and uh, point I of recognize Mr. Mr. Frank. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and I appreciate We did have that meeting, and you accommodated one of our requests particularly in terms of the order, um, and you did say you would be with regard to Mr. Rawls. We talked about it not on a strict gavel, but I did think that with regard to the President's Council's request, we were not authorized uh, to speak entirely for that. We could speak for our Council. It does seem to me there's a reasonable difference of opinion here, and we ought to just vote on it. I don't think it's going to be uh, delaying the committee process. Mr. Delhans made a motion, but have the vote, and we will uh, we will decide it. But we we did Point accept that vote. assurance with regard to Mr. Lowell, but uh, not with regard to the uh, the independent party of the White House. Mr. Chairman, I call for a record vote. It's very well. The record Chairman. vote is on the motion. Mr. Chairman. Um, the Who's seeking point of recognition? Mr. Chairman. M m well, just a moment, m uh, Ms. Jackson Mr. Lee. Chairman. I've got to recognize Mr. Nadler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Thank Nadler. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I w before we vote, I'd like to speak to Mr. Delahunt's motion, and I appreciate uh, the chair's uh, comments, but the fact is that as of now, today is the only noticed day for hearing of this committee. We've been noticed that some witnesses will be called for depositions. But as of today, Mr. Starr is the only witness that we're aware of before the committee considering the impeachment of the president. As such, given any consideration of fairness and equity, uh, the president's council, and for that matter, the Democratic Committee Council, should have as much time as they request. There should not be a time limit on it. Now, the president's council requested 90 minutes. That should be without question granted. If he asked for five hours, that should be granted. We have requested, and I don't know what, we've requested an hour for our council, and I don't know what, uh, what uh, uh, assurances have been given, but I heard, I heard uh, the chair say 30 minutes. That should be an hour. Um, and the fact is, Mr. Starr, your calculation of, 200, of 135 minutes and 140 minutes, Mr. Starr is going to sit here for 120 minutes and tell us why the president ought to be impeached in his opinion, and he's entitled to do that. But you add to that the other time that the... But the, 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 you add to that the other time, the one side is going to have 260 minutes and the other side is going to have 135 minutes. Now, I really suggest that if the President of the United States in, asks that this committee in its one day of scheduled hearings should have 90 minutes to cross-examine Mr. Starr, that's the least that can be asked. And I've looked at lists of questions and subjects which Mr. Starr's report and, frankly, his statement that we got last night raises as obvious questions. And uh, there's a lot more than 30 minutes there. And the Constitution guarantees the right of anyone who is accused of any wrongdoing. And fundamental fairness guarantees the right of anyone to have the right to confront the witness against them. Mr. Starr is the only witness. And, frankly, that right ought not to be limited to 30 minutes. Um, so I support Mr. Delahunt's motion, and I hope that in the interest of fairness, because you know, this proceeding must not only be fair, but must be seen to be fair. Thank if we end Mr. up... Thank you, if Mr. Nadler. Uh, Mr. Now recognize... If we... Chairman. I want to recognize Ms. Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, I'd Thank like to you, see... Mr. Nadler. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to take this opportunity for a point of information and, and also uh, to speak briefly to the motion of Mr. Delahunt. Uh, first of all, I think it would be well to clarify the point that the President's Council stands as the President's Council. Uh, the Democrats and the Democratic Council of the House stand separately in their responsibility to the impeachment process. And so to collectively add up numbers to suggest that we have in total some 200, 100, five minutes, whatever it may be, Mr. Chairman, I would respectfully disagree. For in the instance of the St. Clair representation of Mr. Nixon, 
he had an unlimited amount of time because it was distinct under the Rudinho Watergate Committee, which this committee alludes to the fact that it is following, that they had a separate responsibility from the House Democrats. And I respect that because I will ultimately, with my colleagues, have to vote up or down on articles of impeachment. Secondarily, let me say, Mr. Chairman, just in terms of the context of justice in America, we have always argued that justice is blind, but we've never argued that justice is gagged. You cannot have the defense in a courtroom sitting gagged and bound without any opportunity to refute the accused overwhelming opportunity to talk and talk and talk. We do not talk by death, if you will, the accused in the courtroom. We allow a defense. And I respect the process and the procedure of this very awesome and somber occasion. But I cannot for the life of me understand, Mr. Chairman, why we would gag and bound uh, the counsel for the White House, the counsel for the president, what goes against every single grain uh, in the history of America. When we did it with the Chicago 7 or 8 in Chicago, we have never lived down that tainted process. I certainly don't equate this with that, but I would argue that we should never repeat history and gag the defense would the for yield? this particular issue. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, I would ask Green. with Parliament. all due respect right. uh, that we clarify that the President's Council is a President's Council, the House is separate, I am separate, and we cannot collectively add that time together. And I would ask that we vote would, for would the Mr. Delahunt's motion. Chairman. Uh, the, Chairman. the Chair Chairman. Would, would like to uh, suggest to the gentlelady with, with respect the chair doesn't intend to bind and gag anybody. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Anybody. I appreciate it. Uh, the chair Mr. is Chairman. going and to And I be would like for us to, chair, to support his uh, a motion by acclamation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I, I didn't hear the end. You want a motion by acclamation? I would ask both Republicans and Democrats to support Mr. Delahunt's motion of fairness by acclamation leading into or taking up the point that the chairman just made, that he has no intention to gain... What we have underway here is the opening skirmish between Democrats and Republicans. The Democrats have seized the microphones, in effect, to make the point that David Kendall, who is the president's counsel, is limited to about 30 minutes, although Henry Hyde said if he's in the middle of a series of questions, he would let him go a little bit beyond that. And the Democrats are making the political point here for you as much as for the legal proceedings that they believe that the rules are stacked against them, that they won't have a full opportunity to examine Ken Starr in this one day of hearings. He has a two-hour opening statement, and as you heard Congressman Nadler of uh, New York say that the, the rules that have been put in place by Henry Hyde mean that the Republicans have about a two-to-one advantage quantitatively in terms of their cross-examination of, uh, of um, Ken Starr. Ken Starr has not yet begun his two-hour opening statement. Uh, Henry Hyde's defense to all of that is that he has submitted 81 questions to the White House. He, if he had the answer to those, he might be willing to change the procedure some. Tim, what do you make? Tim Russett, what do you make of this uh, opening skirmish? Well, Tom, it's clearly an attempt by the Democrats on the Judiciary Committee to set the tone, to set the agenda, to hijack the hearings, if you will and impress upon the American people the whole issue of fairness, the behavior of Henry Hyde, the behavior of Ken Starr, and try to avoid getting into the behavior of President Clinton. It, as you called it early on, a quasi-legal hearing. It's a very political hearing. It's kind of ironic because in his opening statement, Tom, Ken Starr will talk about being involved in hurricane force political winds. And he says that he is not a man of polls, public relations, or politics. By now, that should be obvious. <laughs> clearly, clearly, he was anticipating something along these lines this morning. And the, uh, this is not happening spontaneously. This is a game plan that's worked out well in advance. Uh, each member knows who's going to speak and in what turn before they get there. And Barney Frank, clearly, uh, in the back row, is going to be the quarterback for the Democrats. Uh, this is, this Absolutely. Is, Orchestrated and, and choreographed, as well said. Uh, as you can Mr. hear, each Senator Democratic here. member picking on a different theme. Here's the vote. No. Mr. McCollum. Mr. McCollum votes no. Mr. Geekus. Mr. Geekus votes no. Mr. Koble. No. Mr. Koble votes no. Mr. Smith. No. Mr. Smith votes no. Mr. Gallagly. No. Mr. Gallagly votes no. Mr. Kennedy. No. Mr. Kennedy votes no. Mr. Inglis. No. Mr. Inglis votes no. Mr. Goodlatte. No. Mr. Goodlatte votes no. Mr. Booyer. Mr. Booyer votes no. Mr. Bryant. Mr. Bryant votes no. Mr. Shabbat. No. 
Mr. Shabbat votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Jenkins? No. Mr. Jenkins votes no. Mr. Hutchinson? No. Mr. Hutchinson votes no. Mr. Pease? No. Mr. Pease okay. votes no. Mr. Cannon? No. Mr. Cannon no. votes no. Mr. Rogan? No. Mr. Rogan votes no. Mr. Graham? No. Mr. Graham votes no. Ms. Bono? Ms. Bono votes no. Mr. Conyers? Aye. Mr. Conyers votes aye. Mr. Frank? Mr. Frank votes aye. Mr. Schumer? Aye. Mr. Schumer votes aye. Mr. Berman? Aye. Mr. Berman votes aye. Mr. Boucher? Aye. Mr. Boucher votes aye. Mr. Nadler? Aye. Mr. Nadler votes aye. Mr. Scott? Aye. Mr. Scott votes aye. Mr. Watt? Aye. Mr. Watt votes aye. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. Jackson Lee? Aye. Ms. Jackson Lee votes aye. Ms. Waters? Ms. Waters votes aye. Mr. Meehan? Aye. Mr. Meehan votes aye. Mr. Delahunt? Aye. Mr. Delahunt votes aye. Mr. Wexler? Aye. Mr. Wexler votes aye. Mr. Rothman? Aye. Mr. Rothman votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Aye. Mr. Barrett votes aye. Mr. Hyde? No. Mr. Hyde votes no. Mr. Chairman, there are 16 ayes and 21 noes. And the motion is not agreed to. The chair recognizes himself for five minutes for purposes of making an opening statement. This morning we commence our second public hearing in fulfillment of the mandate imposed on us in House Resolution 581. While the business of impeachment is rare, and happily so, it becomes necessary from time to time when circumstances require that it be exercised as a constitutional counterbalance to allegations of serious abuse of presidential power. It is part of the series of checks and balances that exemplify the genius of our founding fathers. Throughout our history, we've had a number of impeachment inquiries, but this one represents a historical first. Never before has an impeachment inquiry arisen because of a referral from an independent counsel <laughs> under section 595C of the statute. For that reason, we have no precedent to follow on the involvement of the independent counsel in our proceedings. However, it seems both useful and instructive that we should hear from him, since he is the person most familiar with the complicated matters the House has directed us to review. We're holding this hearing to learn the facts surrounding this situation, including those in the referral that Judge Starr sent us September 9, 1998, and to determine whether those facts justify our voting on articles of impeachment. Everyone should understand how this process works. Under the Constitution, the House of Representatives has the sole power to make accusations known as articles of impeachment they may do so by a majority vote. If the House makes such accusations, they are then sent to the Senate for trial. The Senate may convict by a two-thirds vote. Our founding fathers wisely determined that one chamber should accuse and the other should judge. We began our work on November 9 at the hearing when we were enlightened by the testimony of two panels of outstanding academics about the history and nature of the impeachment process. Today, the search for the truth continues as we turn to the underlying facts. And as we begin that search, we turn to one person, Judge Starr, who has a comprehensive overview of the complex issues we face. I thought we should have that overview before we hear from other witnesses. As we announced earlier this week, we will hear from other witnesses in live hearings and in depositions as we move towards a final resolution. In addition, we have yet to hear from the President, and I can assure my colleagues, if and when the President would want to testify, he may have unlimited time to do so. In any event, we are hopeful that the pledge of cooperation we received from his attorneys will soon be fulfilled. Let me repeat my New Year's resolution. It's my fervent hope we will be able to conclude this inquiry before the new year turns. I'm hopeful that all members will bear this in mind as we conduct this search for truth with all deliberate <clears throat> speed. There are many voices telling us to halt this debate, that the people are weary of it all. There are other voices suggesting we have a duty to debate the many questions 
raised by the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Questions of high consequence for constitutional government. David Broder, writing in the Washington Post yesterday, suggested that in our hearings, quote, we will define as a nation the standard of honesty we're going to impose on our president, close quote. What is the significance of a false statement under oath? Is it essentially different from a garden variety lie, a mental reservation, a fib, an evasion, a little white lie, hyperbole? In a court proceeding, do you assume some trivial responsibility when you raise your right hand and swear to God to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And what of the rule of law? That unique aspect of a free society that protects you from the fire on your roof or the knock on your door at 3 a.m. What does lying under oath do to the rule of law? Do we still have a government of laws and not of men? Does the law apply to some people with force and ferocity while the powerful are immune? Do we have one set of laws for the officers and another for the enlisted? Should we? These are but a few questions. These hearings are intended to explore. And just perhaps when the debate is over, the rationalizations and the distinctions and the semantic gymnastics are put to rest, we may be closer to answering for our generation the haunting question asked 139 years ago in a small military cemetery in Pennsylvania, whether a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal can long endure. The chair now recognizes the minority leader, uh, the ranking member of this committee, Mr. Conyers, for five minutes for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman and my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee, we meet today for only the third time in the history of our nation to take evidence in an inquiry of impeachment against a President of the United States. Today's witness, Kenneth W. Starr, wrote the tawdry, salacious, and unnecessarily graphic referral that he delivered to us in September with so much drama and fanfare. And now, the majority members of this committee have called that same prosecutor forward to testify in an unprecedented desperation effort to breathe new life into a dying inquiry. It is fundamental to the integrity of this inquiry to examine whether the independent counsel's evidence is tainted, whether conclusions are colored by improper motive. In short, it is relevant to examine the conduct of the independent counsel and his staff for their behavior impacts directly on the credibility of the evidence in the referral. For example, the committee must understand whether Mr. Starr improperly threatened witnesses if they did not provide incriminating evidence against the President of the United States. Whether Mr. Starr's partisan interests affected the collection and presentation of evidence, and whether Mr. Starr himself violated the law by leaking uncensored grand jury material to humiliate the president. Mr. Chairman and members, contrary to the views that have been expressed by Chairman Hyde that you expressed in letters to me this week as well, these are not collateral issues at all. They go to the very heart of Mr. Starr's referral. To turn a blind eye to these is to continue an unfair and partisan process. Now, no one defends the president's conduct, but even Republican witnesses at our hearing only last week testified that even if the alleged facts are proven true, they simply do not amount to impeachable offenses. The idea of a federally paid sex policeman spending millions of dollars to trap an unfaithful spouse, or the police civil, li or the police civil litigation would have been unthinkable prior to the Starr investigation. Let there be no mistake 
It is not now acceptable in America to investigate a person's private sexual activity. It is not acceptable to force mothers to testify against their daughters, to make lawyers testify against their clients, to require secret service agents to testify against the people they protect, or to make bookstores tell what books people read. It is not acceptable for rogue attorneys and investigators to trap a young woman in a hotel room discourage her from calling her lawyer, ridicule her when she asks to call her mother. But the record suggests, I'm sorry to say, that is precisely how Kenneth W. Starr has conducted this investigation. An independent counsel must do justice both in the specific matter he's investigating and to the system of justice as a whole. While an independent counsel can and should pursue a case with vigor, I and many others believe that Mr. Starr has crossed that line into obsession. And when I talk about obsession, sir, I wonder why Mr. Starr encouraged Linda Tripp to continue to betray and entrap her young unsuspecting friend and to allow her to continue her illegal tape recording without court approval. And when I talk about obsession, I wonder why Mr. Starr ignored his ethical obligations and failed to disclose his involvement in the Paula Jones case, which could have disqualified him from this point of the investigation. Is it just coincident that even before he was appointed independent counsel, Mr. Starr was already in contact with lawyers for Paula Jones? Is it just coincidental that Mr. Starr, until recently, drew a million dollar a year salary from his law firm that represents the tobacco industry, which is fighting President Clinton's effort to deter teen smoking? Is it just a coincidence that this independent counsel accepted a prestigious job at a university funded by one of the president's most persistent and vocal critics, Richard Mellon Scape. Is it just a coincidence that the independent counsel failed to provide this committee with important exculpatory evidence in his referral, casually glossing over the central part of Monica Lewinsky's testimony when she clearly stated that, quote, no one promised me a job, no one asked me to lie, unquote, about her relationship. Perhaps Mr. Starr will persuade us not to be concerned about these matters, but he surely carries the burden of showing us and the American people that these things did not affect his fairness nor his impartiality, nor do I understand why Mr. Starr declined to provide the Democratic members of the committee with copies of documents that we've repeatedly requested? Mr. Starr even says that the president should be impeached because he invokes privilege, but he is quick to raise the privilege argument when questioned about his own conduct, and did so this week when Democrats sought documents concerning his conduct. Over the course of this investigation, the independent counsel complained publicly, and still does, that a lack of cooperation was impeding his investigation. And yet he has now afforded members of the committee the same treatment about which he has complained. This causes us to question Mr. Starr's motives and to lack confidence in his referral. His conduct over the past week has only reinforced my doubts. On Friday, Mr. Starr shipped two new boxes of documents to us and announced an indictment dating back to events occurring before Bill Clinton was even president, pre-1992. On Tuesday, 
the same day that our Republican colleagues suggested that they might want to expand this impeachment inquiry, contrary to the chairman's uh, stated desire to close it down, Mr. Starr shipped four new boxes of documents to us. And last night, we learned that Mr. Starr now sees it fit for this committee to consider Whitewater or other alleged improprieties that he didn't see fit to mention in his referral. The sense of desperation in the face of a failed impeachment inquiry is palpable. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would be remiss in my duties if I did not observe that to date our committee process has not been bipartisan nor fair. All this committee has done since September 9 is to, in a partisan manner, dump salacious grand jury material on a public that doesn't want it. It was you, Mr. Chairman Hyde, who said this process could not proceed unless it was bipartisan. We need to do better than 11th hour unilateral decisions to subpoena witnesses having little to do with the underlying referral. We need to do better in offering the president a full and fair opportunity to participate in these hearings. We have many questions about the way you conducted your investigation, Mr. Starr. Fairness dictates that the committee and the American people learn whether you have created a climate for the purpose of driving a president from office who has twice been elected by the people of this great nation. I thank the gentleman. Today our witness is Judge Kenneth W. Starr. On August 5, 1994, the Special Division of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit <coughs> appointed Judge Starr to investigate what has become known as the Whitewater Matter. Since that time, Attorney General Reno and the Special Division added several other matters, including the White House Travel Office and the FBI file, Files Matters to Judge Starr's jurisdiction. After his submission of evidence, they further added what has become known as the Lewinsky Matter. Judge Starr has a bachelor's degree from the George Washington University, a master's degree from Brown University, and a Juris Doctor degree from Duke University. He then clerked for Judge David Dyer of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and Chief Justice Warren Burger of the Supreme Court of the United States. After serving on President Reagan's transition team, Judge Starr served as counselor to Attorney General William French Smith from 1981 to 1983. In 1983, President Reagan nominated him to serve as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, and he was confirmed by the Senate. Judge Starr served on the D.C. Circuit until 1989, when President Bush nominated him to be the Solicitor General of the United States. As solic Solicitor General, Judge Starr was responsible for representing the United States before the Supreme Court. In November 1993, Democrats on the Senate Ethics Committee chose him to serve as a hearing examiner to review Senator Packwood's diaries for relevant information. Since August 1994, Judge Starr has conducted the investigation of Whitewater and the other matters that have been assigned to him by Attorney General Reno and the Special Division. That investigation has led to the conviction of 14 persons, including a sitting governor of Arkansas in two separate cases, the former number three person in the United States Department of Justice, and two former business partners of the president. Six other indictments are currently pending in the courts. More pertinent to today's hearing, Judge Starr's investigation has led to the first ever impeachment referral under Section 595C of the Independent Counsel Statute. That referral has given rise to the impeachment inquiry we are now conducting. With that, Judge Starr, would you please rise so that I may administer the oath. Mr. Starr, do you s swear that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. 
Thank you. Let the record reflect the witness responded in the affirmative, and Mr. Starr, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I welcome this opportunity to be before the committee. This is your mic on. I was just told to push it away. So some Democrat we'll. told you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that may have been Mr. Delahunt. <laughs> the person did not identify his affiliation in saying that. But this is uh, my first opportunity to publicly report on certain uh, issues and aspects of our work. And I look forward to doing so and uh, seeking to assist the committee. I appreciate both the seriousness of the committee's work and the gravity of its assignment. I have reviewed the statements made by the 37 members at the October 5 hearing. And any citizen who watched that hearing would have been impressed by the depth and the breadth of the discussion that day. Mr. Chairman, I apologize for interrupting Judge Starr, but Judge, could you pull the mic a little closer? Yes, I will. I'll Thank keep you, sir. pulling. <laughs> so I appear before you today in the wake of your own hearings, both on October 5 and in the hearings to which the chair just referred, <laughs> with great respect and awareness of the difficulty of your task. As you know, in January of this year, and as the chairman indicated, the Attorney General of the United States petitioned the Special Division of the United States Court of Appeals for this jurisdiction, the panel that oversees independent counsels. And at the Attorney General's request, the Special Division granted authority to us to investigate whether Monica Lewinsky or others committed federal crimes relating to the sexual harassment lawsuit brought by Paula Jones against the President. Our office conducted a swift yet thorough investigation. We completed the primary factual investigation in under eight months, notwithstanding a number of obstacles in our path. The law requires, as the chairman indicated, an independent counsel to report to the House of Representatives substantial and credible information that an impeachable offense may have been committed. On September 9, pursuant to our statutory duty, we submitted a referral, and we submitted backup documentation to the House, as Mr. Conyers has noted. And I'm here today at your invitation in furtherance of our statutory obligation. Let me say at the outset that I recognize that it is the House of Representatives and not an independent council which enjoys the sole power to impeach. My role today is to discuss our referral and the underlying investigation. Let me then begin with an overview. As our referral explains, the evidence suggests that the President made false statements under oath and thwarted the search for truth in Jones versus Clinton. The evidence further suggests that the President made false statements under oath to the grand jury on August 17 of this year. That same night, the President publicly acknowledged an inappropriate relationship, but maintained that his testimony had been legally accurate. The President also declared that all inquiries into the matter should end because he said it was private. But shortly after the President's August 17 speech, Senators Lieberman, Kerry, and Moynihan stated that the President's actions were not a private matter. In our view, they were correct. Indeed, the evidence suggests that the President repeatedly tried to thwart the legal process in the Jones matter and in the grand jury investigation. That is not a private matter. 
The evidence further suggests that the President, in the course of those efforts, misused his authority and his power as President and contravened his duty to faithfully execute the laws. That, too, is not a private matter. Closer still? <laughs> okay. There's noise in the hall, so I will continue to try to speak up and into the mic. Better. Okay. The evidence suggests that the misuse of presidential authority it occurred in the following ten ways. First, the evidence suggests that the president made a series of premeditated false statements in his civil deposition on January 17, 1998. Those were statements under oath. The president had taken an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. By making false statements under oath, the president, the chief executive of our nation, failed to adhere to that oath and to his presidential oath to faithfully execute the laws. Second, the evidence suggests that apart from making false statements under oath, the president engaged in a pattern, a pattern of behavior during the Jones litigation to thwart the judicial process. The president reached an agreement with Ms. Lewinsky that each would make false statements under oath. He provided job assistance to Ms. Lewinsky at a time when the Jones case was proceeding, and Ms. Lewinsky's truthful testimony would have been harmful. He engaged in an apparent scheme to conceal gifts that had been subpoenaed from Ms. Lewinsky. He coached a potential witness, his own secretary, Mrs. Curry, with a false account of relevant events. Those acts constitute a pattern of obstruction that is fundamentally inconsistent with the President's duty to faithfully execute the law. Third, the evidence suggests that the President participated in a scheme at his civil deposition in which his attorney, in his presence, deceived a United States district judge in an effort to cut off questioning about Ms. Lewinsky. The president did not correct his attorney's statement. A false statement to a federal judge in order to shortcut and to prevent relevant questioning is an obstruction of the judicial process. Fourth, the evidence suggests that on January 23, 1998, after the criminal investigation had become public, the President made false statements to his cabinet and used his cabinet as unwitting surrogates to publicly support the President's false story. Fifth, the evidence suggests that the President, acting in a premeditated and calculated fashion, deceived the American people on January 26 and on uh, other occasions when he denied a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky. Sixth, the evidence suggests that the President, after the criminal investigation became public, made false statements to his aides and concocted false alibis that these government employees repeated to the grand jury sitting at the United States Courthouse. As a result, the grand jury here in Washington received inaccurate information. Seventh, having promised the American people to cooperate with the investigation, the president refused six invitations to testify before the grand jury. Refusing to cooperate with a duly authorized federal criminal investigation is inconsistent with the general statutory duty of all executive branch employees to cooperate with criminal investigations. It also is inconsistent with the President's duty to faithfully execute the laws.
Eighth, the President and his administration asserted three different governmental privileges to conceal relevant information from the grand jury. The privilege assertions were legally baseless in these circumstances. They were inconsistent with the actions of Presidents Carter and Reagan in similar circumstances, and they delayed and impeded the investigation. Ninth, the President made false statements under oath to the grand jury on August 17, 1998. The President again took an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The evidence demonstrates that the President failed to adhere to that oath and thus to his presidential oath to faithfully execute the laws. <coughs> Tenth, the evidence suggests that the President deceived the American people in his speech on August 17 by stating that his testimony had been legally accurate. In addition to these 10 points, it bears mention that well before January of 1998, the President used governmental resources and prerogatives to pursue his relationship. The evidence suggests that the President used his secretary, Betty Curry, a government employee, to facilitate and to conceal the relationship with Ms. Lewinsky. The President used White House aides and the United States Ambassador to the United Nations in his effort to find Ms. Lewinsky a job at a time when it was foreseeable, even likely, that she would be a witness in the Jones case. And the President used a governmental attorney, Bruce Lindsay, to assist his personal legal defense during the Jones case. In short, the evidence suggests that the President repeatedly used the machinery of government and the powers of his high office to conceal his relationship, to conceal the relationship from the American people, from the judicial process in the Jones case, and from the grand jury. Let me turn then to the legal context. That is the uh, primary case that Ken Starr will be outlining this morning before the House Judiciary Committee, outset, citing 10 I points in all. We'll have updates on the impeachment hearings throughout the day on this NBC station and on NBC Nightly News, of course, and we want to remind you that we will have continuing coverage on MSNBC and also MSNBC.com. the referral never passes judgment on the president's relationship with Ms. Lewinsky. The time for the star witness on the Hill has come and gone. With the president on the other side of the planet, how does the White House feel they fared? The news tonight at 9 on MSNBC. I didn't want to buy a new PC every year till commencement. I needed one that would keep up with them. And the misuse of power. The referral cannot be understood without appreciating this vital distinction. This case or matter thus raises the following initial question. Is a plaintiff in a sexual harassment lawsuit entitled to obtain truthful information from the defendant and from associates of the defendant in order to support her claim? That should be easy to answer. No citizen who finds himself accused in a sexual harassment case or in any other kind of case can lie under oath or otherwise obstruct justice and thereby prevent the plaintiff from discovering evidence and presenting her case. Paula Jones, a former Arkansas state employee, filed a federal sexual harassment suit against President Clinton in 1994. The President denied those allegations. We will never know whether a jury would have credited the allegations. We will also never know whether the ultimate decision maker would have found that the alleged facts, if true, constitute sexual harassment. When the President and Ms. Jones settled the case last week, 
the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals in St. Louis was still considering the preliminary legal question whether the facts as alleged could constitute sexual harassment. After the suit was first filed in 1994, the president attempted to delay the trial, or more broadly the proceedings, until his presidency had concluded. The president claimed a temporary presidential immunity from civil suit, and the case proceeded through the Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court of the United States. At oral argument, the president's attorney specifically warned our nation's highest court that if Ms. Jones prevailed, her lawyers would be able to investigate the president's relationships with other women as is common in sexual harassment cases. The Supreme Court rejected the president's constitutional claim of immunity and did so by a nine to zero vote. The court concluded that the Constitution did not provide such a temporary immunity from suit. The idea was simple and powerful. No one is above the law. The Supreme Court sent the case back to trial with words that warrant emphasis. These are the words of our unanimous Supreme Court. Like every other citizen who invokes the district court's jurisdiction, Ms. Jones, the words of the court again, has a right to an orderly disposition of her claims. After the Supreme Court's decision, the parties started to gather the facts. The parties questioned relevant witnesses and depositions. They submitted written questions. They made requests for documents. Sexual harassment cases are often he said, she said, kinds of disputes. Evidence reflecting the behavior of both parties can be critical, including the defendant's relationships with other employees in the workplace. Such questions can be uncomfortable, but they occur every day in courts and law offices across our country. Individuals in those cases take an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And no one is entitled to lie under oath simply because he or she does not like the questions, or because he believes the case is frivolous, or that it is financially motivated, or politically motivated. The Supreme Court has emphatically and repeatedly rejected the notion that there is ever a privilege to lie. The court has stated that there are ways to object to questions. Lying under oath is not one of them. During this fact-gathering process, Judge Susan Weber Wright in Little Rock followed standard principles of sexual harassment cases. Over repeated objections from the president's attorneys, the judge permitted inquiries into the president's relationships with government employees. On January 8, 1998, for example, Judge Wright stated that questions as to the president's relationships with other government employees, in the words of the judge, are within the scope of issues in this case. In making these rulings, Judge Susan Weber Wright recognized that the questions might prove embarrassing. She stated, in her words, I have never had a sexual harassment case where there was not some embarrassment. She also stated that she could not protect the parties from embarrassment. Let me summarize the five points that explain how the president's relationship with Ms. Lewinsky, what was otherwise private conduct, 
became a matter of concern to the courts. This is critical to fully understand the nature of the committee's inquiry. One, the president was sued for sexual harassment in federal court and the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in that case that the case should go forward. Two, the law of sexual harassment and the law of evidence allow the plaintiff to inquire into the defendant's relationship with other women, with women in the workplace, which in this case included the president's relationship with Ms. Lewinsky. Three, applying those subtle legal principles, Judge Susan Weber Wright repeatedly rejected the president's objections to such inquiries. The judge instead ordered the president to answer the questions. Four, it is a federal crime to commit perjury and obstruct justice in civil cases, including sexual harassment cases. Violators are subject to a sentence of up to 10 years imprisonment for obstruction and five years for perjury. Five, the evidence suggests that the president and Ms. Lewinsky made false statements under oath and obstructed the judicial process in the Jones case by preventing the court from obtaining the truth about the relationship. At his grand jury appearance, the president invoked a Supreme Court justice's confirmation hearings as a comparison to his current situation. The president's use of the analogy did not fit the facts in the Monica Lewinsky case, however. But the president, having raised the analogy, let me make it more fitting to the case here. Suppose that there is a nominee for a high government position. Assume that in the confirmation process there is an allegation of sexual harassment. Suppose that several women, other than the accuser who have worked with the nominee, testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Suppose that the nominee then confers with one of those women ahead of time and that they agree that they will both lie to the Senate Judiciary Committee about their relationship. Assume further that they both do lie under oath about their relationship. And suppose further that a criminal investigation develops and the nominee again lies under oath to the grand jury. If that were proved to have happened, what would the Senate Judiciary Committee do? Suppose that the lying under oath and obstruction of justice occurs in a sexual harassment suit brought against the nominee. Suppose further that the false statements and the obstruction continue into a subsequent criminal investigation. What would this committee do? With compelling evidence of perjury and obstruction of justice committed by, for example, a sitting justice of the Supreme Court in a sexual harassment case in which he was the defendant. Those hypotheticals which track the facts of this case put in sharp relief the issue that is before this committee. Let me again stress <clears throat> that it is this House, the House of Representatives, and not an independent counsel that has the sole power to impeach. But I am suggesting that the consideration of our referral be focused on the issues that are actually presented by the referral. Let me turn next to the essentials of the referral. That will include the specifics of Ms. Lewinsky's involvement in the Jones case and the President's actions in response to that involvement. 
The key point about the President's conduct is this. On at least six different occasions, from December 17, 1997, through August 17, 1998, the President had to make a decision. He could choose truth or he could choose deception. On all six occasions, the President chose deception, a pattern of calculated behavior over a span of months. On December 5, 1997, Ms. Jones' attorneys identified Ms. Lewinsky as a potential witness. Within a day, the President learned that Ms. Lewinsky's name was on the witness list. After learning this, the President faced his first critical decision. Would he and Monica Lewinsky tell the truth about their relationship? Or would they provide false information, not just to a spouse or to loved ones, but under oath in a court of law? Eleven months ago, the President made his decision. At approximately two o'clock in the morning, on December 17, 1997, the President called Ms. Lewinsky at her Watergate apartment and told her that she was on the witness list. This was news to Ms. Lewinsky. And it bears noting that the President, not his lawyer, made this call to the witness. During this 2 a.m. conversation, which lasted approximately half an hour, the President could have told Ms. Lewinsky that they must tell the truth under oath. The President could have explained that they might face embarrassment, but that as a citizen and as the President, he could not lie under oath, and he could not sit by while Monica did so. The President did not say anything like that. On the contrary, according to Ms. Lewinsky, the President suggested that she could sign an affidavit in the case and use under oath deceptive cover stories that they had devised long ago to explain why Ms. Lewinsky had visited the Oval Office area. The President did not explicitly instruct Ms. Lewinsky to lie. He did not have to do so. Ms. Lewinsky testified that the President's suggestion that they use the pre-existing cover stories amounted to a continuation of the pattern of concealing their intimate relationship. Starting with this conversation, the President and Ms. Lewinsky understood, according to Ms. Lewinsky, that they were both going to make false statements under oath. The conversation between the President and Ms. Lewinsky on December 17 was a critical turning point. The evidence suggests that the President chose to engage in a criminal act to reach an understanding with Ms. Lewinsky that they would both make false statements under oath. At that moment, the President's intimate relationship with a subordinate employee was transformed. It was transformed into an unlawful effort to thwart the judicial process. This was no longer an issue of private conduct. Recall that the Supreme Court had concluded that Paula Jones was entitled to an orderly disposition of her claims. The President's action on December 17 was his first direct effort to thwart the mandate of the Supreme Court. 
The story continued. The president faced a second choice. On December 23, 1997, the president submitted under oath a written answer to what lawyers call interrogatories, as the committee knows. The request stated in relevant part, please state the name of federal employees with whom you had sexual relations when you were president of the United States. In his sworn answer, the president said, none. On December 28, the president faced a third critical choice. On that day, the president met Ms. Lewinsky at the White House. They discussed the fact that Ms. Lewinsky had been subpoenaed for gifts she had received from the president. According to Ms. Lewinsky, she raised with the president the question of what she should do with the gifts. Later that day, the president's personal secretary, Betty Curry, drove to Ms. Lewinsky's Watergate home. Ms. Lewinsky gave Mrs. Curry a sealed box that contained some of the subpoenaed gifts. Ms. Curry then took the box and stored it under her bed at home. In her written proffer on February 1, four weeks after the fact, Ms. Lewinsky stated that Mrs. Curry had called her to receive the gifts. If so, that necessarily would have meant that the president had asked Ms. Curry to call. It would directly and undeniably implicate him in an obstruction of justice. Ms. Lewinsky later repeated that statement in testimony under oath. Ms. Curry, for her part, recalls Ms. Lewinsky calling her. But even if Ms. Lewinsky called Mrs. Curry, common sense and the evidence suggests some presidential knowledge or involvement, as the referral explains. Let me add another point about the gifts. In his grand jury appearance in August, the president testified that he had no particular concern about the gifts in December of 1997 when he had talked to Ms. Lewinsky about them. And he thus suggested that he would have had no reason to take part in December in a plan to conceal the gifts. But there is a serious problem with the president's explanation. If it were true that the president in December was unconcerned about the gifts, he presumably would have told the truth under oath in his January deposition about the large number of gifts that he and Ms. Lewinsky had exchanged. But he did not tell the truth. At that deposition, when asked about whether he had ever given gifts to Monica Lewinsky, and he had given her several on December 28, the president stated, I don't recall. Do you know what they were? In short, the critical facts to emphasize about the transfer of gifts are these. First, the president and Ms. Lewinsky met and discussed what should be done with the gifts that had been subpoenaed from her. Second, the president's personal secretary, Ms. Curry, drove later that day to Ms. Lewinsky's home, her apartment, to pick up the gifts. Third, Mrs. Curry then stored the box of gifts under her bed. Meanwhile, the legal process continued to unfold, and the president took other actions that had the foreseeable effect of keeping Ms. Lewinsky on the team. The president helped Ms. Lewinsky obtain a job in New York. His efforts began after the Supreme Court's decision in May of 1997, at a time when it had become foreseeable that she could be an adverse witness against the president. 
These job-related efforts intensified in December 1997 after Ms. Lewinsky's name appeared on the witness list. Vernon Jordan, who had been enlisted in the job search for Ms. Lewinsky, testified that he kept the president informed of the status of Ms. Lewinsky's job search and her affidavit. On January 7, 1998, Mr. Jordan told the president that Ms. Lewinsky had signed the affidavit. Mr. Jordan stated to the president that he was still working on getting her a job. The president replied, good. In other words, the president, knowing that a witness had just signed a false affidavit, encouraged his friend to continue trying to find her a job. After Ms. Lewinsky received a job offer from Revlon on January 12, thank you, Vernon Jordan called the president and said, mission accomplished. As is often the situation in cases involving this kind of financial assistance, no direct evidence reveals the president's intent in assisting Ms. Lewinsky in her job efforts. Ms. Lewinsky testified that no one promised her a job for silence. Of course, crimes ordinarily do not take place with such explicit discussion. But federal courts instruct juries that circumstantial evidence is just as probative as direct evidence. And here, the circumstantial evidence is strong. At a bare minimum, the evidence suggests that the president's job assistance efforts stemmed from his desire to placate Ms. Lewinsky so that she would not be tempted under the burden of an oath to tell the truth about the relationship. Monica Lewinsky herself recognized that at the time saying to a friend. Somebody could construe or say, well, they gave her a job to shut her up. They made her happy. And given that the president's plan to testify falsely could succeed only if Ms. Lewinsky went along, the president naturally had to be concerned that Ms. Lewinsky at any time might turn around and decide to tell the truth. Indeed, some wanted her to tell the truth. One of her friends, for example, talked to Ms. Lewinsky about the December 28 meeting with the president. The friend stated that she was concerned because, in her words, she didn't want to see Monica being like Susan McDougall and did not want Monica, the friend's words, to lie to protect the president. Needless to say, any sudden decision by Ms. Lewinsky to tell the truth, whether out of anger at the president or simple desire to be law-abiding, would have been very harmful to the president. That helps to explain his motive in providing job assistance. In mid-January, Ms. Lewinsky finalized her false affidavit with her attorney who sent it to Judge Wright's court in Little Rock. The affidavit falsely denied a sexual relationship with the president and essentially recounted the cover stories that had been discussed during that middle of the night conversation on December 17. Let me turn to the president's January 17 deposition. Some have suggested that the president might have been surprised or ambushed at the deposition. Those suggestions are wrong. The president had clear warning that there would be questions about Monica Lewinsky. She had again been named on the December 5 witness list. On January 12, just five days before the deposition, Ms. Jones' attorneys identified Ms. Lewinsky as a trial witness. In response, Judge Wright in Little Rock approved her as a trial witness. 
Two days later, on January 14, the president's private attorney asked Ms. Lewinsky's attorney to fax a copy of the affidavit. During the deposition itself, the president's attorney stated that the president was, in his words, fully familiar with the affidavit. At the outset of his January 17 deposition, therefore, the president faced a fourth critical decision. Fully aware that he would likely receive questions about Ms. Lewinsky, would the president continue to make false statements under oath, this time in the presence of a United States district judge who would be presiding at the deposition? At the start of the deposition here in Washington, Judge Susan Weber Wright administered the oath. The president swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. As his testimony began, the president, in response to a question from Ms. Jones' attorneys, stated that he understood he was providing his testimony under penalty of perjury. The president was asked a series of questions about Ms. Lewinsky. After a few questions, the president's attorney, Mr. Bennett, objected to the questioning about Ms. Lewinsky, referring to it as, in his words, innuendo. Mr. Bennett produced Ms. Lewinsky's false affidavit. Mr. Bennett stated to Judge Wright that Ms. Lewinsky's affidavit indicated that, in Mr. Bennett's words, there is absolutely no sex of any kind in any manner, shape, or form. Mr. Bennett stated that the president was fully aware of Ms. Lewinsky's affidavit. During Mr. Bennett's statement, the president sat back and let his attorney mislead Judge Susan Weber Wright. The president said not a word to the judge or, so far as we are aware, to his attorney. Judge Wright overruled Mr. Bennett's objection. The questioning continued. In response, the president made false statements not only about his intimate relationship with Ms. Lewinsky, but about a whole host of matters. The president testified that he did not know that Vernon Jordan had met with Ms. Lewinsky and talked about the Jones case. That was untrue. He testified that he could not recall being alone with Ms. Lewinsky. That was untrue. He testified that he could not recall ever being in the Oval Office hallway with Ms. Lewinsky except perhaps when she was delivering pizza. That was untrue. He testified that he could not recall gifts exchanged between Ms. Lewinsky and him. That was untrue. He testified after a 14-second pause, that he was not sure whether he had ever talked to Ms. Lewinsky about the possibility that she might be asked to testify in the lawsuit. That was untrue. The president testified that he did not know whether Ms. Lewinsky had been served a subpoena at the time he last saw her in December 1997. That was untrue. When his attorney read Ms. Lewinsky's affidavit denying a sexual relationship, the president stated that the affidavit was absolutely true. That was untrue. The evidence thus suggests that the president, long aware that Ms. Lewinsky was a likely topic of questioning at his deposition, made not one or two, but a series of false statements under oath. The president further allowed his attorney to use Ms. Lewinsky's affidavit which the president knew to be false to deceive the court. The evidence suggests that the president directly contravened the oath he had taken, as well as the Supreme Court's specific mandate in which the court had stated that Ms. Jones was entitled, like every other citizen, to a lawful disposition of her case. As our referral outlines, the president's deposition did not mark the end of his scheme to conceal. During his deposition testimony, the president referred to his secretary, Betty Curry. The president testified, for example, that Ms. Lewinsky had come to the White House to see Ms. Curry. 
that Ms. Curry had been involved in assisting Ms. Lewinsky in her job search, and that Ms. Curry had communicated with Vernon Jordan about Mr. Jordan's assistance to Ms. Lewinsky. In response to one question at the deposition, the president said he did not know the answer and you'll have to ask Betty. Given the, the president's repeated references to Ms. Curry and his suggestion to Ms. Jones' attorneys that they contact her, the president had to know that Ms. Jones' attorneys might want to question Mrs. Curry. Shortly after 7 p.m. on Saturday, January 17 of this year, just two and a half hours after the deposition had concluded, the president attempted to contact Mrs. Curry at her home. The president asked Ms. Curry to come to the White House the next day, which she did, although it was unusual for her to come in on a Sunday. According to Ms. Curry, the president appeared concerned, and he made a number of statements about Ms. Lewinsky to Ms. Curry. The statements included, you were always there when she was there, right? We were never really alone. You could see and hear everything. Ms. Curry concluded that the president wanted her to agree with him when he made these statements. Ms. Curry stated that she did, in fact, indicate her agreement, although she knew that the president and Ms. Lewinsky had been alone and that she could not hear or see them when they were alone. Ms. Curry further testified that the president ran through the same basic statements with her again on either January 20th or the 21st. What is important with respect to these two episodes is that at the time the president made these statements, he knew that they were false. He knew he had been alone with Ms. Lewinsky. He knew Ms. Curry could not see or hear everything. The president thus could not have been trying to refresh his recollection as he subsequently suggested. That raises the question, is there a legitimate explanation for the president to have said those things in that matter to Mrs. Curry? The circumstances suggest not. The facts suggest that the president was attempting to improperly coach Mrs. Curry at a time when he could foresee that she was a potential witness in Jones versus Clinton. The president's next major decision came in the days immediately after January 21st. On the 21st, the Washington Post reported the story of Ms. Lewinsky's relationship with the president. After the public disclosure of his relationship with Ms. Lewinsky and the ongoing criminal investigation, the president faced a decision. Would he admit the relationship publicly, correct his testimony in the Jones case, and ask for the indulgence of the American people, or would he continue to deny the truth? For this question, the president consulted with others. According to Dick Morris, the political consultant, the president and he talked on January 21st. Mr. Morris suggested that the president publicly confess. The president replied, but what about the legal thing? You know, the legal thing. You know, star and perjury and all. Mr. Morris suggested that they take a poll. The president agreed. Mr. Morris called with the results. He stated that the American people were willing to forgive adultery, but not perjury or obstruction of justice. The president replied, well, we just have to win then. Over the next several months, it became apparent that the strategy to win had many prongs. First, the president denied the truth publicly and emphatically. Second, he publicly promised to cooperate with the investigation. Third, 
The president deflected and diverted the investigation by telling aides false stories that were then relayed to the federal grand jury here in Washington. Fourth, he refused invitations to testify to the grand jury for over six months. Fifth, his administration delayed the investigation through multiple privileged claims, each of which has been rejected by the federal courts. Six, surrogates of the president attacked the credibility and the legitimacy of the grand jury investigation. Seventh, surrogates of the, president's attempt, of the president attempted to convince the Congress and the American people that the matter was unimportant. The first step was for the president to deny the truth publicly. For this, political polling led to Hollywood staging. The president's California friend and producer, Harry Thomason, flew to Washington and advised the president that the president needed to be very forceful in denying the relationship. On Monday, January 26, in the Roosevelt Room, before members of Congress and other citizens, the president provided a clear and emphatic public statement denying the relationship. The president also made false statements to his cabinet and to his aides. They then spoke publicly and professed their belief in the president. The second step was to promise cooperation. The president told the American people on several television and radio shows on January 21st and 22nd that, in his words, I'm going to do my best to cooperate with the investigation. The third step was the president's refusal to provide testimony to the grand jury, despite six invitations to do so and despite his public promise to cooperate. Refusing invitations to provide information to a grand jury in a federal criminal investigation, and one authorized by the Attorney General of the United States, and one in which there is a high national interest in prompt completion, was inconsistent with the January promise of the President to cooperate and with the general statutory duty of all government officials to cooperate with federal criminal investigations. As a fourth step, the president not only refused to testify himself, but he authorized the use of various governmental privileges to delay the testimony of many of his taxpayer-paid assistants. The extensive use of governmental privileges against grand jury and criminal investigations has, of course, been a pattern through this administration. Most notably, the White House cited privilege in 1993 to prevent Justice Department and Park Police officials from reviewing documents in Vincent, Vincent Foster's office in the days after his tragic death. In the Lewinsky investigation, the President asserted two privileges, executive privilege and a government attorney-client privilege. A subordinate administration official, without objection from the president, claimed a previously unheard of privilege that was called the protective function privilege. The privileges were asserted to prevent full testimony of several White House aides. They were asserted to prevent the full testimony of sworn law enforcement officers of the Secret Service. In asserting executive privilege, the President was plowing headlong into the Supreme Court's unanimous decision 24 years ago in United States versus Richard Nixon. There, the Supreme Court ruled that executive privilege was overcome by the need for relevant information and evidence in criminal proceedings. And thus, it came as no surprise that Chief Judge Norma Holloway Johnson of this district rejected President Clinton's effort to use executive privilege to prevent disclosure of relevant evidence. In asserting protective function and government attorney-client privileges, the administration was act asking the federal courts to make up one new privilege out of whole cloth. 
and it was asking them to apply another privilege in a context in which no federal court had ever applied it before. And thus it again came as little surprise that the federal courts rejected the administration's claims. Indeed, as to the government attorney-client claim, the D.C. Circuit and the District Court, like the Eighth Circuit a year ago, stated that the President's legal position not only was wrong, but would authorize, in the Court's words, a gross misuse of public assets. The Supreme Court refused to grant review of the cases notwithstanding the administration's two strongly worded requests, petitions for certiorari. This point bears emphasis. The administration justified its many privileged claims by claiming an interest in protecting the presidency, not the president personally. But that justification is dubious for two reasons. First, Presidents Carter and Reagan waived all government privileges at the outset of criminal investigations in which they were involved. The examples set by those two presidents demonstrate that such privileges in criminal investigations are manifestly unnecessary in order to protect the presidency. Second, these novel privilege claims were quite weak as a matter of law. And that raises a question. What was it about the Monica Lewinsky matter that generated the administration's particularly aggressive approach to privileges? The circumstantial evidence suggests an answer, delay. Indeed, when our office sought to have the Supreme Court of the United States de decide all three privilege claims at once this past June, the administration opposed expedited consideration. Not only did the administration invoke these three losing privileges, but the president public publicly suggested that he had, invoked, he had not invoked executive privilege when, in fact, he had. On March 24, 1998, while traveling in Africa, the president was asked about executive privilege. He stated in response, you should ask someone who knows. I haven't discussed that with the lawyers. I don't know. But White House counsel Charles Ruff had filed an affidavit in federal court before Judge Johnson only seven days earlier in which he swore that he had discussed the assertion of executive privilege with the president and that the pre president had approved its invocation. After Chief Judge Johnson ruled against the president, the president then dropped the executive privilege claim in the Supreme Court. And then in August, the president explained to the grand jury why he had dropped the claim. The president stated, I didn't really want to advance an executive privilege claim in this case beyond having it litigated. But this statement made to the grand jury was inaccurate. In truth, the president had again asserted executive privilege only a few days earlier. And a few days after his grand jury testimony, the president again asserted executive privilege to prevent the testimony of Bruce Lindsay. These executive privilege cases continue to this day. Indeed, one case is now pending in the D.C. Circuit. When the president and the administration assert privileges in a context involving the president's personal issues, when the president pretends publicly that he knows nothing about the executive privilege assertion, when the president and the administration rebuff our office's efforts to expedite the cases to the Supreme Court, when the president contends in the grand jury that he never really wanted to assert executive privilege beyond having it litigated, despite the fact that he had asserted it six days earlier and would do so again 11 days afterwards, 
there is substantial and credible evidence that the President has misused the privileges available to his high office. And the misuse delayed and impeded the federal grand jury's investigation. The fifth tactic was diversion and deflection. The president made false statements to his aides and associates about the nature of the relationship, as we have seen, with knowledge that they could testify to that effect to the grand jury sitting here in Washington. The president did not simply say to his associates that the allegations were false or that the issue was a private matter that he did not want to discuss. Instead, the president concocted alternative scenarios that were then repeated to the federal grand jury. The final two tactics were related to attack the grand jury investigation including the Justice Department prosecutors who serve in my office, to declare war, in the words of one presidential advisor and ally, and to shape public opinion about the proper resolution of the entire matter. It is best that I leave it to someone outside our office to elaborate on the war against the office. But no one really disputes that these tactics were employed and continue to be employed to this very day. This strategy proceeded for nearly seven months. It changed course in August after Monica Lewinsky reached an immunity agreement with our office. And the grand jury, after deliberation, issued a subpoena to the president. The president testified before the grand jury on August 17. Beforehand, many in Congress and in the public advised that the president should tell the truth. They cautioned that the president should not lie before the grand jury. Senator Hatch, for example, stated that, so help me, if he lies before the grand jury, that will be grounds for impeachment. Senator Moynihan simply stated that perjury before the grand jury was, in his view, an impeachable offense. The evidence suggests that the president did not heed the senatorial advice. Although admitting to an ambiguously defined inappropriate relationship, the president denied that he had lied under oath at his civil deposition. He also denied any conduct that would establish that he had lied under oath at that deposition. The president thus denied certain conduct, conduct with Ms. Lewinsky and devised a variety of tortured and false definitions. The president's answers have not been well received. Congressman Schumer, the senator-elect for one, stated that it is clear that the president lied when he testified before the grand jury. <coughs> Congressman Meehan stated that the president engaged in a dangerous game of verbal twister. Indeed, the president made false statements to the grand jury, and then that same evening spoke to the nation and criticized all attempts to show that he had done so as invasive and irrelevant. The president's approach appeared to contravene the oath that he took at the start of the grand jury proceedings. It also disregarded the admonitions of those members of Congress who warned that lying to a grand jury would not be tolerated. It also discounted Judge Susan Weber Wright's many orders in which she had ruled that this kind of evidence was relevant in the Jones case and thus ended the over eight month journey that had begun on December 5, 1997, when Monica Lewinsky's name appeared on the witness list. The evidence suggests that the eight months included false statements under oath, false statements to the American people, false statements to the president's cabinet and his aides, witness tampering, obstruction of justice, and the use of presidential authority and power in an effort to conceal the truth of the relationship and to delay the investigation. 
Given the serious nature of perjury and obstruction of justice, regardless of its setting, it is obvious that the actions of the President and Ms. Lewinsky to conceal the truth warranted criminal investigation. Let me explain how the investigation came to be handled by our office, rather than by the Department of Justice or by some other independent counsel. That explanation is straightforward. On January 8, an attorney in our office was informed that a witness, who was Linda Tripp, a witness in prior investigations in our office, had information that she wanted to provide. A message was conveyed back that she should provide her information directly. Ms. Tripp called our office on January 12th. In that conversation and later, she provided us a substantial amount of information. Let me pause here and emphasize that our office, like most law enforcement agencies, has received innumerable tips about a wide variety of matters over the past four years from Swiss bank accounts to drug smuggling. You name it, we have heard it. In each case, we must make an initial assessment, whether it is a serious tip or a crank call, as well as an assessment of jurisdictional issues. We handle the information from Ms. Tripp in the same manner. When we confirmed that the information appeared credible, we reached out to the Department of Justice as we have done regularly during my tenure as independent counsel. We contacted Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder within 48 hours after Ms. Tripp provided us information, and we found him appropriately at a basketball game in the evening hours of that day. The next day, we fully informed the Deputy Attorney General about Ms. Tripp's information, about Ms. Tripp's tapes and the questions concerning their legality under state law, about the consensual FBI recording of Ms. Tripp and Ms. Lewinsky, about the indications that Vernon Jordan was providing employment assistance to a witness who had the potential to harm the president, a fact pattern that we had seen in the Webster-Hubble investigation, as I, I shall describe presently. We discussed jurisdiction. We noted that it is in everyone's interest to avoid time-consuming jurisdictional challenges. We stated that the Lewinsky investigation could be considered outside our jurisdiction, as then constituted. We stressed that someone needed to work the case, the Justice Department or an independent counsel. Later that evening, the Deputy Attorney General telephoned and reported that the Attorney General had tentatively decided to assign the matter to us. Before her decision was final, we reviewed the evidence in detail with two experienced career prosecutors in the Justice Department. One senior Justice Department prosecutor listened to portions of the FBI tape, the consensual recording. The Attorney General made her final decision on Friday, January 16. That day, through a senior career prosecutor, the Attorney General asked the three-judge special division to expand our office's jurisdiction. The special division granted the request that day. In short, our entry into this investigation was standard, albeit expedited, procedure. Seven months later, after conducting the factual investigation and after the President's grand jury testimony, the question we faced was what to do with the evidence. The Chairman referred to Section 595C of the Independent Counsel Statute, which requires an independent counsel investigating possible crimes to provide to the House of Representatives, in the words of the statute, substantial and credible information that may constitute grounds for an impeachment. This reporting provision suggests a statutory preference that possible criminal wrongdoing by a president 
Ken Starr may continue for as long as the next two hours. Some stations will return to regular programming now, and coverage will continue on others, also on MSNBC on cable. We'll have updates on the impeachment hearings throughout the day on this NBC station, and of course more tonight on NBC Nightly News. Its history and relevant precedents. It was clear to us that obstruction of justice in its various forms, including perjury, may constitute grounds for an impeachment the language of the statute. Even apart from any abuses of presidential authority and power, the evidence of perjury and obstruction of justice required us to refer the information to the House. <coughs> perjury and obstruction of justice are, of course, serious crimes. In 1790, the first Congress sitting in New York passed a criminal law that banned perjury a violator was subject to three years' imprisonment. Today, federal criminal law makes perjury a felony punishable by five years' imprisonment. In cases involving public officials, courts treat false statements with special condemnation. United States District Judge Royce Lamberth here in Washington recently sentenced Ronald Blackley the former chief of staff to the former secretary of agriculture, to 37 months imprisonment for false statements. The district court, Judge Lamberth, stated in his words, the court has a duty to send a message to other high-level government officials that there is a severe penalty to be paid for providing false information under oath. Although perjury and obstruction of justice are serious federal crimes, some have suggested that they are not high crimes or misdemeanors when the underlying events concern the president's private actions. Under this theory, a president's obstruction and perjury must involve concealment of official actions. This interpretation does not appear in the Constitution itself. Moreover, the Constitution lists bribery as a high crime or misdemeanor. And if a president involved in a civil suit bribed the judge to rule in his favor or bribed a witness to provide favorable testimony, there could be no textual question that the president had committed a high crime or misdemeanor under the plain language of Article II, even though the underlying events would not have involved his official duties. In addition, virtually everyone agrees that serious crimes such as murder and rape would be impeachable even though they do not involve official duties. Justice Story in the last century stated in his famous commentaries that there is not a syllable in the Constitution which confines impeachment to official acts. With all respect, an absolute and inflexible requirement of a connection to official duties appears fairly viewed to be an incorrect interpretation of the Constitution. History and practice support the conclusion that perjury in particular is a high crime and misdemeanor. Perjury has been the basis, as the committee knows, for the removal of several judges. As far as we know, no one has questioned whether perjury was a high crime or misdemeanor in those cases. In addition, as several of the scholars who appeared before you testified and to whom the chairman referred, perjury seems to have been recognized as a high crime or misdemeanor at the time of the founding of our republic. And the House manager's report in the impeachment of Judge Walter Nixon for perjury stated, it is difficult to imagine an act more subversive to the legal process than lying from the witness stand. And finally, I note that the federal sentencing guidelines include bribery and perjury in the same guideline, reflecting the common sense conclusion that bribery and perjury are equivalent means of interfering with the governmental process. For these reasons, we concluded that perjury and obstruction of justice, like bribery, may constitute grounds for an impeachment. Having said that, let me again emphasize my role here. We had a judgment to make.
but whether the President's actions are, in fact, grounds for an impeachment or some other sanction is a decision in the sole discretion of the Congress. A final point warrants mention in this respect. Criminal prosecution and punishment are not the same as or a substitute for congressionally imposed sanctions. As the Supreme Court stated in a 1993 case, the framers recognized that most likely there would be two sets of proceedings for individuals who committed impeachable offenses, the impeachment trial and a separate criminal trial. In fact, the Constitution explicitly provides for two separate proceedings. The framers deliberately separated the two forums to avoid raising the specter of bias and to ensure independent judgment. Our task over the past several years has involved far more than simply the Lewinsky matter. The pattern of obstruction of justice, false statements, and misuse of executive authority in the Lewinsky investigation did not occur in a vacuum. In August 1994, Mr. Chairman, I, I seek a ruling of the chair. Mr. Chairman, I seek a ruling of the chair. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, all right. What is, uh, the, the, I take it the gentle lady has a point of order. Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. State your point, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I respectfully raise this point of order uh, with the understanding that we have not received, or we are not receiving, any referral. Uh, on the issues dealing with Madison Guarantee, Whitewater, Travelgate, or Filegate. And in fact, as I understand, <clears throat> uh, there is announcement today uh, that the findings of guilt against the President on the issues of Travelgate or Filegate do not exist, uh, referred in pages 46 and 47 of the statements of Mr. Starr. I therefore ask Mr. Chairman <clears throat> whether Mr. Starr's remarks as he begins them at this point, are germane, and secondarily, whether or not the President is being denied his Fifth Amendment rights by lack of uh, notice and a denial of liberty by not having been noticed of any presentations being made on Whitewater, Madison Guarantee, Filegate, uh, and Travelgate. I believe Mr. Starr's remarks are now out of order, uh, and uh, I believe that he should, uh, that there should be a ruling that his remarks are not germane, uh, and frankly, that if he proceeds, he will be denying the president and any other parties uh, the constitutional right of due process in the Fifth Amendment. And Mr. Chairman, as you well recognize, uh, I raised this question when we began some two or three months ago, whether or not this committee would abide by the constitutional provision of the Fifth Amendment. Uh, I offered an amendment to that extent. Uh, I was told by the chair at that time that under the rules of the House, we would be guided by the Fifth Amendment and I believe that the due process rights of Mr. the President and other parties are being denied with the representations that Mr. Starr is about to make. I'd ask the chair for his ruling. Well, the chair overrules the gentlelady's point of order, and the witness will continue. I thank thank you. the chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I had said that it was in August of 1994 that I took over the Madison Guarantee investigation from Robert Fisk. Over the ensuing years, I have essentially become independent counsel for five distinct investigations for Madison, Guarantee, and Whitewater, for Foster related matters, for the Travel Office, for the FBI Files matter, and for the Lewinsky investigation as well as for a variety of obstruction and related matters that arose out of those five major investigations. A very brief overview of those investigations may assist the committee in its assessment of the President's conduct. First, some statistics. The chairman noted that the investigation has resulted in the conviction of 14 individuals, including the former 
Associate Attorney General of the United States, Webster Hubble, the then sitting governor of Arkansas, Jim Guy Tucker, and the Clinton's two business partners, Jim and Susan McDougall. We're proud not only of the cases that we have won, but of our decisions not to indict. To take one well-known example, the Senate Whitewater Committee sent our office public criminal referrals on several individuals. The committee stated in its June 21, 1996 public letter that the testimony of Susan Thomas's was particularly troubling and suggests a possible violation of law. But this office did not seek charges against her. Apart from indictments and convictions, this office has also faced an extraordinary number of legal disputes on issues of privilege, on jurisdiction, substantive criminal law, and the like. By my count, <clears throat> Pardon me. At least 17 of our cases have been decided by the federal courts of appeals, and we have been fortunate in prevailing in all 17. One privilege case arising in our travel office investigation went to the D.C. Circuit, where we prevailed by a two to one decision, and then to the Supreme Court, where we lost by a six to three decision. We had to litigate in the courts as our investigation ran into roadblocks and hurdles that slowed us down. It is true that the administration produced a great amount of information. But unlike the prosecutors in the investigations involving Presidents Carter and Reagan, we have been forced to go to court time and time again to seek information from the executive branch. and to fight a multitude of privileged claims asserted by the administration, every single one of which we have won. In sum, the office where I serve has achieved a superb record in courts of law, of significant and hard-fought convictions, of fair and wise decisions not to charge, of thorough and accurate reports on the Vincent Foster death and the Monica Lewinsky matters, of legal victories in various courts. We go to court and not on the talk show circuit. And our record shows that there is a bright line between law and politics, between courts and polls. It leaves the polls to the politicians and the spin doctors. We are officers of the court who live in the world of law. We have presented our cases in court, and with very rare exception, we have won. The center of all this, <clears throat> the core of our Arkansas-based investigation, was Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan. Madison was a federally insured savings and loan in Little Rock, Arkansas, run by Jim and Susan McDougall. Like many savings and loans in the 1980s, Madison was fraudulently operated. <laughs> Mrs. Clinton and other lawyers at the Rose Law Firm in Little Rock performed legal work for Madison in the 1980s. Madison first received attention in March 1992 when a New York Times report raised several issues about the relationships between the Clintons and the McDougals in connection with Madison Guarantee. Federal bank examiners examined Madison in 1992 and 1993, and the regulators sent criminal referrals to the Justice Department. And the Justice Department then launched a criminal investigation of Madison Guarantee in November 1993. In part because of the relationship of the Clintons to the McDougals, Attorney General Reno appointed Bob Fisk in January 1994. I was appointed independent counsel in August 1994 to continue the investigation. Madison exemplified the troubled practices of savings and loans in the 1980s. 
The failure of the institution ultimately cost federal taxpayers approximately $65 million. Congresswoman Waters put it this way in a 1995 hearing. By any standard, Madison Guarantee was a disaster. It gambled with investments, cooked the books, and ultimately built the taxpayers of the United States. Madison, she went on, is a metaphor for the SNL crisis. The McDougal's operation of Madison raised serious questions whether bank funds had been used illegally to assist business and political figures in Arkansas, such as Jim Guy Tucker, the governor, to be, and the then governor, Governor Clinton. As to the Clintons, the question arose primarily because they were partners with the McDougals and the Whitewater Development Company. The Whitewater Corporation initially controlled and developed approximately 230 acres of property on the White River in northern Arkansas. Given Jim McDougal's role at the center of both institutions, and given Whitewater's constant financial difficulties, there were two important questions. Were Madison funds diverted to benefit Whitewater? If so, were the Clintons in, either involved in or knowledgeable of that diversion of funds? Those questions were not idle speculation. In early 1994, a Little Rock judge and businessman, David Hale, pled guilty to certain unrelated federal crimes. As part of his plea, David Hale told Mr. Fisk's team that he had received money as a result of a loan from Madison in 1986. He said that his company loaned it to others as part of a scheme to help some members of the Arkansas political establishment. One loan of $300,000 went to Susan McDougall's make-believe company, which she called Master Marketing. Based on our investigation, we now know that some $50,000 of the proceeds of that loan went to benefit the Whitewater Corporation. David Hale stated that he had discussed the Susan McDougal loan with then Governor Clinton, including at a meeting in 1986 with Jim McDougal and the governor. In August 1994, when I first arrived in Little Rock and building on Mr. Fisk's work, we devised a plan. First, based on the testimony of David Hale and others, as well as documentary evidence, we would take steps, if, if appropriate, if the evidence warranted, to seek an indictment of Jim and Susan McDougall and others involved in what clearly appeared to be criminal transactions. If a Little Rock jury convicted the McDougalls or others, we would then obtain their testimony and determine whether they had other relevant information including, of course, whether the McDougals possessed information that would either exonerate or incriminate the Clintons as to Madison and Whitewater matters. This approach was the time-honored and professional way to conduct an investigation. We garnered a number of guilty pleas in my first year. One was from Webster Hubble, <clears throat> who had worked at the Rose Law Firm and was knowledgeable about its work with Madison including that of Mrs. Clinton as a lawyer at the Rose Firm. In addition, Robert Palmer, a real estate appraiser, pled guilty to fraudulently doctoring Madison documents to deceive federal bank examiners. Three other associates of McDougall pled guilty and agreed to cooperate. In August 1995, a year after I was appointed by the Special Division, a federal grand jury in Little Rock indicted Jim and Susan McDougall and the then sitting governor of Arkansas, Jim Guy Tucker. The case went to trial in March of 1996 amid charges by all three defendants and their allies that the case was a political witch hunt. Some predicted that an Arkansas jury would never convict the sitting governor. These expectations were heightened 
when Governor, Cl excuse me, when President Clinton was subpoenaed as a defense witness in Governor Tucker's trial. The President testified for the defense from the map room of the White House. During his sworn testimony, the President testified as a defense witness that he did not know about the Susan McDougal loan nor had he ever been in a meeting with Hale and McDougal about the loan. He also testified that he had never received a loan from Madison. This was important testimony. Its truth or falsity went to the core issues of our investigation. On May 28, 1996, all three defendants were convicted Jim McDougal of 18 felonies, Susan McDougal of four felonies, and Governor Tucker of two felonies. Governor Tucker announced his resignation that day. After his conviction, Jim McDougal began cooperating with our investigation. We spent many hours with him, gaining additional insights and facts. He informed our career investigators and prosecutors that David Hale was accurate. According to Jim McDougal, President Clinton had testified falsely at the McDougal-Tucker trial. Jim McDougal testified that he had been at a meeting with David Hale and Governor Clinton about the master marketing loan. And Jim McDougal testified that Governor Clinton had received a loan from Madison. Jim McDougal said on one of the first sessions with our office following his conviction that the President's trial testimony was, in his words, at variance with the truth. In late 1997... Mr. Chairman, I, I have a point of order. The uh, gentlelady, I would appreciate it if she wouldn't interrupt, but uh, go ahead and state your point. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, the need for us to proceed, and I, I want to proceed fairly. That's all I'm asking for. I'm sure you do. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, stated earlier my objections to, uh, one, hearsay, uh, but frankly, the direction of the testimony. Frankly, I raise again the question of germaneness uh, with respect to representations on Whitewater, Madison Guarantee, and due process, Mr. Chairman. I think this testimony is inappropriate. There is no attempt to cover up, but I do not have before me a referral from Mr. Starr or any of his deputies on the question of Whitewater, Filegate, or Travelgate. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, uh, this testimony is not germane, and it is a denial of due process. I thank the gentlelady. This committee hearing is being conducted pursuant to notice, pursuant to House Resolution 581. That resolution directs the committee to, and I quote, investigate fully and completely whether sufficient grounds exist for the House of Representatives to exercise its constitutional power to impeach William Jefferson Clinton, President of the United States of America. Close quote. That is the wide open range that we have given ourselves in this resolution in contradistinction to the Democratic resolution which wanted a narrow inquiry. That very issue was, uh, was debated and voted on. And so the gentleman, the witness uh, testimony is perfectly germane and consonant with House Resolution 581, and therefore the gentle lady's point of order is overruled and the witness will continue. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to appeal Chairman. the ruling of the chair. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Would you consult with your ranking member and see if... Mr. Chairman, I'd like to vote on, I'd, I'd like to vote on that ruling. <laughs> Chairman, I, I withdraw that, but I, I paid my objection. The gentle lady has... I for a vote on that. Well, now, and, and, uh, please, we're, tr we're trying to move along. And uh, I appreciate the... Uh, um, In the sense of comedy, Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my uh, desire Chairman, for a vote. I, I just asked for a vote. That's all. Well, I, I'm going to deny my friend Mr. Bryant's request, and uh, then you and I can struggle over the noon hour. But uh, I would like to move ahead. Uh, thank Mr. you. Mr. Chairman, is my objection registered? Oh, indeed, it's registered thank twice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
and we'll register it every half hour if you would like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, Thank you. The, the witness will continue, uh, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In late 1997, we in our office considered whether this evidence that I've just described justified a referral to Congress. We drafted a report. But we concluded that it would be inconsistent with the statutory standard because of the difficulty of establishing the truth with a sufficient degree of confidence. We also weighed a prudential factor in reaching that decision. There were still two outstanding witnesses who might later corroborate or contradict the McDougall and Hale accounts. Jim Guy Tucker and Susan McDougall. In 1998, we were finally able to obtain information from Governor T Tucker. It had taken four long years to hear from the governor. He pled guilty in a tax conspiracy case, and he ultimately testified before the Little Rock Grand Jury in March and April of this year. But he had little knowledge of the loan to Susan McDougall's fictitious company and the president's possible involvement in it. He did shed light on the overall transactions involving Castle Grande and Madison. Importantly, as to one subject, Governor Tucker exonerated the president regarding long-standing questions whether the president and Governor Tucker had a conversation about the Madison referrals in the White House in October 1993. The governor exonerated the president. The remaining witness who perhaps could shed light on the issue was Susan McDougall. And therein lies a story that has caused literally years of delay and added expense to the investigation. Mm. Because the proceeds from the fraudulent loan that Susan McDougall received had benefited the Clintons, the proceeds were to use to pay off obligations of the Whitewater Development Company for which the Clintons were potentially personally liable. Susan McDougall was subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury in Little Rock in August 1996. She was asked several questions going to the very heart of the investigation, including these. Did you ever discuss your loan from David Hale with William Jefferson Clinton? To your knowledge, did William Jefferson Clinton testify truthfully during the course of your trial? Susan McDougall refused to answer any questions. District Judge Susan Weber Wright in Little Rock then held her in civil contempt, a decision later upheld unanimously by the United States Court of Appeals in St. Louis. The month of September 1996 was thus a crucial time for our office in its attempt to obtain Susan McDougall's lawful testimony. On September 23, 1996, just two weeks after Ms. McDougall had been found in contempt by Judge Wright, President Clinton was interviewed on PBS. The President said, there's a lot of evidence to support, his words, various charges that Susan McDougall had made against our office. But the president cited no evidence. The president's comments can reasonably be described as supportive of Ms. McDougall's decision to disobey the court order. So far as we are aware, no sitting president ever has publicly indicated his agreement with a convicted felon, stated reason for refusing to obey a federal court order to testify. Essentially, the President of the United States, the Chief Executive, sided with a convicted felon against the United States as represented by United States District Court Judge, now Chief Judge, Susan Weber Wright, the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, 
and our office. The President was also asked in the interview whether he would consider pardoning Ms. McDougall. The President refused to rule out a pardon. The President's answers to these questions were roundly criticized. A New York Times editorial captured the point well, stating that the President's remarks undercut a legal process that is going forward in an orderly way. A separate area of our original investigation concerned the Rose Law Firm's work in 1985 and 1986 for Madison. It appeared that Rose may have assisted Madison Guarantee in performing legal work concerning a piece of property known alternatively as IDC or Castle Grande, which involved McDougall, Madison Guarantee, and fraudulent transactions. The complicated real estate deal known as Castle Grande was structured to avoid state banking regulatory requirements and involved violations of federal criminal law. Grand jury subpoenas were issued in 1994 and 1995 to the Rose Law Firm and to the President and to Mrs. Clinton, seeking all documents relating to Madison and Caso Grande. We ultimately learned that Mrs. Clinton had performed some legal work related to Madison's Caso Grande IDC transactions. But the whole issue remained partially enshrouded in mystery as our office and the Senate Whitewater Committee investigated the issue in 1995. The problem was that some of the best evidence regarding Mrs. Clinton's work, her Rose Law Firm billing records, and her timesheets for 1985 and 1986 at the Rose Firm could not be found. The missing records raised suspicions by late 1995 and became a public issue. Webster Hubble and Vincent Foster Jr. had been responsible during the 1992 campaign for gathering information about Mrs. Clinton's work for Madison Guarantee. Yet, the billing records could not be found. The Rose firm's work for Madison Guarantee could not be fully pieced together. The Rose firm no longer had the records. On January 5, 1996, the records of Mrs. Clinton's activities, her legal work for Madison, were finally produced under unusual circumstances. The records detail Mrs. Clinton's work on a variety of Madison issues, including the preparation of an option agreement that Madison Guarantee used to deceive federal bank examiners as part of the Castle Grande deal. After a thorough investigation, we have found no explanation how the billing records got where they were or why they were not discovered and produced earlier. It remains a mystery to this day. <clears throat> Then, in the summer of 1997, a second set of these billing records was found in the attic of the late Vincent Foster Jr.'s house in Little Rock. The timesheets for Rose's work in 1985 and 86 for Madison Guarantee have never been found. We should note that Webster Hubble may have additional information pertaining to Castle Grande, whether exculpatory or inculpatory that we have been unable to obtain. Mr. Hubble was at the Rose Law Firm at the relevant time in 1985 and 1986. He gathered information about the Madison Guarantee issue in 1992, and his father-in-law was involved in the Castle Grande deal. Two other important facts suggest that Mr. Hubble may have additional information. First, on March 13, 1994, after a meeting at the White House where it had discussed, it had been discussed, that Mr. Hubble would resign from the Justice Department, then Chief of Staff Mac McClarty told Mrs. Clinton that, in his words, we're going to be supportive of Webb. As this criminal investigation was beginning in 1994 under Bob Fisk and then later my office, 
Mr. Hubble received payments totaling nearly $550,000 from several companies and individuals. Many were campaign contributors. These individuals had been contacted through the White House Chief of Staff, Mr. McClarty, and others. In June 1994, during a week in which he made several visits to the White House, Indonesian businessman James Riotti met with Webster Hubble and then wired him $100,000. One of the individuals who arranged for Mr. Hubble to receive a consulting contract was Vernon Jordan. The company that Mr. Jordan convinced to hire, to engage Mr. Hubble, was McAndrews and Forbes, the parent company of Revlon. This is the same company that hired Monica Lewinsky upon Mr. Jordan's recommendation. As he was destined later to do with Monica Lewinsky, Mr. Jordan personally informed the president about his, Mr. Jordan's, assistance to Mr. Hubble. Most of the $550,000 was given to Mr. Hubble for little or no work. This rush of generosity obviously gives rise to an inference that the money was essentially a gift. And if it was a gift, why was it given? This money was given despite the fact that Mr. Hubble was under criminal investigation for fraudulent billing and was a key witness in the Madison Guarantee investigation. Second, as is known to the public, on certain prison tapes while Mr. Hubble was in prison, he said to his wife, I won't raise those allegations that might open it up on Hillary. On another tape, Mr. Hubble said to White House employee Marcia Scott that he might have to roll over one more time. Mr. Hubble's statements, when combined with the amount of money he received and the information he was in a position to know, raise very troubling questions. Mr. Hubble is currently under federal indictment. There is a presumption of innocence. And it would be inappropriate to say more about that at this time. Let me add a few brief words about the travel office matter. This phase of our work arose out of investigations by others of the 1993 firings of Billy Dale and six career co-workers. As has already been indicated <clears throat> in comments from a member, we do not anticipate that any evidence gathered in that investigation will be relevant to the committee's current task. The president was not involved in our travel office investigation. As to the status of that investigation, it was on hold for quite a while in part because of litigation. The investigation is not terminated, but we expect to announce any actions and decisions soon. As to the FBI files matter, there are outstanding issues that we are attempting to resolve with respect to one individual. But I can address two issues of relevance to the committee's work. First, our investigation, which has been thorough, found no evidence that anyone higher than Mr. Livingstone or Mr. Marcisa was in any way involved in ordering the FBI files from the FBI. Second, we have found no evidence that information contained in the files of former officials was actually used for an improper purpose. Let me now mention a few words about our personnel, our process, and our reflections. <clears throat> the character and the conduct of the men and women of our office, largely career professionals who take their jobs and their oaths very seriously, have been badly distorted. Perhaps that is inevitable, given the nature of the issues involved, given the fact that the President of the United States is the subject of a criminal investigation. But it is regrettable, 
And so let me offer some truth about our office. I will start with our personnel. During the Lewinsky investigation, my staff has included skilled and experienced prosecutors from around the country. They have brought an enormous amount of experience and expertise to the office. My colleagues during this past year have included a former United States attorney, several members of this committee are former United States attorneys, the chief of the public corruption unit of the United States Attorney's Office in Los Angeles, the chief of the public corruption unit of the United States Attorney's Office in Miami, the chief of the bank fraud unit of the United States Attorney's Office in San Antonio, prosecutors with lengthy experience in the public integrity section of the Department of Justice, seasoned federal prosecutors from 10 different states and the District of Columbia, and veteran state prosecutors from Maryland and Oregon. The office has also benefited from the assistance of Sam Dash, Chief Counsel of the Senate Watergate Committee, who has offered great wisdom during my tenure. Professor Ronald Rotunda, constitutional law scholar from the University of Illinois, has likewise provided advice on a variety of issues. The office has received assistance from professors at the University of Michigan, the University of Illinois, Notre Dame, and George Washington. Moreover, former law clerks for six different Supreme Court justices have served on my staff during the past year. During the Lewinsky investigation, the office also relied on many talented investigators with extensive service in the FBI and in law enforcement agencies. And the FBI laboratory yet again provided superb assistance to us, as it has throughout the Madison Whitewater investigation, with the strong support of Judge Free. In addition, let me express my appreciation, and it is great, for the grand jurors who devoted much time and energy to examining the witnesses and considering the evidence. Those 23 citizens of the District of Columbia have performed an invaluable service and I publicly thank them. This is the rare case where grand jury transcripts become publicly scrutinized. And as the committee members now know, these grand jurors were active, they were knowledgeable, they were fair, and they were completely dedicated to uncovering and understanding the truth. In all our investigations, difficult decisions have been taken through our office's deliberative process, and that's what we call it. That process calls upon each attorney drawing, drawing upon his or her background and experience to offer views on issues in question. This deliberative process is laborious, sometimes tedious, but it's an attempt to ensure that our office makes the best decisions it can. I've drawn upon a vast array of experienced prosecutors and investigators because I was sensitive to, and am sensitive to, the fact that an independent counsel exists outside the Justice Department and is an unusual entity within our constitutional system. Throughout this investigation, we've made every effort to follow Department of Justice policy and practice and to utilize time-honored law enforcement and investigative techniques. Of course, with their vast experience in the department and the FBI, our prosecutors and investigators embody such policy and practice. Nonetheless, it was often the case at an all-attorneys meeting that we would repair to the United States Attorney's Manual to be sure that we had it right. It is true, and Mr. Conyers' comments raise the issue, that some law enforcement procedures may not be entirely comfortable for some witnesses. But the procedures have been refined over decades of practice in which society's right to detect and prosecute crime has been balanced against individual liberty and a balance struck. It was not our place to reinvent the investigative wheel. Nor is it our place to discard law enforcement practices that are used every day 
by prosecutors, and by police throughout the country. With that, let me be the first to say that the Lewinsky investigation in particular presented some of the most challenging issues that any lawyer or investigator could face. We had to make numerous decisions and to make them very quickly. <clears throat> Those included factual judgments. Is witness X or witness Y telling us the whole truth? As one of my prosecutors has frequently said, we can deal with the truth, but we cannot deal with lies. Only give us the truth. And we have to make that assessment. Strategic choices. Do we provide immunity to Ms. Lewinsky in order to obtain her testimony? Is it appropriate to subpoena the president? Legal decisions. Do we accept the assertion of executive privilege for Bruce Lindsay? Or do we go to district court to challenge it? What about the Secret Service privilege and historic constitutional judgments? What is the meaning of Section 595C of this statute, the Independent Counsel statute? And how do we prepare a referral that satisfies its requirements? It had never been done before. Major decisions during the Lewinsky investigation have not been easy. And given the hurricane force winds swirling about us, we were well aware that no matter what decision we made, criticism would come from somewhere. As Attorney General Reno has said, in high profile cases like these, not referring to this case, but in high profile cases, you are, in her words, damned if you do and damned if you don't. So you'd better just do what you think is the right and proper thing. We also attempted to be thorough. But we did not invent that approach, being thorough, with the Lewinsky case. To take just one previous example, in investigating matters relating to the death of Vincent Foster, Jr., we were painstaking in examining evidence, in questioning witnesses, and in calling upon experts in homicide and suicide. We were criticized throughout that investigation for being too thorough, for taking too long. But time has proved the correctness of that approach. After an extensive investigation, the office produced a report that addressed the many questions that confronted the difficult issues. It laid out new evidence, and it reached a definitive conclusion. Over time, the controversy over the Foster tragedy has dissipated because we insisted on being uncompromisingly thorough, both in our investigation and in our report. After the Attorney General and the Court of Appeals assigned us the Lewinsky investigation, the office again received criticism for being too thorough. But the Lewinsky investigation could not properly be conducted in a slapdash manner. It was our duty to be meticulous, to be careful. We were. And in the process, we uncovered substantial and credible evidence of serious legal wrongdoing by the president. Some then suggested, and it's been suggested this morning, that the report we submitted to Congress was too thorough. But bear in mind, we submitted the referral as we were required to do to the House of Representatives and not to the public. And we must respectfully dispute the suggestion that a report to the House suggesting possible impeachable offenses committed by the President of the United States should tell something less than the full story. The facts, the story, are critical. They affect credibility. They are necessary to avoid a distorted picture. And they are ultimately the basis for a just conclusion. As a result, just as the jurors found the details of specific land deals critically important in our trial of Governor Jim Guy Tucker and of the McDougalls, 
just as the Supreme Court of the United States includes the details of grisly murders and its death penalty cases, so too the details of the President's relationship with Ms. Lewinsky became relevant. Indeed, they became critical in determining whether and the extent to which the President made false statements under oath and otherwise obstructed just justice in Jones v. Clinton in both that case and then again in his grand jury testimony. And as you know, by an overwhelming bipartisan vote, the House immediately disclosed our re referral to the public. But I want to be clear, as a matter of fairness, that the public disclosure or non-disclosure of the referral and the backdrop ma materials was a decision that our office did not make and lawfully could not make. We had no way of knowing in advance of submitting the referral, and we did not know whether the House would publicly release both the report and the backup materials, would release portions of one or both, would release redacted versions of the report and backup documents, would prepare and release a summary akin to Mr. Shipper's oral presentation or would simply keep the referral and the backup materials under seal just as Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski's submission in 1974 remained under seal. As a result, we respectfully but we firmly reject the notion that our office was trying to inflame the public. We are professionals and we were trying to get the relevant facts, the full story, to the House of Representatives. That was our task, and that is what we did. In fact, the referral has served a good purpose. There has been virtually no dispute about a good many of the factual conclusions in the report. In the wake of the referral, for example, few have ventured that the President told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in his civil case and before the grand jury. A key reason we submit is that we insisted, as we have in our other investigations, that we be exhaustive in the investigation and that we document the facts and conclusions in our report. I want to be absolutely clear on one point, however. Any suggestion that the men and women of our office with whom I am privileged to serve enjoyed or relished this investigation is wrong. It is nonsense. In at least three ways, the Lewinsky investigation caused all of us considerable dismay and continues to do so. First, none of us has any interest whatsoever in investigating the factual details underlying the allegations of perjury and obstruction of justice in this case. My staff and I agree with the sentiments expressed by the chairman in his November 9 hearing when he said, I'd like to forget all of this. I mean, who needs it? But the Constitution and the criminal law do not have exceptions for unseemly or unpleasant or difficult cases. The Attorney General of the United States and the Court of Appeals Special Division assigned us a duty to pursue the facts, and we did so. Second, this investigation has proved difficult for us because it's centered on legal wrongdoing by the President of the United States. The presidency is an office that we, like all Americans, revere and respect. No prosecutor is comfortable when he or she reports wrongdoing by the president. All of us want to believe that our president has at all times acted with integrity and certainly that he has not violated the criminal law. Everyone in my office therefore envies the position ago, years ago of Paul Curran. It was the distinguished counsel appointed 
by Attorney General Griffin Bell to investigate certain financial transactions involving President Carter. Mr. Curran, by his account, received complete cooperation from President Carter, found no wrongdoing by the President, and promptly returned to private life. Mr. Chairman, I would like to do the same. Third, this investigation was unpleasant because our office knew that some Americans, for a variety of reasons, would be opposed to our work. But we would not, could not, allow ourselves to be deterred from doing our work. As I have said, our office was assigned a specific duty by the Attorney General and the Special Division to gather the facts, and then, if appropriate, to make decisions and to report the facts as quickly as we possibly could. In the end, we tried to adhere to the principle Congressman Graham discussed on October 5. Thirty years from now, not thirty days from now, we want to be able to say that we did the right thing. At the end of the day, I and no one else was responsible for our key decisions. And my background warrants a very brief note, if you will indulge me. The chairman was kind enough to indicate as much. I began my legal career in 1973 as a law clerk, first for a judge, Judge David Dyer, on the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, who passed away earlier this year, and then for two years for Chief Justice Berger. Following clerkships, I was in private law practice in Los Angeles and Washington. After William French Smith took office as Attorney General in January 1981, I served as counselor to the Attorney General from 81 to 1983. In that capacity, I experienced firsthand the varied and difficult judgment calls that the Attorney General faces every day. Whether it was dealing with the aftermath of the attempted assassination of the President or selecting a Supreme Court nominee, in that case, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. I took away from that experience an admiration that has continued to this day for the career Justice Department lawyers and prosecutors and the law enforcement officials who toil without fanfare and for whom the guiding principles are fairness and a respect for the law. In 1983, President Reagan nominated me and the Senate was kind enough to confirm me as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for this circuit. I became a colleague on a court with truly great judges, from J. Skelly Wright to Antonin Scalia, from Ruth Ginsburg to Robert Bork, and tackled the issues that come before the D.C. Circuit. This included issues as, as diverse as the constitutional right of a military serviceman to wear a yarmulke, a right I supported in vain, and the right of a newspaper to be free under the First Amendment from the threat of liability under the libel laws. In 1989, I accepted appointment as Solicitor General of the United States and was confirmed by the Senate. The Solicitor General, as you know and have pointed out, is the lawyer who represents the United States in arguments before the Supreme Court. A distinguished predecessor before whom I was privileged to argue, Justice Thurgood Marshall, often stated that being Solicitor General was the greatest job a lawyer could have, bar none. And Justice Marshall was right. As Solicitor General, I had the privilege of arguing 25 cases before the Supreme Court on behalf of the United States. The arguments covered the spectrum of our law, whether flag burning is a protected right under the Constitution, other issues, and whether the Senate's decision to convict and remove an impeached judge is subject to judicial review. While I was Solicitor General, my overarching goal was to run an office faithful to the law and not to political or ideological opinion. And I think the record shows that I did just that. In 1993, I left my second tour of duty in the Justice Department and returned to private practice and teaching constitutional law. In the period before I was named independent counsel in August 1994, 
I was not, however, completely absent from public service. In late 1993, I was asked by the Senate Ethics Committee, chaired at the time by Nevada Senator Richard Bryan, to review Senator Packwood's diaries as part of the Ethics Committee's investigation and to resolve various issues pertaining to those diaries. Every person is, of course, deeply affected by his or her experiences. For my part, my experience is in the law and in the courts. I'm not a man of politics, of public relations, or of polls, which I suppose is patently obvious by now. I'm not experienced in political campaigns. Rather, as a product of the law and of the courts, I have come to an unyielding faith in our court system. Our system of judicial review, the independence of our judges, our jury system, the integrity of the oath, and the sanctity, yes, the sanctity of the judicial process. The phrase on the facade of the Supreme Court, equal justice under law, the inscription inside the Justice Department's corridors and the Attorney General's on chambers, the United States wins its point when justice is done, its citizens in the courts, those are more than slogans. They are not slogans. They are principles that the courts in this country apply every day. Our office saw that firsthand in the trial of Governor Jim Guy Tucker, of Jim McDougall and Susan McDougall. A juror said afterwards that they fought hard for the individual's liberty, but they were overwhelmed by the evidence. It is our judicial process that helps make this country distinct. And my background, my instincts, my beliefs have instilled in me a deep respect for the legal process that is at the foundation of our republic. President Lincoln asked that, in his words, reverence for the laws, reverence for the laws, be proclaimed in legislative halls and enforced in courts of justice. Mr. Chairman, members, I revere the law. I'm proud of what we have accomplished. We were assigned a difficult job. We have done it to the best of our abilities. We've tried to be both fair and thorough. I thank the chairman, I thank the committee, and the American people for their attention. Thank you very much, Judge Starr. The committee will stand in recess until 1.45, and I would ask everyone to remain in the room, in their seats, until Judge Starr uh, has exited the, the room. Just be a few seconds. We'll see you back at 1.45. Chairman Henry Hyde, uh, after a dramatic opening morning here of the House Judiciary Committee with some partisan skirmishing going on between the Democrats and the Republicans, and then Ken Starr, the independent counsel who has been at the center of this political and legal firestorm now for the past year or so, finally having his say. And as expected, it was a low-key recitation, the tone of voice matching his appearance, plain and conventional. But uh, the fabric of the case that he makes against the President of the United States, indisputable on many counts, the President did lie under oath, he did lie to the nation, he did lie to his friends, he did try to stonewall the impeachment or the uh, investigation that Mr. Starr had underway. And the question is, does all of this then warrant the removal of the President of the United States by virtue of impeachment? And that is what this House Judiciary Committee has been convened to consider whether they should send it on to the full House of Representatives and whether the House then will send it on to the Senate. Uh, let's go to some of my colleagues now. Uh, Tim Russert is the Washington Bureau Chief of uh, NBC News and of course moderator of Meet the Press. 
Tim, there was nothing new in all of that, but when you consider the complete bulk of the uh, independent counsel's uh, case against the president, if he were not the president of the United States, he would be in a world of trouble in a federal courthouse. It's overwhelming when you sit here and just listen for two hours uh, laid out in that methodical, mechanical way. And Tom, I thought the reference to the Supreme Court justice was particularly instructive, that if someone was nominated for Supreme Court justice and did the things that the president apparently has done, what would the Senate Judiciary Committee do, Ken Starr asked. And you hear that all across the country. If a high school principal or a business executive did these things, how would people behave? Nonetheless, all that being said, the country has made its decision, and you can tell in the behavior of the Democrats today, uh, impeachment proceedings will not be successful against President Clinton. And the Republicans have to decide what to do. What is their exit strategy? Vote for an article impeachment before the Judiciary Committee, send it to the House floor where it will die, or reach some accommodation, some arrangement, some compromise with the Democrats and the White House uh, before uh, it actually goes to the House floor. Tim Russell, thank you very much. Uh, NBC's Lisa Myers has been following this investigation from the beginning. Lisa, in fact, there was nothing in here that we did not already know. And as the president's admirers will tell you, and even those who are neutral in all of this, they say, well, there are extenuating circumstances here, and the president has now fessed up. Do you think that that's going to neutralize the passion for impeachment? Well, the problem, I think, that for the Republicans is there, there is not much passion for impeachment beyond the, perhaps, the base of the Republican Party. Uh, the polls show 30, 35, 40 percent. I don't, certainly didn't see anything happen this morning that will cause any kind of groundswell. I think Starr did what he planned to do, which was focus attention back on the fact that the president repeatedly lied under oath, repeatedly violated the law, committed offenses for which anyone else would probably go to jail. And that's what he hoped to do this morning. All right, thank you very much, uh, Lisa Myers. Uh, NBC's Gwen Eiffel ca uh, covers Capitol Hill for us. That's ultimately where the uh, decision will be first made, first by this committee. And I think that that's probably a foregone conclusion, isn't it, Gwen, that this committee on a party line vote will probably say, well, we want the rest of our colleagues to share the pain here down on the House floor. You decide whether or not it should go to the Senate. We saw a hint of that at the beginning of this hearing when there was so much acrimony just about who should testify about what. I was inside the room for the bulk of, the, of Mr. Starr's testimony, and the air is thick with tension. Every seat is filled, and there are lines around the corner waiting to get in. Unfortunately, everybody's attention isn't so held. Uh, Congressman Barney Frank, one of the most partisan Democrats on the committee, left at one point during Mr. Starr's testimony saying he was going to go to the gym and work out for a while. But you're right, there's going to be a big decision that's going to fall on this committee. They are most likely going to vote out at least an article of impeachment. The question is what happens when it gets to the floor. Ken Starr knew that his point to this committee today had to be that he was about the law and not about politics, as you heard, and that, as in his words, there was a bright line between law and politics, between courts and the polls. So he's trying to make the point to them that even though he knows they have a political decision to make, and certainly it was very political in that room, that he is going to make the legal case. Thanks, uh, Gwen Eiffel, Lisa Myers, and Tim Russer. Just a reminder, we'll have continuing coverage on this NBC station and, of course, throughout the day on MSNBC as well as MSNBC.com. Whatever else you may think about the outcome of all this, this is truly a historic day in the nation's capital. Only three times in this nation's history has the President of the United States been subject to impeachment hearings. Uh, Andrew Johnson, who was the successor to Abraham Lincoln, then, of course, uh, Richard Nixon during Watergate. The Judiciary Committee did recommend the articles of impeachment. The President resigned his office before he could uh, be subjected to a Senate trial. Now, this president of the United States, based on all the polls that we're seeing so far, the vast majority of the American public saying they do not believe that he should be impeached. They also do not necessarily endorse his personal character or his morals, but they do approve of the job that he's doing. That's the schizophrenia of the American public, and it has served this nation well for more than 200 years now as they make judgments individually and case by case. The American people will continue to have a major role and a major voice in these proceedings as well. A reminder, we'll have continuing coverage this afternoon on NBC, MSNBC, and MSNBC.com. I'll see you then, and of course I'll see you tonight from Washington on NBC Nightly News. I'm Tom Brokaw, NBC News in Washington.
As NBC News live coverage of the impeachment proceedings gets underway again for the afternoon session. Officially, they are not yet back from a lunch break. They got underway 11 minutes late officially this morning. Uh, it could be an equal number of minutes before we get underway here. The gallery is um, uh, kind of uh, filtering in at this point. affair or so uh, was the intention of this committee. You note from time to time Ken Starr nodding. Uh, he knows a good number of people in Washington. He's been around for a good number of years. Uh, this is NBC News live continuing coverage of the beginning of the formal impeachment process in the House. Uh, for those of you just joining us uh, up and down the line of NBC television stations, uh, we welcome you uh, to uh, what will be throughout this afternoon our live coverage. And by the way, for those who can only join us for a short time, a complete summary this evening on the NBC television network, NBC Night Nightly News with Tom Brokaw originating tonight from Washington. Uh, I'll, of course, join you at uh, 9 o'clock Eastern Time on MSNBC for our hour-long uh, regularly scheduled evening newscast tonight, also from Washington. As we look at the um, high shot of uh, this uh, room with uh, so much history, uh, the non-romantic term for it is room 2141 Rayburn House Office Building, uh, of course named after the um, uh, great uh, Sam Rayburn. Uh, capacity 200 people, though um, only a few members of the uh, taxpaying public have been allowed in today. The crowd is mostly uh, journalists, uh, officialdom. Uh, a few members of Congress as spectators have been seen um, in both the front and back of the room. Um, and the journalists are sitting wherever they can. Bill Niekirk of the Chicago Tribune is sitting about uh, three rows behind Ken Starr. The Democrats, um, as uh, Chip Reed noted, have been trying everything in their arsenal, uh, including the unprecedented step of interrupting um, the star witness. Uh, again, no pun intended. Uh, uh, they have uh, been keeping it light. Uh, they've been seen uh, having impromptu conferences, almost uh, jovially talking with each other. Uh, you heard uh, Chip Reed report that Barney Frank uh, mentioned uh, he was going to go work out in the house gym, um, and he was not, according to most who were there, uh, kidding about that. Um, and I think Henry Hyde is going to uh, begin things again, so let's listen in. I would appreciate it if we could get the doors closed. I'm, usur I'm usurping it. Open microphone. The chair now recognizes Minority Counsel Mr. Lowell to question the witness for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Starr. Good afternoon, Ms. Lowell. Chairman Hyde has again this morning announced his desire to conclude the inquiry by the end of this year. With that in mind, it appears that you may be the principal witness that the committee hears and that yours will most certainly be the primary evidence considered. Given this, Mr. Starr, isn't it true that on September the 25th, 1998, without any request by this committee to do so, you sent the committee a letter which agreed that once questions about your conduct were raised, those questions were not incidental or tangential, but they were, quote, appearing to bear on the substantiality and credibility of the information you provided to the House in our referral. Well, Mr. Lowell, the letter, and I believe I'm recalling the one that you uh, are uh, speaking to, we've had a lot of correspondence back and forth, as you know, uh, but the letter, if my recollection serves me, goes to the circumstances with respect to the events of the evening of January 16th. And <clears throat> there were certain allegations being made about the circumstances by which we uh, approached uh, Ms. Lewinsky, what was said, and the like. And that's what we were uh, 
talking about or what we were addressing in that letter, if it again is the, the letter you're, you're, you're indicating. But may I take, uh, I must say, uh, gentle issue with uh, the idea that this is not the information that is before you. This is the information. And the supplemental materials and the appendices reflect the hard work of the grand jury who has evaluated the witnesses. I am the independent counsel. My colleagues and I have gathered the information. But no, I witness not in the sense of a fact witness, except to the extent, obviously, that members want to inquire into the activities of our office. And I'm obviously going to try to be responsive. If you look at tab one, Mr. Starr, of the exhibit book in front of you, just so that we are clear, Indeed, it is the September 25th letter in which you write to the committee and state that the conduct, in this case, of how you dealt with Ms. Lewinsky goes to the substantiality and the credibility of the evidence you sent. That's the letter, is it not? It, it, yes, it is. With that in mind, Mr. Starr, the members of the committee and I have a series of questions that, as you indicated, will elucidate the substantiality and the credibility of the evidence. To begin with, in your testimony, and if you look at your testimony, it would be on pages 31 and 50, okay. you acknowledged that you had a number of choices to make with respect to sending a referral to Congress. To quote from your morning's testimony, you stated that one of the questions you needed to decide was, quote, what to do with the evidence. And then you said we needed to decide, quote, how do you write a referral? You recall your statements with those choices, correct? Yes. With respect to the choices you made, Mr. Starr, you would have to agree, I take it, that there are substantial differences between the referral that you sent to Congress on September 9, 1998, and the one that was sent by Watergate Special Prosecutor Leon Jaworski, to whom you referred in 1974. You would not, would you? Uh, I w I'm not sure I understood would agree the, 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 the formulation of the methodology, yes. the procedures, <clears throat> and the decisions that you made differed substantially to the ones that he made 24 years ago? Well, I understood the question. The answer is yes, in that our referral, the, your question had a number of elements, and so I want to be precise. <clears throat> our referral did indeed differ, and if I may explain why. Mr. Cox and then his successor, Mr. Jaworski, were dealing not in a, an environment controlled by a law. And the assurance I want to give this committee is that we studied the law, namely 595C, very carefully. Mr. Cox, Mr. Jaworski never had occasion to look at 595C because it did not exist. And so we examined that law, we examined the background, and we went through the process that I described this morning. And we determined, for example, that with respect to some of the matters that in my effort to provide assistance to the committee, some of the events with respect to the Whitewater investigation, we were not satisfied in December of 97 that that information that we had at that time standing alone met the threshold. That has been what has uh, governed us. And indeed, I, if I could just add this, the statute was framed in terms of grounds that may constitute grounds for an impeachment. The very language that Congress used suggests to me a process of judgment. And we came to a judgment as opposed to the situation that obtained absent the statute with respect to Mr. Jaworski in 1974. On that point, Mr. Starr, as I understand it, and I think you in referring to the differences. This is how Mr. Jaworski's report has been characterized by Federal Judge John Sirica, who reviewed it in order to send it to Congress. Judge Sirica wrote that Mr. Jaworski's report draw draws no accusatory conclusions. It contains no recommendations, advice, or statements that infringe on the prerogatives of the other branches of government, that it renders no moral or social judgments it is a simple and straightforward compilation of information, and it contains no objectionable features. This is how your report has been described. 
It is a report that marshals and characterizes the information into an aggressive piece of legal advocacy. It is one where there are few of the factual assertions are left to speak for themselves. In short, it is a document with an attitude. It is notable for its failure to acknowledge that there might be more than one way to view at least some of the evidence. And that was from the Supreme Court reporter of the New York Times, Linda Greenhouse, on September the 12th, 1998. It cannot be your testimony, is it, Mr. Starr, that the 595C background material that you say to this committee, which was involved in reviewing that statute that you reviewed, required you to make the accusations, conclusions, in short, have a referral with an attitude. Is it? My opinion of the statute, or my reading and interpretation of the statute, Mr. Lowell, is that I am called upon to establish the reason that, in the independent counsel's view, the matters that I send before you may constitute a grounds for impeachment. That's a very serious and weighty matter, and we approached it in a very serious and weighty matter. I have the highest regard for the late John Sirica. I served with Judge Sirica, but he was addressing, in all fairness, a totally different set of circumstances because, and it may be that we have different interpretations of the statute, but with respect to any particular you know, reporter's uh, evaluation or description, I, I stand behind this referral, and I'm sure there'll be questions about it. What we tried to do in this re referral was to assemble in an organized form, rather than sending you simply truckloads of unorganized information, give it coherence, and then it is your judgment and thus, if it is the judgment that this referral has not, in fact, stood the test of your close examination, did we get the facts wrong? Then, of course, you should come to your own judgment and your own assessment. But this reflects, just so the committee knows, the views of some of the most experienced prosecutors in the country. I stand behind it because it is mine. I stand behind each word of it. It is my ultimate judgment. But this is a professional product. It's not the product of one single person. Whether it be your judgment, Mr. Starr, or the judgment of your entire staff, one thing I think you will agree with is that it was your and your staff's decisions to include the words premeditated, concocted false alibis, deceived, pattern of obstruction, lying under oath, perjury, which words you will never find in the report of Leon Jaworski when he was reporting the same kind of evidence to the Congress 24 years ago. Aren't I right about that? I don't think that I've not reviewed all the material that Mr. Jaworski delivered, and I'm not taking issue with the fact that this document is no doubt, in many respects, different than the very kind of environment and legal standard under which Mr. Jaworski was operating. But Mr. Lowell, if I'm going to, speaking through my voice, but if our office is going to inform the House of Representatives that there may be substantial grounds for an impeachment that is so weighty, that is so serious, that you need to have the benefit of our judgment and our assessment of the facts informed by our watching the witnesses, listening to the grand jury and the way the grand jury reacted to witnesses, the assessment of the grand jury, and then to give you our judgment. But obviously this body is entirely at liberty to re reject this referral as not being substantial or credible. It is entirely your judgment. And one of the points I did try to make in the opening statement is I believe, and you may disagree, that I was called upon to give you my judgment and my assessment, and I have done that. But it is the responsibility of the House of Representatives to use this to the extent that it wants, to discard it, to do whatever it thinks is necessary to come to its judgment as to whether there should be any proceeding, some sort of proceeding or not. This is a tool. This is only a tool for you to use as you see fit. But I don't think that it's fair to criticize my office for not following 
a pattern that was not governed by a statute. And Colonel Jaworski is not here to tell us what he would think if he went through the same process under the statutory regime that our professional colleagues went through. Well, let me conclude this area because you invited it. I know Mr. Jaworski I'm is sorry? He, you have raised something I'm having that a I little think bit of trouble I, hearing you. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. You have raised something that I think bears some note. When you were talking to Mr. about Mr. Jaworski not being here, but he did leave us his words. Mm -hmm. And these are the words that Mr. Jaworski left us. I think you must have known this when you were considering what to do with your referral. In talking about his decisions, the way you have talked about your decisions, in talking about how to send material to Congress about the grave and serious matter of presidential wrongdoing, Mr. Jaworski wrote as follows. Excuse and I want me. to know whether or not this was something. Identify the document. I'm sorry, you could find this on tab four of the exhibits in front of you, and I, I apologize, Mr. Barr. Tab four? Tab four. Thank, thank you, Mr. Lowell. Mr. Jaworski, who left us his words, said, the central key to the entire success was not accusing anyone. What we did is simply carried forward what the facts were, passed them on, not making an effort to interpret them, not making any sort of an effort to construe them or to say what we thought it showed and let it be completely non-accusative. So we don't have Mr. Jaworski, but we do have his words, correct? Absolutely. Uh, and if and I could say, I'm, so, I'm sorry, may I just uh, I, I, a comment uh, in light of your quotation? Um, we did go through an evaluative process as I described. And while we did not have the benefit of Colonel Jaworski, except that which he has left us, I do think it's important for the committee to know that in light of the sober judgment, you're free to disagree with that judgment, but it's our professional judgment that the president engaged in abuse of his authority with respect to executive privilege. We were guided by Sam Dash, who had very strong views on that, who expressed those views and who felt that we had to use certain kinds of language that I think, Mr. Lowell, and I respect your views, you would disagree with. I'd like to move to an area that uh, will, I hope, reflect to the members some of the other choices that you had to make about the evidence. As I understand your testimony this morning, after the four years and however many dollars you've now spent, your testimony confirms apparently that your office is not and is not sending an impeachment referral to the Congress on what's been affectionately or not so affectionately called Travelgate, not what's been called Filegate. And on page 141, I think, of your testimony, you said that you're not... Sorry, at page... 41 of your testimony. Thank you. You're not sending a referral on the original Whitewater land deal and pointed out that in some of your investigation, you've now learned that former Governor Tucker actually exonerated the president on some of the questions that you had. Yes. The referral you sent then, Mr. Starr, refers apparently only to the issues about the Paula Jones case and the questions of the president's conduct in dealing with that case. That's correct, is it not? The referral itself does. We do, of course, in, if, if I may, Please. the re referral does in other respects indicate the ties that we saw to earlier phases of our investigation and why we, in fact, were choosing to assess this. Uh, but you're quite right, both uh, with respect to the two matters you, you indicated, as well as uh, the specific testimony by Governor Tucker, uh, that, that those matters will, in fact, not be coming to you. Mr. Starr, part of the word, a key word in your title is independent counsel, correct? Independent. Yes. Part of being independent, I think you would agree with me, is being free of conflicts of interest that might bias your investigation, correct? Yes. And as I understand it, your testimony this morning indicated that on January the 15th, 1998, the Office of the Independent Counsel met with Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder to discuss your jurisdiction over the matter that has now been presented in the referral. Am I right about that? I believe the date is correct, yes. We, our contact with the department and in those initial meetings was with the Deputy Attorney General. In your testimony, Mr. Starr, you stated and I quote on page 30 of your testimony that you, quote, fully informed the Deputy Attorney General about the matters under investigation. 
and I take it it was because they had to make a decision about jurisdiction, correct? Yes, we were there to discuss jurisdiction. The independent counsel law, as you explained to the committee on pages 29 and 30 of your testimony, indicated that at the day that you were making your presentation, the attorney general had a choice as to whether to recommend that you conduct the investigation or to give that responsibility to someone else. Isn't that also true? Yes. In that case, I suspect that you and your office would have provided the Deputy Attorney General and the Attorney General all the information that she and he would have needed to make that important choice. Am I also correct about that? Well, certainly that which in our judgment was relevant uh, to the, the decision, by all means. Mr. Starr, though, isn't it then true that in fact neither the Deputy Attorney General nor the Attorney General had the facts that they needed because not once in any presentation you or your office made to them about the material that you were now asking their jurisdiction over that you did not ever mention the substantial contacts that you had already had in the Paula Jones case, the very subject about which you were seeking authority to investigate. Mr. Lowell, let me uh, address two aspects. You were asking about the jurisdiction, then let me come to the Paula Jones uh, context that, that, that I had. We did not go to the department, Mr. Lowell, to say we must have jurisdiction. We took to the department an issue because we view the department as that entity of government to whom we look, to the Attorney General of the United States ultimately, to make jurisdictional decisions. And I was not in attendance at the meetings, but I can give you my impression or understanding, and I'll make this very brief. We made it very clear that there was in co the information we had was that there was inchoate criminality, which is a fancy way of saying something is afoot. It's breaking now. It is fast moving, and we need to bring this to your attention, and then you make the determination. We think there is a jurisdictional uh, justification for what we've done thus far, but we think there are serious jurisdictional issues. Now, it will be the Attorney General's decision. Now, what should the Attorney General have been informed? Can First I go over those with you? I mean, well, if you would turn to tab five of the okay. book, I think you and I and the members of the committee will be able to go through the issues that we might either agree or disagree the Attorney General should have been informed about. Mr. Starr, on that page, you'll see that it appears that neither you nor any of the officials in your office told the Attorney General that before you became the independent counsel, your law firm Kirkland & Ellis was actually contacted to represent Paula Jones and eventually helped her attorneys to find the lawyer she chose. That was not mentioned to the Attorney General that day or at any other time that you were seeking jurisdiction or asking her about jurisdiction, was it? Well, you're assuming that I had the benefit of all this information. About what, whether the, your law firm had been asked? Yes, in terms of all that, because I certainly had had personal communications with Mr. Davis, but I would have to reconstruct what others may have done in other offices. It is a large law firm. So if I could just say what I, in fact, uh, knew at the time that this activity was underway, the uh, reaching out to the Attorney General when these events were first uh, unfolding, was that I had, in fact, been contacted by, among others, Mr. Davis, with respect to an amicus brief or some participation on the constitutional immunity issue in 1994. And, and, and those had been publicly reported. It was all in the public domain. I indeed debated that very issue against Lloyd Cutler and Susan Block. On I'm sorry to interrupt you on that. Yes. I, I, the question that I asked, and I'm sorry to do it, was not whether you had had contacts with Mr. Davis, which had been reported at some earlier point. I asked whether you had or any of your office members told the Attorney General that your law firm that you were still a member of and getting a salary from had indeed been sought out to be Paula Jones's lawyers. I understood you saying you may not have known that. My question is, you're telling me that Richard Porter, your partner, did not ever inform you that he had been asked to consider representing Paula Jones and had in fact assisted her in getting the attorney she ultimately chose. Is that what you're saying? Well, my best recollection is, no, I know Richard Porter. Uh, I've had communications uh, uh, with him from time to time. 
But in terms of a specific uh, discussion uh, with respect to what the, the law firm uh, may, be, uh, may, may be doing uh, or, or may not be doing, uh, I'm not recalling that uh, specifically, no. You do recall, though, that it was a matter that you admit that on at least six occasions you personally had had conversations with Paula Jones' attorneys over legal issues in the Paula Jones case. I'm not sure I had had conversations uh, with them just as I had conversations with others, including, and I think the record of these proceedings should reflect that. My position on, if I could be permitted, my position on the constitutional immunity that the President enjoyed was very clear and was open. I was contacted, before I was appointed as independent counsel, by Bob Fisk. Bob Fisk was the independent counsel in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Mr. Fisk asked me whether I would be willing to consider writing an amicus brief on behalf of the Office of Independent Counsel, which, of course, he was appointed by the Attorney General. And we had conversations, or no final decision was made, but he engaged me in discussions with respect to that. We talked about the issues and so forth. So, Mr. Lowell, I want to make a point. It did not occur to me that issues with respect to constitutional immunity, it just did not occur to me and fault me for my inability to issue spot. That's what we do in the law. We try to spot issues. But I never spotted the issue that my conversations with Bob Fisk, Gil Davis, my debating Lawrence Tribe on national public radio had the foggiest connection with issues that were unfolding at the time. And fault my judgment, if you will, but it just frankly did not occur to me, as I think happens to a lot of us in life, that you just don't view that as relevant information. And if I may say so, especially since my position had been so well known, and including the contacts with Ms. Jones' attorneys who reached out to me with respect to the constitutional immunity issue solely, exclusively. And Mr. the final Star, thing I would sorry, say in response you to your off, question... I'm going to, be, I'm going to be cut off of Mr. Chairman. Well, get cut, cut time, you, you said six conversations, and, and you made a very specific point, and I'm not trying to interrupt you, but you made a specific point, and I think it's only fair to say, I don't know whether there were six conversations. I know there were several, but they were only conversations, and it never ripened in... Well, I'm talking about with Mr. Davis... And it never ripened into an arrangement, an agreement, to the best of my recollection, to do anything because of the circumstances that then occurred. To use your phrase, did it not occur to you that you should tell the Attorney General who was making a decision about whether you were an independent counsel that your law firm, Kirkin & Ellis, in addition to ask to be Paula Jones' attorney, was providing legal advice, free legal advice, to a conservative women's group called the International Women's Forum who are thinking about participating in the Paula Jones case itself. Did that not occur to you either? Well, again, the, the, it's, it's not whether it occurs or not. I did have discussions with the, I think it's called the Independent Women's Forum, as to whether they would in fact file an amicus brief again strictly on the constitutional issue, not taking a position on the merits, but the president, through his very able lawyers, had raised a very important question. Does the president of the United States enjoy immunity? Everyone was talking about it, and no one was talking about it particularly quietly. It was a matter of vigorous debate. And the fact that I had these discussions had all been, to the best of my knowledge, part of the public domain. That is, they were reported. And by virtue of that, I do think it's unfair, I really do, to suggest that someone should, when f circumstances are moving so quickly, go do a nexus search, making sure that everything is in the public domain and the like, especially under circumstances that were not only fast moving, but it was very clear that what we were investigating were serious crimes of perjury that had nothing to do with the constitutional immunity of the president. Mr. Starr, are you suggesting that when you told the deputy attorney general that it had a he had to move with haste because this investigation was fast moving, that you had no responsibility to also inform the attorney general about these contacts that you and I are talking about 
which might make the Attorney General, as you pointed out, have a choice to make between giving the investigation to you or giving it to somebody whose independence, bias, and involvement in the case was not questioned. Well, I utterly disagree with all respect with your premise that to be involved on an issue of civil law and constitutional law in any way suggests a predisposition more generally. I would take the position that the President of the United States does not enjoy constitutional immunity from suit regardless of who the President is. It has nothing to do with the identity of the occupant of the office. It has everything to do with what the presidency is and the nature of our relationship to one another as individuals and whether we are all equal under the law. So it did not occur to me. And, and one factual correction. You suggested in your conversations, I did not have conversations with the Deputy Attorney General. They were by others in um, my office who were reporting to the Deputy Attorney General on the information that was coming to us and then saying, what is your judgment? We're looking to you for guidance, and more than that, we're looking to you for a decision. And these issues did not, in fact, arise. Did they, to your knowledge then, Mr. Starr, on that night where you were asking the Attorney General to make a decision whether you were the independent counsel she was looking for, tell them that while you were the independent counsel and still a member of your firm, your law firm, obtained a non-public affidavit in the Paula Jones case and then sent that a affidavit on to the Chicago Tribune. And that, Mr. Starr, happened while you were the independent counsel and a member of your firm. Wasn't that something the Attorney General should have known? I don't know. I'm not saying that she should not, but these are judgment calls that one makes and it also assumes, shall I say, a computer-like ability to recall each and everything that has ever occurred or information that has come to you. And so, let, let me say this. The fact of my involvement with the Jones matter, my personal involvement as opposed to what issues one or more members of my firm may have been involved in, I think was known publicly and thus did not occur to me as something that was appropriate or, or was something that I focused on. Whether I should have focused on it, you may come to a different judgment. Mr. Chairman, um, it appears to me that my questions, as short as I'm going to try to make them, might elicit answers that are a little longer than I expected, and I was hoping I'd get the committee's indulgence. Well, I would tell the gentleman that when your time is up, I'll grant you another 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is about to happen, I thought. Um, Mr. Starr, while we're on the subject of the Jones case, I think it is now from the material you sent to Congress pretty clear that your office did absolutely nothing to stop Linda Tripp from meeting with Paula Jones's attorneys to help them set up for the January 17th deposition of the President. And the fact is, is it not, that you had the power at that moment and the reason at that moment to forbid her from having those meetings, but your office chose not to do so. Isn't that right? That is, uh, I think, an unfair characterization. That is to say, it is once again assuming that there was information as to communications that she may or may not have been having. We did not, to the best of my knowledge, we did not have any information that she was in fact communicating with the Jones attorneys. And indeed, the record will show we began working almost instantly at cross purposes with the Jones attorneys in order to protect this investigation. And we thereafter told Ms. Tripp when it became obvious that she was talking to someone in New York, who apparently in turn was talking to someone in Newsweek, that she did have to protect the confidentiality of these matters that were, that were ongoing. I'd like to get to the date, though, and see if you and I can agree that there was a moment that you had not only the motive, but you also had the ability to stop her from doing what we've now learned that she has done. You went to see the Deputy Attorney General on January 15th. Prior to that, on occasion or two, your officials in your office had met with her. 
And when you went to see the Deputy Attorney General, it's true, is it not, that one of the things that you told him, or your office told him, was that this was likely to start getting leaked, that there was a reporter that was on to this investigation and he needed to move quickly. Isn't that a fact? Yes, we made uh, the, it's my understanding that we made the Deputy Attorney General aware that there was a reporter from Newsweek. We had not known about that initially when the information first came to us, but it became very quickly apparent that there was, in fact, a Newsweek reporter who was on the story unbeknownst to us. And so, yes, we said to the Deputy Attorney General, this is another factor, this is another consideration, and I believe, I don't know, but that I believe that that was brought to the Attorney General's uh, decision. So you knew that there was press people that are on to the investigation, and at the same time, you also knew that Linda Tripp had illegally obtained information that she needed some form of immunity for. And in fact, in your meeting with her, your officials said to her, we will give you immunity for giving us that illegally obtained information. That happened, too, before you met the Attorney General, right? Well, with respect to federal offenses, uh, we uh, were aware that there might be an issue under Maryland law but obviously could not uh, confer immunity that she might have with respect to state law. And what we did know is that this was a witness who told us a very important fact. She said, I was a witness in the Whitewater, excuse me, the White House Travel Office investigation, and I have additional information that I did not give you. And she was being asked, Mr. Lowell, to commit perjury. And so we, yes, we moved very quickly, and there was a very important reason for moving very quickly to bring it to the Attorney General's attention through the deputy, and that is a witness who was involved in one of our ongoing investigations was being asked to perjure herself and otherwise participate in uh, unlawful activity. So if I can put that these steps, I'm sorry, if I could put these steps together. Linda Tripp came to your office with information, that's a correct fact. You were worried that there was somebody talking to the press that required the Attorney General to act quickly. That's a fact. You knew that Linda Tripp had obtained information, including the very tapes that provided the evidence that you sought to get permission to investigate from the Attorney General. And you didn't put those three things together to say to her, and by the way, we're worried about the press. You were worried enough about it to ask the Deputy Attorney General to move quick. You're saying you didn't tell Linda Tripp not to be talking about that stuff well, we to anybody? No, I, I think that's an unfair characterization. We did, in fact, promptly tell her, and events were moving very quickly, within a short time, when it became evident to us, because things are not immediately evident when matters are first developing, and so you have to assess the facts. And so when it did, we, we instructed her, it's my understanding, that my colleagues who were dealing with her, who were experienced career prosecutors, made it very clear, stop communicating with someone who we felt was in fact, or at least potentially was a source for Newsweek. And indeed, it is my understanding that the, the witness in question proceeded to change her phone so that she could in fact carry out our desire, our instruction, which was, and we had no interest, Mr. Lowell, we had no interest in this matter being made public. We had no interest whatsoever in doing anything other than our duties as honorable prosecutors to bring information to the Attorney General, let her assess it, and let her make her judgment as to should it be investigated, and if so, by whom. Now, you can say you should have told her X, Y, and Z, and I would say that's Monday morning quarterbacking. Well, it's not exactly Monday morning quarterbacking, Mr. Starr. Okay. If you'll turn to tab 16, you'll see the agreement that you actually engaged Ms. Lewinsky herself in when you decided to give her immunity, as your officials had already indicated to Linda Tripp on January 12th that she would be getting immunity for her taping. And you'll notice in tab 16 that it wasn't Monday morning quarterbacking for you and your officials to give Monica Lewinsky not only immunity, but to make a condition of her immunity that she not talk to witnesses, that she not disclose information, and in fact, that she not do the things that you now know Linda Tripp did. Why didn't you put the same restriction on Linda Tripp? What you see is the result of a very careful discussion, negotiation with very able lawyers. This was not done. The immunity agreement that you have before you 
was not prepared under exigent circumstances with things moving so quickly. We did have to move quickly in our judgment with the information that came to us from Ms. Tripp. And so one handles different situations in a variety of, uh, in, in a variety of ways. But I relied on my professional prosecutors to come to a judgment about what should in fact be done and how it should be done and to in fact when it became, as I say, evident that there was an issue, I think they brought it promptly to the Deputy Attorney General's attention and also sought to take what they viewed at the time. These are judgment calls. You're not suggesting to the committee that um, while it might have taken a lot of time to negotiate the actual clauses of an immunity agreement with Ms. Tripp, that on the day that she said she was in trouble and asked for immunity, your people could have not said to her, well, if these tapes are illegal, don't give them to anybody, don't talk to anybody about them, keep them to yourself. You didn't need an immunity agreement to tell her that. Well, I think that's right, because uh, one of the things, and I, and I should uh, clarify, that what we entered into with uh, Ms. Lewinsky, and I think this, this does need to be clear, was a transactional immunity agreement. She was going to enjoy immunity from prosecution. What we were giving uh, Ms. Tripp at the time was something that was much more limited, an act of production kind of immunity. Give us material, at least that is my understanding that we were at that point in our discussions with her, simply saying, give us the information because she had come to us with very serious allegations. And when we, we didn't ask her to come in, she came in, she comes in, she provides this very serious information that raise very potentially serious offenses, and we wanted, in fact, to gather information as quickly as we could that would either corroborate or disprove the truth of that. So the decision that was being made initially was what we call but uh, you are active not production immunity. I'm, I'm understanding you, but I'm also understanding you say that you're not contesting that on that day she came in, she had the conversation, she showed you the tapes or told you about the tapes. Yes, she did you not. You had uh, both uh, the authority to give her immunity and the authority to tell her not to talk. You did the first, you didn't do the second, did you? Well, I'm not, I would have to double check to see exactly what we did tell her, but no, what I, what I am uh, trying to make as clear as I possibly can is that what we were saying to Ms. Tripp, you have given us this remarkable information, allegations, they are extraordinarily explosive that perhaps go to the President of the United States. We need backup. And she was coming to us as a witness, and this information was not, at the time that it was first coming to us, in the public domain. So we took the steps that we thought, or my colleagues who were making these decisions on the spot, took the steps that we did. But if the suggestion is we wanted her to go public, the suggestion is absolutely wrong. I think you misunderstand my question. I could well understand why people in Linda Tripp's position and your staff working with her didn't want the investigation to become public. But I could also understand why Linda Tripp wanted the information she had to go into the Paula Jones camp. And I could understand that you had the authority to stop that, but didn't do it. But what we did do, Mr. Lowell, in fairness, and this isn't the glasses half full versus half empty, what we did once it became clear that there was a following by the Jones lawyers of our investigation and the subpoenaing of witnesses in our investigation, we took prompt remedial action. We went to Judge Susan Weber Wright and we said, stop it. Please have them stop it. And that is extraordinarily important because that's what we took deliberatively as opposed to under the exigencies of the time on the uh, exigencies yes. of the time, one last question. Yes. You're not suggesting that you and your staff that were talking to Linda Tripp and then going to see the Deputy Attorney General were not aware that on that following Saturday, January the 17th, the President of the United States was already noticed for his deposition. You're not telling us that, are you? No, we did know that, and indeed the Deputy Attorney General and then the Attorney General of the United States, Mr. Lowell, knew that there were serious allegations. This was days, several days before the deposition. The deposition was on Saturday the 17th. 
the Attorney General made her decision knowing the information that we had, and we were transparent. We shared the information, Mr. Lowell, that we had fully with the Justice Department. Our concern... Sorry, the information you had about what Linda Tripp gave you, not the information that you had about the Kirkland and Ellis involvement. Yes, I'm sorry. The information that had come to us with respect to the investigation, we shared fully with senior career prosecutors at the Justice Department operating under the direction of the Deputy Attorney General, and she then, the Attorney General, made her decision that the matter should in fact be investigated, so that was the first judgment, and secondly, that the Department of Justice did not want to do it. Let me turn our attention to some of the other aspects of gathering evidence, because I know many people will have additional questions. I know you don't disagree that independent counsels, although not in the Department of Justice, are required under the rules and under the law to follow the law that applies to federal justice, department officials, prosecutors, and investigators. I know you've said as much in your speeches that you are bound by the same rules with very few exceptions, correct? The statute speaks specifically to the question of the applicability of DOJ policies and practices and says, to the fullest extent practicable. This morning you told the committee that, and this is on 49 and 50 of your own testimony, we have made every effort to follow the Department of Justice practice and policies, to utilize time-honored law enforcement techniques, and even on occasion that you and your staff, to use your phrase, would repair to the U.S. Attorney's Manual for guidance. You stated that this morning. I did. With these statements in mind, I would like to turn to the issue of your involvement with Monica Lewinsky on the first occasion that you had that ability, because so much of the evidence that the Congress has received comes from that first incident. It is true, I take it, Mr. Starr, that when press accounts of your interaction with Monica Lewinsky first arose, you made a statement to the press on January 23rd, 1998, responding to those allegations. And you can find that statement to confirm its date on tab 20. Tab 20. Okay. Do you see that? I do. You made that statement on January 23rd. Isn't that a fact? Yes, I believe that's correct. This is dated January 24th, but I think it would have been the preceding day. Mr. Starr, in your testimony this morning, you talked about the President's ability to provide misinformation, and you also said that one of the concerns of your office was that the President and his lawyers, on page 52 of your testimony, didn't give a, quote, distorted picture of the facts. With your own quotes in mind, I'd like to ask, don't you think your statement to the press, to the Congress, and to the American people gave a very distorted picture of the facts of the night and the day that you first confronted Monica Lewinsky? Well, I think uh, not, uh, and we can obviously discuss it. Well, let's uh, do that line by line, because it will be short, yes. but I think it will be elucidative. If you look at the first line of your press statement, it states, Monica Lewinsky consented to meet with several FBI agents. Do you see your statement that says that? Yes, I do. In Monica Lewinsky's sworn testimony, which if you'd like you could follow in tab 21 to compare it back and forth, we will have it on the stand as well. She testified under oath that she was there to have lunch with Linda Tripp. She was then accosted by agents who flashed their badges at her. She asked to see her attorney, was told that that wasn't such a good idea, she was then asked to go upstairs to discuss how much trouble she was in, and then she reluctantly went upstairs to meet with your staff. Do you think your statement that Monica Lewinsky consented to meet with several agents doesn't distort the picture of what really happened that day? Well, I think it was, uh, cons uh, it, it was consensual. That is, we made it clear that she was not under arrest and that she was, in fact, uh, uh, at liberty to make a decision as to what she wanted uh, wanted to do. Well, if you look at the second line of your quote of your press statement, you said, yes. during the five hours while awaiting her mother's arrival, Miss Lewinsky drank juice and coffee, ate dinner at a restaurant, strolled around the Pentagon City Mall and watched television. Do you remember making that statement to the press? Yes, I do. But your statement to the press, Mr. Starr, doesn't include the facts that Ms. Lewinsky swore to, that she was scared and was crying a lot of the time. When she asked to see her attorney, quote, she would not be able to help herself with her attorney there, she was told, that she was threatened 
with going to jail for, quote, 27 years, that she was not there for the five hours that your press statement says, but was there for over 10 hours, and that when she asked to call her mother to discuss what you were discussing with her, your deputy, Jackie Bennett, said, you're 24, you're smart, you're old enough, you don't need to call your mommy. That wasn't in your statement to the press that day, was it? No, it wasn't, Mr. Lowell, and let me explain what press statements are designed to do. This, <laughs> this was not designed to provide a verbatim transcript of commentary. They are designed to respond to what we were, in fact, being accused of or charged with. And what we were being accused of and charged with was improper conduct with a witness. Now, the facts of the matter are these. We did, in fact, use a traditional technique that law enforcement always uses. We were waiting patiently for her mother to arrive. She chose not to make a decision before her mother arrived. And at the conclusion of her time with us, she had established a legal relationship which we fully recognized and always honored. And she and her mother indicated, I was not there, but I am told they indicated their appreciation for the way in which she was being treated. Now, this was in response. This was being in, in response, Mr. Lowell, to allegations that she was being subjected to the kinds of conditions that would overbear the will. We then, and the purpose of this was to say, here is in fact material that the public should in fact know. And all of this is absolutely true. When you say the public should have known that, and you state in your press statement that she was repeatedly told she was free to leave and that she did so several times, do you not think it would have been a less distorted picture, to use your words, to know that when she left the room she was followed by agents and that she swore under an oath that she, quote, felt threatened that when she left she would be arrested, end quote? Don't you think that completes the picture a little bit? I think her perception was incorrect. We made it clear to the witness that she was, in fact, free to leave. And the Ritz-Carlton, shall I say, is a fairly comfortable and commodious place. We will show you, I'm sure you have them, telephone records that indicate she reached out to Mr. Carter, her attorney, in a totally different matter. She called her mother. She, in fact, went for a walk. She, had res to, she uh, went to a restaurant and, and the like. And all these were important because, Mr. Lowell, what the office was being accused of was somehow overbearing her will. And she didn't need to make a decision because here's the other side of the picture. She was encouraging others to join her in committing perjury. She was, as the information came to us, a felon in the middle of committing another felony. She wasn't likely, after being brought up to your room for 10 hours, to be committing any felonies anymore after that, was she? You said you needed to do this because she was in the middle of committing a felony. You don't think she was going to leave the hotel room, go back, and continue to do that which you brought her to the hotel room to do? You can't well, be course, meaning that. We did not know. We had no way of knowing what she was going to do. What we did do is this, that we had a consensual recording we shared the results of that consensual recording with the Justice Department. We informed the Justice Department of what our intention was at the Ritz-Carlton. We then proceeded in a very professional way. And then we were being met, as is not atypically the case, with charges of improper conduct. We then said we should respond to that, especially when and this doesn't speak to that either. We were going to the conditions of confinement as opposed to whether we had communicated with the Justice Department. There was let nothing me, in here about the Justice Department knowing me. that we were going to go have exactly this kind of encounter to ask this individual, are you willing to help us? We viewed her as culpable. 
but in discussions with the Justice Department, the culpability we thought might be outweighed by the culpability of others. As you are the deliverer to this committee of the principal evidence that the e committee is going to get, and as you agreed with me that the choices you've made bear on the substantiality and credibility, my questions were trying to go to whether or not when you make statements, when you provide information, you provide the complete picture, not whether Ms. Lewinsky was about to commit a crime, but I think you and I have established some of the facts that I wanted the committee to understand. One last point about your statement, Mr. Starr. Your statement to the press, as you alluded, indicated that when she was done with this ordeal, I'm sorry, when she was done, she told the agents, and I think you said they thanked the FBI agents and attorneys for their courtesy, but you didn't put in that, and you didn't put in your referral that she thanked them for their courtesy after, quote, they told me they were planning to prosecute my mother for the things that she had said she did. You didn't include the notion in your report to the press or even in the material in the referral that is later in the transcripts that part of her courtesy to her mother was threatening her prosecution. And that wasn't there either. Mr. Lowell, the information that we had suggested that her mother may have been involved in serious activity, in serious criminal offenses. That, that was an issue. And she wanted to reach out to her mother to discuss the questions with her mother. We honored that. And no, I don't think that one would expect, if you're talking about the press release as opposed to the referral, mm -hmm that a press release which is responding to charges by her lawyers that which she was being held, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but the substance of what was being conveyed by the very loquacious Mr. Ginsburg was that she was being held incommunicado. That was wrong. It was unfair to us, unfair to our agents, it was unfair to the Justice Department. But you don't see anything in the press release about the Justice Department either. The purpose of this press release, which you've identified as tab 20, and you've been kind enough to underscore it, was to respond to specific allegations. And I see you do not include the allegations to which you're, we were responding. And I think in order fairly to assess this, you would have to say, what was it that the independent counsel's office was having to respond to? What we were responding to were allegations that were utterly unmeritorious. And those and allegations, what, Mr. Sorry. Starr, were that you were overbearing, that she wasn't free to make a decision on her own, that she was put in a position where her judgment would be questioned, and you're saying to the committee that the facts as sworn to by Ms. Lewinsky don't bear on whether or not in those allegations were indeed exactly accurate. Oh, Mr. Lowell. Surely you don't think that a witness is going to say, thank you, law enforcement, for finding out that I'm in the middle of committing a felony. Surely you're not going to say, <laughs> surely you're not going to take the position that the witness should say, oh, I, I can't imagine why you're asking me any questions. I can't imagine why you're bothering me. The reason that she was being approached, Mr. Lowell, was that she was trying to get Linda Tripp to commit perjury, and since you've inquired about this, her mother had made it clear that she was willing to help finance an operation for Linda Tripp so she could leave the jurisdiction and thereby avoid being confronted in the Jones deposition. Sitting That's here what this was all about. So you're focusing on a press release as opposed to a court document. Could I say one other thing? In fairness, in fairness, the issues with respect to our conduct that evening have been litigated. You could ask, obviously, all the questions that you want, but usually, if a witness believes that he or she has been mistreated, if her rights have been violated, there's a place to go, and it's called the courthouse. And that's where these issues have been resolved, and they've been resolved favorably to us. We conducted ourselves professionally. I take it sitting here today, you are completely satisfied that the picture of your involvement with Ms. Lewinsky, as you stated to the American people, and the effects it had on her evidence were accurately depicted in the press statement you made, even given the full sworn testimony of Ms. Lewinsky and her mother. You're satisfied about that? About th this press statement? About your being the No, no. Because this was written 
from, and, and perhaps I have been inartful in my response. This was a response to specific allegations being made by her attorney. It was not based on an interview of Ms. Lewinsky. We had no uh, basis for knowing, in terms of our uh, talking with Ms. Lewinsky, what her perception was. We couldn't. Her lawyer declined to allow us, and we honored that once she engaged Mr. Ginsburg. To, to, so the mission or the purpose of this, of this press statement was simply to be as responsive as we should be at the time. Just so that the record's clear, yes. Mr. Ginsburg is the lawyer you keep referring to. She know, we know from the evidence that she contacted Mr. Ginsburg only after her mother arrived about however many hours later in the middle of the night. And the very first thing she said when approached by your agents in the lobby was, I want to talk to my attorney, Frank Carter. You don't mean to suggest to the committee that you and the agents and the people in your office was encouraging her to talk to her lawyer between the time that she was first accosted and the time that she got on the phone with Mr. Ginsburg. You're not making that statement, are you? That is correct. We would not encourage someone who was involved in felonies, as we thought at the time, to in fact reach out to a lawyer, especially a lawyer who had assisted her in crafting a perjurious affidavit. Why would we possibly do that? Well, one reason would be because the rules of the Department of Justice, the law of the land as decided by the Supreme Court, and the Code of Federal Regulations require it. Let me turn your attention to tab 23. On tab 23, as I understand it, Mr. Starr, one of the people that were in the room asking questions of Monica Lewinsky was a deputy of yours by the name of Michael Emick. Is that right? That's correct. Michael Emick came from the Department of Justice U.S. Attorney's Office in Los Angeles, California, and had had the opportunity three or four years before the Monica Lewinsky incident to give a speech or give a presentation to the Department of Justice about what the law requires. And this is what Mr. Emick said about questioning a witness represented by counsel. He said, it is rarely okay to contact the person, find out about representation, and ask if he is willing to talk anyway. And then Mr. Emick went on to state, it is never okay to continue to ask questions after the person has said he wants his attorney there. In light of what the transcript show happened that night to Ms. Lewinsky, it appears, does it not, Mr. Starr, that the deputy involved violated his own words in his effort to get Ms. Lewinsky that night? No, because you're assuming something and you are, with all respect, incorrect. She was not represented for purposes of this analysis. And the reason that she wasn't, and you may disagree with this, but here is our analysis, and it has been upheld by the district court. Let me approach it this way. If one has a bankruptcy lawyer, one cannot, one cannot say if an FBI agent comes up to one, well, I am represented by, or the FBI agent must assume that I am represented by, or the person is represented by the bankruptcy lawyer. The point is, there's a very clear distinction in the law and in the rules of ethics between mm. civil matters and criminal. And Mr. Carter was representing her in the civil matter. But when she, uh, I realize up to that point she had no criminal problems. She only had civil problems, which she was, had a lawyer for. So you're saying it's the prosecutor who tells a witness whether or not she or he has the right to call a lawyer based on the prosecutor's decision as to whether or not the matter is civil and criminal in the prosecutor's view of how the proceedings are going to go. Do you think that's what the law states? Well, I think the prosecutor has to make a judgment as to whether the nature of the representation is civil or criminal so that the person does have to know whether, in fact, the party is a represented party. That is a judgment. Now, even if you disagree with that, Mr. Lowell, let me say these two things very briefly. One, she did in fact call, or we sought to call Mr. Carter from the Ritz-Carlton. That's a very important fact. She did in fact reach out to him. Also, we tried to reach out to legal aid so that she could have counsel. She later got, of course, Mr. Ginsburg. So the idea that she was not in fact permitted the opportunity to try to consult with, uh, with counsel is incorrect. Mr. Chairman, I'm on my last area of questions, and I would appreciate the committee's indulgence. 
How much more time do you anticipate? Well, I know my questions take five or ten minutes. The answers always take twice as long. I suspect I have well, you, about you five or such complicated questions. Mr. Chairman, I have one more area to get into, and I'd appreciate the committee's indulgence to get there. Um, well, I'll yield you five, five more minutes uh, and see what you can do in five. I'll ask Mr. Starr if you can be concise, although I'm enjoying your answers myself. <laughs> Mr. L Mr. Lowell, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the end, Mr. Starr, you have said that these are serious matters that the committee has to uh, consider and that you've come here today and you presented again what you deem to be the evidence and the conclusions in your referral. I just want to, if I can, with you and with the committee's ind now indulgence, go through the principal charges that you made in bringing this matter before the committee. In the first matter, you say that in your referral, in your testimony today, that the President lied under oath on a variety of occasions having to do with the Paula Jones case. I noticed on pages 8 and 9 of your testimony, you spoke about Judge Weber Wright's rulings in the Paula Jones case. But in your testimony, you did not also include, did you, that Judge Wright had ruled as to Monica Lewinsky's significance in the Paula Jones case that it was, quote, not essential to the core issues in the case. She ruled indeed later on that the evidence, quote, simply was not essential to the core issues of whether Paula Jones was the victim of a quid pro quo sexual harassment. And she finally threw out the case on the grounds that Ms. Jones had not proven what the law requires. And I wanted just the record to be complete that when you talked about what Judge Weber Wright had ruled in your testimony, you never mentioned that on three occasions Judge Wright made rulings indicating that the significance of whatever it was between Monica Lewinsky and the President did not bear on her decision. That's a fact, isn't it? Well, I disagree with the characterization of what she ruled, and I refer, and I will simply refer to her two opinions, including her analysis under Rule 403 of the Federal Rules of Evidence. I don't think that's a fair and accurate characterization of what she ruled. We may have a different opinion of uh, how she adjudicated the matter. Then as to the issue of the false affidavit, which you state was something the President was complicit in to the extent that it was a ground for impeachment, your evidence also includes, does it not, Mr. Starr, that Mr. Ms. Lewinsky gave you a statement in which she said, quote, neither the President nor Mr. Jordan or anyone on their behalf asked or encouraged her to lie. And you can find that in tab 35. Tab 35. 35. Thank you. you must, you're aware that she has made the statement that way by now, I assume, right? Yes. You must yes. be aware that she also said that she offered to show her affidavit to the president, but he did not even want to see it. You're aware that that's the testimony that she's given as well, correct? Yes. You must also be aware that she explained to you that the president and she had obviously used cover stories from the beginning of their relationship long before she was ever listed as a Paula Jones witness. You're aware of that as well, aren't you? Yes, and our referral makes that, that point clear. As to the issue of whether or not she was given a job in some way to keep her happy, you know the evidence that you sent Congress includes the fact that the job search for her began long before she was listed as a Paula Jones witness, correct? Yes, absolutely, and we make that clear in the referral. And you are also aware that she told the president in July, months before the Paula July Jones... July of... 1997. Yes, thank you. Months before mm -hmm. the Paula Jones case was an issue, that she was going to look for a job in New York. Yes, she did. And you're aware as well that it was Ms. Tripp, not the president, Ms. Tripp, who suggested to Ms. Lewinsky that she bring Vernon Jordan into the process. You know the evidence says that, don't you? I am aware of the, of the uh, evidence uh, with respect to that. Uh, but, but yes, go right ahead. I'm sorry. You're, you're aware as well that the evidence you've sent Congress indicates that on that crucial issue, as others have stated, and I'm no doubt will state again, Ms. Lewinsky unequivocally, even though never asked the question, stated to you that no one ever asked her to lie, no one promised me a job for her silence. You understand she swore to that as well? Yes, and Mr. Chairman, may I respond? I'm trying to be sure. brief, but uh, Mr. Lowell, as you also know, at page 174 of our referral, we specifically say Ms. Lewinsky has stated that the President never explicitly told her to lie. I understand you say, that you say explicitly. I'd say that Ms. Lewinsky's statement that, quote, no one told me to lie, no one offered me a job for my silence, is not equivocal, would you? 
I would say that it is utterly incomplete and grossly misleading. We try to capture that, and I'm, of course, staying right now with respect to the uh, her representation with respect to no one told me to lie. Her entire testimony is to the effect, and I think this is a fair characterization of it, is that the cover stories were, in fact, going to continue, that that was the understanding. But yes, no one explicitly said, you know, you will lie, using the L word. Rather, it was, we will continue with cover stories which were not true. I have one last question, Mr. Starr, given the limits of time under which I've been I'm, placed. I'm going to have a surly bunch of Republicans. It is my last question, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, ask your last question. Please, go ahead. <laughs> Didn't you feed them? <laughs> it was... Not with what they yeah. want. No, it was, it was a very Did I, did I hear Charles Schumer break. here? <laughs> Last question. Last time. <laughs> Mr. Starr, I don't have the time to get into the areas, and hopefully the members will, but I will ask you the last question. It's the one I started with. When you suggested to the committee that what you did, the choices you made, have to be looked at to determine the substantiality and the credibility of the evidence, I want to ask you whether or not you don't now see, based on the things that we've discussed, that the manner in which you decided to write the referral as one with attitude, your contacts between you, your law firm, and Paula Jones' attorneys, the questions that have been raised about whether or not you got into this case with proper jurisdiction, the way you dealt with Monica Lewinsky and the evidence that came from that, Judge Johnson's orders, which some others will talk to you about, about whether your office has been responsible for leaks, and the contradictions in the evidence between your referral and the statements you agree are in the evidence. Doesn't that undermine the substantiality and credibility of the evidence on something as weighty as impeaching a president of the United States? Mr. Lowell, nothing that you have said, and with all respect, what you have done is go into characterizations as opposed to deal with facts. The facts are as we have found them to be, and not one of your questions suggests that the president was not involved in serious offenses that now is your responsibility to evaluate. In terms of the letter, I believe, with all due respect, you have overread the letter. I do think if there were any suggestion that we had compelled a confession from her on the evening of January 16, that would go forcefully and powerfully to whether any such statement by her should be used. But Mr. Lowell, she was treated in such a way she did not make a statement to the officers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you. The, uh, we, we will now move to the members questioning and the chair recognizes under the five minute rule, we'll try to adhere to it uh, but again, I will be liberal. NBC News I, live coverage I, continues now. The impeachment hearings, uh, this portion uh, will be the members of the committee itself uh, questioning Mr. Starr. Let me say that the clock does not run slower on this side of the table <laughs> as apparently it does over on the other side. Uh, I was struck, Mr. Chairman, that for the first hour plus, Mr. Lowell's questions completely avoided and evaded the principal charges that have been in your referral, Judge Starr, and only after his second extension in the last five or six minutes did he get uh, to the charges that specifically allege uh, misconduct by the President of the United States. I would hope that during these proceedings, the rule of law is not on trial. That is something that has served our country well for over 200 years. The rule of law, I think, is paramount. And with the rule of law goes the notion that everybody stands before the law equally, whether they be president or pauper, whether they be powerful or poor. So having said that, let me ask you, Judge Starr, uh, whether you believe that there is any difference in the law of perjury and the law of making false statements to a grand jury just because they happen to relate to sexual matters. They do not, uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. As, as I have tried to indicate uh, in the opening statement, as we've indicated in the referral, perjury is extraordinarily serious business. It is insidious. 
the courthouse cannot operate if perjury is allowed to either be excused or to be minimized. And why should we, in fact, go through the process of saying there is an oath. We want you to tell your, we want your honesty. That's what we ask in, in, in court. We want your honesty. And it does not matter whether the issue has to do with <coughs> sexual harassment or bankruptcy or the criminal law. Bank, it is all dreadfully serious. And in my reading, I know that there is scholarly commentary to the opposite effect. Perjury would, in fact, have been viewed as an impeachable offense at the time of the founding of the Republic. And courts from that time on have taken perjury as extraordinarily serious, regardless of the kind of case. Uh, Judge Starr, uh, folks back home have come up to me and said, why don't you drop this whole impeachment thing because everybody lies about sex and the president ought to have the opportunity to lie about sex just like everybody else. Um, I'm concerned about the impact of that attitude if it ends up being adopted around the country uh, on a lot of essential protections that the law provides, particularly for women. Uh, for example, every sexual harassment suit is about sex. That's of its very nature. And much of our litigation, both civil and criminal, of domestic violence has at least some element of sex involved in it. If people can perjure themselves in court about sex, don't you think that that makes our sexual harassment laws and our domestic violence laws less meaningful and in many cases unenforceable? Yes, I well, it certainly makes them, I agree fully that it would make them less meaningful. And it would certainly make it much more difficult to enforce if we did not take acts of perjury or obstruction seriously in this particular category of case. I have one further question which has been referred to before. Um, there are some that have said that uh, the testimony about Monica Lewinsky in the president's civil deposition in the Paula Jones case was not material as a result of an order which you obtained from Judge Wright uh, right after the expansion of your jurisdiction uh, into the Lewinsky matter. Uh, could you please describe what that order did and why you sought it and what its effect was uh, on those allegations of perjury and false statements that you made in your referral relative to the Jones civil deposition? Yes. Number one, we tried to put a stop quickly, immediately, to the Jones lawyers' efforts to notice depositions of witnesses in our grand jury matter. We, Mr. Chairman, may I just, I'll, I'll make Surely. this very brief. Surely. That's we, more a restriction on the questioner oh, than I see. the questionee. But you uh, may regret that because I... <laughs> Please. And, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But we went to the judge and the judge, uh, and we asked for a stay of discovery, and the judge in response to our request for a stay then went on to determine, under an analysis of that I was trying to describe uh, to Mr. Lowell's apparent irritation, Rule 403, but it was the issue that Judge Wright was wrestling with, which is a weighing or balancing process, and she determined that this evidence, although possibly admissible, should be excluded because the dangers to the criminal justice process, I mean, her order should speak for itself, and I shouldn't be paraphrasing the judge's order. The point is, she responded to our concern when we were trying to vindicate the integrity of our criminal justice uh, investigation. But that, ha but that has no, I I'm so sorry, Go that ahead, was point finish. one. Point two, that has no effect whatsoever on materiality, which was the second part of your question, because that is a legal concept that, fortunately is very consistent with common sense. Materiality is measured at the time that the statement is made. It doesn't matter what eventually happens in the lawsuit. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers. Thank you very much. Mr. Starr, um, 
It's very clear under this process, which many of us do, do not uh, agree to, that trying to question you for five minutes is a, a ambitious and uh, hopeful undertaking that doesn't quite ab ab achieve our objectives. Uh, would you be willing to uh, respond to additional <coughs> questions should the time uh, run out on us uh, to these uh, other questions that might be put to you in the uh, in a written form? We're, we're trying to be as helpful as we can, so if there are written questions, uh, depending on the, the, the chair's uh, ruling, uh, whatever the chair uh, determines is appropriate, because I, I don't know. Members may submit written questions sure. uh, for the record. I'd like to establish a deadline uh, for the re questions and for the responses by Judge Starr so that the questions and answers may be included in the record before our authority runs out. Thank you very what much. What deadline would the gentleman from Michigan suggest? Uh, I don't have one right now, but could we agree on one uh, very shortly? Uh, uh, a, a week. Okay. Without objection, uh, quest questions shall be submitted in a week, which happens to be Thanksgiving, uh, and the response is within a week. Is there objection by members of the committee? Hearing none, so ordered. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, reserving the right to object. My only concern is, that, if I may address the reservation, my only concern at this point is that the request as phrased by my friend from Michigan theoretically could be an invitation to an open-ended encyclopedic uh, presentation of questions to Judge Starr that neither he nor his office will have the appropriate amount of time to respond. I'm assuming that uh, if questions are propounded could, to Judge Starr's office... Could I allay my uh, friend from California's uh, problems in his reservation by saying that uh, all I seek is a full record so that no member has been cut off from uh, a question that they should try to ask within the five-minute rule on uh, inquiry on the impeachment of a president of the United States. I thank my colleague's uh, clarification. My assumption, Mr. Chairman, is that with unanimous consent, uh, that also comes a degree of reasonableness, and if there is a of problem. Course. Uh, with uh, Judge Starr's being able to uh, propound answers in a timely fashion, he would be able to notify the committee and we would be able to review this issue uh, again. Uh, absolutely. Exactly. And, and the chair, or the acting chair, would request uh, that members funnel their questions either through Chairman Hyde or ranking minority member Conyers uh, rather than firing them off directly exactly. to Judge Starr. I, I thank before, you for the order. I thank uh, you before, for the uh, interest. We, uh, gentleman from Georgia. Unanimous consent. Uh, what exactly... To allow written questions by to the independent counsel, and yeah. he has to answer them within a week. Oh, oh a week, yes. I, I object. Objection is heard. Well, uh, I have told your five minutes, so the gentleman's recognized for five minutes now. Well, we just uh, went through a process which we had, I thought, agreement. Uh, what what we're doing here then, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is saying that within uh, a five-minute period, uh, 16 members, uh, including uh, Mr. Starr's response, have five minutes to ask him anything that they want. I think that this is patently unworkable, and all I suggested was was an additional method of communicating with you in writing. So, well, if, if, uh, if the chair can respond to that, uh, the rules of the House of Representatives in these instances provide for recognition of members for five minutes apiece. And the chair at the beginning of this hearing today said that members would be recognized under the five-minute rule. Uh, so far, there have been only two people who have spoken, Mr. Lowell, who received two extensions, and yours truly, uh, who got his questions in within five minutes. Uh, now, I don't think we want to be staying here until midnight. Uh, I would hope that uh, the five-minute rule, which seems to have worked well for decades, uh, can be adhered to and members can be concise. So again, I will move the clock back to zero, and the gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. All right. It's, it's clear to me that uh, some members do not want a full and open discussion with, with the uh, uh, witness, the only witness here today. So let, let, me, let me just 
propose, yes, ma'am. Uh, no, I was going to my questions, but I, I'll yield to you if you'd like. Well, no, it's uh, just that uh, the chairman is back, and uh, I'm not sure that he was privy to your request. Have, have I, you yielded to her? Because this is your yes, time. Yes, I did. Well, I did. Okay, uh, that's all right. Uh, you want to submit written questions yes. to the well, witness? That's the only point, sir. Well, uh, it, it, I have no objection if he has no objection, but I would like them, uh, they would be returned when we hear from the president. How's that? A simultaneous return of questions. Is that is that a good idea? When we, well, I don't know if we should condition uh, our questions to Mr. Starr on whether the president and his counsel have chosen to raise whatever questions chairman, you have with him. The gentleman yield. Of course, I would. I would simply point out that uh, the 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 request for the ability to. Um, uh, submit written questions is made on behalf of members of the House on this, on this side and presumably the other side of the aisle. We have no control over the, whether the President testifies it's up to him and the two subjects are you, separate. You do see the wisdom, the fairness, though. That's a big word around here. No, I don't. Here. I don't see the fairness, frankly. You don't. Uh, the President uh, will testify or not as he determines. It's his determination in this proceeding. And uh, uh, frankly, the, the ranking minority member suggested that it would be helpful to the members of this committee in ascertaining the facts and having a full and fair proceeding uh, that we have the opportunity to submit written questions in addition to five minutes. I think that's reasonable, but it's either reasonable or not reasonable regardless of what the president chooses to do in his own capacity. Well, Mr. Nadler, I thank you very much. It, the chairman has made it clear that... Uh, uh, conditionally, we can send Mr. Starr questions. The uh, uh, the other uh, another member on the other side has made it clear that he doesn't want any questions and answers, whatever, in writing. And so I think the point has been made. I'd like to just go ahead and try to utilize my questions uh, and answers within the period of time that I have, uh, Mr. Starr. I'm concerned about the potential conflicts of interest between your public position seeking to impeach the president and your private positions representing numerous clients whose agendas are aligned directly against the president. Can you assure this committee that you will provide us for our information a complete list of the clients in your distinguished law firm or that uh, the law firm that you were a member of that that, uh, that you have represented since accepting the position of independent counsel yes thank you very much uh, i'm particularly interested of course in the uh, matters with the brown and williamson tobacco company general motors hughes aircraft united airlines bell atlantic and uh, a, a number of others, but thank you so much. I can go to a second question. Uh, the grand jury leaks. In reviewing your statements concerning this subject, uh, we have two reports. I can ask you about them now. You didn't mention them in, in, the, in your uh, reference to us. Your, uh, namely, uh, once in the Washington Times, you were quoted as having said, the release of any investigative information by a member of this office or any other law enforcement agency would constitute a serious breach of confidentiality. Uh, this summer, it, uh, uh, it became clear that your office had spoken to reporters on background, developed a different standard, telling Stephen Brill, quote, Nothing improper about leaking if you are talking about what witnesses tell FBI agents, end of quotation. Uh, this to me is quite important. Uh, is there a, a distinction or, or a compatibility with both those statements, sir? Yes, in this uh, sense, I'll be very, very brief. Uh, we have responded in detail to the article that you mentioned, and I would be happy to, to provide that to you. I think it's all laid out there. My position is this. We do not issue or release that kind of information. That is our position. Now, what does the law reach, the rule of 6E, is an issue that I'm sure we'll be discussing later today. 
Yes, uh, well, uh, under the five-minute rule, we may or may not discuss it. I mean, that's, that's the problem. Do, don't, doesn't your sense of fairness in the courts extend to congressional hearings where uh, you have 16 members uh, with five minutes to ask and be answered questions? Uh, is, isn't that, doesn't that strike you as somewhat constricting, somewhat limiting, somewhat uh, hard for us to take the advantage of your appearance before us as the witness of the day? Mr. Conyers, I do not want to speak to the rules of the House. Let me answer, may I answer 6C? Because I gather that my answers, which uh, do not count against your time quite in the same way, but I will, I will be guided by you. Well, let I, me... Let, let me ask you uh, about the travel gate in FBI files, which you did not mention the exoneration of the president in your reference. Why did you include any exculpatory information in your reference, and why didn't you put it in there instead of putting it uh, in your statement here? Uh, we put the statement here, you're right, we did not include that in the referral because of my views of what the referral was supposed to do. What I viewed this invitation as being was to try to, because I was invited, and pursuant to that invitation, we reflected on what is the information that you might need, because we have been told, uh, Mr. Conyers, by the Congress, you know, don't be holding things back. If you have information that could be relevant, provide it. And that's what we have, in fact, been trying to do. Now, if there is a sense that we're providing too much information, we'll be guided by that, because we're trying to be helpful. Well, I thank you very much for that response. Thank you. And finally, sir, uh, the failure to rule out pardon of uh, Susan McDougall, I is this a, a very strong or personally held uh, sentiment on your part? Uh, uh, we, we had President Bush pardon six defendants in uh, Iran-Contra, uh, and I was a little bit dismayed that, that you would deem fit to uh, blow out of proportion the fact that the President refused to comment on the possibility of pardoning uh, Ms. McDougall. Was, was, did I read more into that about your attitude about her than I ought to have? No, uh, Mr. Conyers, I think you read it fairly uh, and accurately, and, and, and you might very well have a different view that, that my view is quite wrong. But our view at the time was that the President did not help the situation of our trying to get to the truth as quickly as possible by his comments. But that's your judgment. We have brought that to your attention for you to assess. And if it's your judgment that that uh, is not an appropriate matter to consider or your judgment is different, obviously it's your judgment that controls and governs here. Well, I'm, I'm glad to know that that's the case, that I still have my judgment intact. Thank you very much. <laughs> the uh, gentleman's time has expired. I might say on the five-minute rule, those, that's pursuant to the rules of the House, and the Republicans get five minutes, just like the Democrats. So there is an, an equal burden. Uh, we have been extremely generous uh, in questioning, and I don't intend to shut anybody down. But I, I, I hope the seating arrangement suits you. Um, uh, uh, that's about all that hasn't been complained of today. <laughs> and uh, I just hope it's okay. We'll change it if you want it. Hassocks, Hassocks, very good. Uh, very good, I like that. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. McCullum. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And Judge Starr, I'm sure in light of that, uh, you should be fully aware that Chairman Hyde keeps the time. You answer the questions as fully as you want when we ask him. We'll get our bell rung, but don't worry about your bell. Thank now, you. Let me come on and ask you a couple of things just to follow up quickly. Uh, at any time, did you ever represent anybody in the Paula Jones sexual harassment case? No. Well, I shouldn't be so quick. I did not represent ever Ms. Jones or uh, even seriously contemplate anything other than a role with respect to the uh, constitutional immunity issue. Uh, but I believe, and I can check this, so, but I'll just give you my belief, 
that my firm did, in fact, represent the Independent Women's Forum. Right, but you never but personally represented anybody in the Paula Jones sexual uh, harassment litigation, per se. You not per just, se. This no, is the I immunity question. That's all I wanted to clarify. You, okay. you, you engaged us very fully on the immunity issue uh, during your complete testimony. Uh, I have another question that's related. I heard you describe this morning a, a compelling picture of President Clinton, a compelling picture of him acting in a cold, calculated, methodical, well thought out um, method, a scheme, if you will, to lie under oath, to commit perjury, if you will, with regard to uh, his involvement with Ms. Lewinsky before the Jones uh, case, in the Jones case of the deposition and before the grand jury, to convince uh, Monica Lewinsky and Betty Curry to also commit perjury, lie under oath in that Jones case, uh, to work to get him, others perhaps, but certainly in concert with him, to conceal and not produce uh, the gifts that you mentioned uh, in a subpoena situation in the Jones case where they were subpoenaed of Monica Lewinsky, and to try to get Monica Lewinsky a job. Uh, in at least, uh, it appears from circumstantial evidence you described in a compelling way, uh, in large measure because the president wanted to keep her from turning on him and to keep, him, keep her from, from going ahead and telling the truth at some point. Now that is a picture you painted. It was very compelling. Now, section, the, the latter part interests me. Section 201 of Title 18 of the United States Code is the bribery section of the code. And it reads in part, whoever directly or indirectly gives, offers, or promises anything of value to any person for or because of the testimony under oath or affirmation given or to be given by such person as a witness upon a trial, hearing, or other proceeding, etc. Couldn't a reasonable person, Judge Starr, listening to what you described, particularly with regard to the job offer, the circumstantial evidence the President uh, has of, of obstructing justice in that instance as you described it, couldn't a reasonable person, a reasonable member like me, conclude that there may, as well as being obstruction of justice here, may be a, an act of bribery the President committed in this case? Could I not conclude that as well? Well, Mr. McCollum, I would not want to uh, join in a particular judgment beyond that which we have set forth in the referral, uh, but you will obviously go through your analysis. I think uh, on the other side of the equation are the circumstances when the job search began and so forth. but. Uh, I have frankly not taken the specific issue you have identified, and it's a fair issue, through the kind of elements analysis that a lawyer and a prosecutor would need to do. So I think in fairness, I would say I would just want to examine that question more closely before opining on it. When you, when you actually testified this morning, all of that went through my mind. I pulled out the statute book. I've walked through it, and while you didn't allege it and you aren't here today, it seems pretty darn clear. And I think that's important because in the context of this picture you're painting of the president, you're painting perjury and bribery, as you've said, as of the same whole cloth. We're dealing with a similar pattern. We're dealing with an involvement that overall is very grave. <clears throat> and I'd like to conclude with a question that amplifies and gets you to clarify one other thing that Mr. Sensenbrenner asked you about regarding the issue of perjury itself. Uh, in this particular case, a number of our colleagues on this panel have suggested that because the Paula Jones case was uh, dismissed and ultimately settled, or because there was indeed uh, a throwing out uh, by the judge, uh, albeit appealed, of the underlying question of whether or not there was any relevance to the testimony of, about other uh, people being sexually harassed as being relevant to that case, that somehow, therefore, if the president lied in that case, uh, it's immaterial. Now, you started to say something about that. I don't think you really fully put the nail in, into this, and I'd like for you to tell us, in your judgment, based upon what you presented us today, were the elements of perjury present when the president uh, lied under oath, as you've described it, uh, in that Paula Jones case? And, and particularly, was materiality present? Materiality is not affected. It is a totally bogus argument to suggest that because the lawsuit is eventually settled or dismissed, that an act, let's call it perjury, we've said, you know, a false statement under oath. That's the way we've presented it to you. That is simply and utterly demonstrably wrong as a matter of law.
But that gentleman, is... The the gentleman's time has expired. But, but may I just clarify one thing, Mr. Chairman? Yes. The false statement under oath you presented and the way you described it with all the elements there, you've described all the elements of perjury, have you not, Judge Starr? Am I dis uh, you, you may have I'm distinguished not, it in the way you presented it, but aren't all the elements there you just described? I'm not quarreling with what you've just said. Thank you. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Frank. <laughs> Mr. Starr, um, Judge Johnson has found 24 instances of prima facie violation by your office of Rule 16. Now, that's not determinative of whether or not they happen. But I, so I'd like to ask you, um, are you aware of any member of your staff who, in fact, committed a violation as defined by Judge Johnson? Are you oh, aware in any of those 24 instances sure. whether or not a member of your staff, in fact, was guilty of what Judge Johnson has found to be a prima facie violation? We do not think that we have violated 6C uh, at all. No, specifically and on the 24 instances, are, are you, because you may differ with her in part about whether, how you define 6E, but as she defines 6E, are you aware of any member of your staff who committed the violation as she defined it? Well, I, it, with all respect, I think that is an unfair question, and the reason I do... All right, I'm, then I'll withdraw it. I, 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 Mr. Starr, I, you're the expert in unfair questions. If you tell me it's an unfair question, I'll withdraw it. So let me ask again. Did anybody on your staff, to your knowledge, do the things which Judge Johnson has included in her list of the 24? Understanding that you may think that if they did, then they weren't <coughs> violations. But did anybody and your staff give out that information on any of those 24 instances? There are a couple of issues <clears throat> or instances in which we issued a press release where we do have, you know, we clearly issued a press release with respect to certain matters. But may I say this? <clears throat> I am operating under a seal litigation proceeding and seal I, what, what, I, what I'm trying to suggest is I'm happy to answer as fully as I can, except well, Mr. with if respect... you're suggesting that you can't answer under the, this particular proceeding, it's sealed at your request to the extent that it's sealed at all, so you could waive it. That is, Judge Johnson granted a motion for an open procedure. You appealed this to the circuit court, and they closed it up. So if you didn't object, nobody else will. So, I mean, if you didn't do any of the leaking, why not just tell us uh, if, if it's wrong factually? And if, on the, on the other hand, you're going to say, well... You successfully got the circuit court to seal it. I suppose I can't do much, but I, I don't understand why you wouldn't just tell us. Let me make very briefly these points. We believe that we have completely complied with our obligations under, but that wasn't under, my question, un, under 6C. It wasn't my question, Mr. Chairman. I only have five minutes. My question was whether, as Judge Johnson set it forward, they did this. They can differ with her as to the law. I'm not debating the law here. I was trying to elicit a factual response. The second point that I was trying to make is that I am operating under a seal proceeding. Sealed at your request, correct? No, Mr. Frank. It is sealed by the chief judge based upon her determination of... But, Mr. Mr. Isn't it the case that she asked for... A, she granted a much more open proceeding and you appealed that and got the uh, circuit court to severely restrict the procedure on the grounds that hers was too open. Isn't that true? Congressman Frank, what she did was to provide for a procedure that didn't provide, quote, openness. It provided for an adversarial process, and this is all in the public domain. Right. But from this point forward, no, she is the custodian and the guide well, would with respect... Would you ask her to release that? Uh, I, mean, I, I think there's a severe, pub important public interest in dealing with this leak question. It goes to the credibility of a lot of what you've done. Would you then join, uh, maybe everybody would join, maybe the, the White House would join and others, in asking Judge Johnson to uh, relax that so we could get the answers publicly? Because I think there's a lot of public uh, interest, legitimate interest in this. I am happy to consider that, but I'm not going to make, if with, with right. all respect, a legal judgment right on the spot with respect to a proceeding. Right. Well, then let me, uh, that is I, I, you, you have a right not to. No, I just want a couple other questions. You say in page 9 of the referral that uh, uh, 595 says, suggests that you send us information based on a referral as soon as it becomes clear to you. Um, that's what bothers me about the FBI file and travel office issues. You say on page 47 of the testimony, our investigation, which has been thorough, found no evidence that anyone higher than Mr. Livingstone or Mr. Marcesta was involved. When did your investigation determine that? Well, under 595C, we... Me, that's a simple factual question, Mr. Starr. When did you determine that? Determine that... That nobody higher than Mr. Livingstone or Mr. Massessa was involved? We've determined that uh, some months ago. Okay. Well before the election. 
Uh, you also have, with regard to the travel office, a statement that the president's not involved. When did you determine, with regard to the travel office, that the president was not involved? We have factual, Mr. Starr. When? We. It is not a date certain. We have no information with respect to. I'll take a date ambiguous. <laughs> give me. Give me an. Give me an approximate. We have. First of all, there is an investigation that is continuing, and as of this date of reporting, we do not have okay. any information. Right, that let me the just President say this, and here's what involved. disturbs me greatly. You say on page nine that yes, you should send us this information. Before the election, you sent us a lot of information about the President that was to his discredit in some cases, and you found it very derogatory in, in other cases. You also had been studying for far longer than the Lewinsky case, the FBI and the travel office. You tell us that months ago, you concluded that no, that the president was not involved in the FBI files, and you've never had any evidence he was involved in the travel office, yet now, several weeks after the election, is the first time you're saying that. Why did you withhold that before the election, when you were sending us a referral with a lot of negative stuff about the president, and only now, despite your saying that the statute suggests you tell us as soon as possible, do you give us this exoneration of the president several weeks after the election. Mr. Frank, what we have tried to do is be responsive to Congress, which has said, provide us with information. Is there any other additional information that would be useful? Well, why don't you tell us before the election about this, according to your reading of the statute? Congressman Frank, the reason is because what we provided you in the referral is substantial and credible information of possible potential offenses. The silence with respect to anything else means necessarily that we had not concluded. In other words, don't have anything to say unless you have something bad to say. You've concluded in the FBI Chairman, files. Chairman, you said you Mr. concluded Chairman, in the FBI files Chairman, that there was nothing of involving the president. Why didn't you Chairman, tell us? Point of order. The, the gentleman's time has expired. However, uh, I would yield to the witness such time as you need to answer the many questions <laughs> Mr. Frank has uh, put to you. Well, Go ahead. Uh, Again, there is a process uh, question. The purpose of this referral was to provide you with what we had found substantial and credible information. That's point one. And the FBI files and the travel uh, office matter were not relevant to, to the 595C substantial and credible information in terms of providing this to you. For you then to determine, do you want any additional information? The final point I would say is, we still have an investigation, as I indicated, underway. And with respect to both FBI files, we have indicated that, and, and the travel office, I've drawn a distinction between the two matters, but I'm reporting to you so you know that as of this time, we do not believe that there is any information in either of those uh, matters, Congressman Frank, that would be relevant to you. The gentleman from uh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Geekus. I thank the chair. Uh, isn't it true, uh, Judge Starr, that you did release before the election, months before the election, what amounts to the exoneration of the president with respect to the Vince Foster matter? Is that correct? Yes. Months before the election. And may I ask you this? In what form did you exonerate the president? What, what formal step did you take in the Vince Foster matter to end that case? Do you report back to the Attorney General? In that particular instance, uh, we issued a report, we filed it with the Special Division, and then made the report public so that it could address what we saw as these lingering questions with respect to the cause of death. It was a suicide by Mr. Foster. And we, you, you felt comfortable in exonerating the President? Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Conyers, in his, my friend John from uh, Michigan, uh, went through a litany of tremendous clients that your law firm represents. In fact, uh, when I finish my tour in Congress, I'd like to talk with you. If I could. <laughs> uh, but may I ask you this? Was your law firm, uh, were you a part of that law firm that represented these clients when you exonerated the, the president in the Vince Foster matter? Yes. Were these... Uh, these uh, clients still on the books of your firm when you came to the conclusion that there was no, no connection in the file gate matter to the president? Yes. Was your law firm and you involved in these tremendous clients that were mentioned at the time that you made a decision that there's probably no connection in travel gate directly to the president? Yes. 
I thought you'd answer that. <laughs> Uh, I am disturbed about something, though, that I found right from the first moment that I reviewed the, um, your referral, and that was the emphasis you put on with respect to the, what you would characterize as the misuse of executive privilege yes. by the president. On page 204 of, your, of this, this version of the referral, uh, you, you make a, 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 a separate allegation that uh, the president's actions were inconsistent with his con constitutional duty to fa faithfully execute the laws, and you put in there that he did so, did fail in that regard, because he continuously used executive privilege. The first thing that I thought was, and I have not been disabused of it since then, is that the mere assertion by the president of a right like that, even if he uh, objectively could be said knew what the result would be ultimately by the Supreme Court or appellate courts, I do not find that automatically or prima facie or even now at this latter stage of the proceedings to be something that, uh, that the president should, should be uh, uh, debited on, on this case. Um, but then my mind was settled a little bit when you said in your testimony that even apart from the matters concerning executive privilege and the like, you did feel very strongly about the questions of perjury. And just like many of us, it is going to be very difficult for us to set aside that deep emotional feeling that we have about the construct of law enforcement and the judicial system in our country. I can set aside any abuses of power if they are called that, with respect to the assertion of executive privilege, and I, I ask you now, didn't you sort of prioritize in that regard when you said setting apart the questions of executive privilege, you too feel strongly about perjury as an element in your referral? Yes, uh, Congressman, I would say uh, these things. One, uh, we believe the uh, Issues with, re with respect to false statements under oath and the like are very serious and the facts are there for you to evaluate and you are evaluating those. With respect to the abuse of power, it is a judgment call and you have come to at least your tentative judgment and obviously, as I said to Congressman Conyers, it is now y your prerogative to come to your own considered judgment as to what is right and not. May I say very briefly on executive privilege, I do think that it is an abuse of a very important constitutional principle. For such a special principle, executive privilege, which I strongly believe in, and I defend the concept of executive privilege, to be invoked with respect to the non-official activities of the President of the United States, I think it's improper. But it is your judgment that controls and not mine. Uh, but, uh, with one, uh, I ask you now for 30 seconds. Without objection, much. Without much objection. <laughs> but can we not come to the conclusion in evaluating the executive privilege asserted by the president that he might have felt on any one of them where he exerted it that, that to give him the extreme benefit of the doubt that he felt that the, that the office of the presidency had to be protected even in mundane or other matters which you find could be a, a misuse of power. I'm sure that is the, the view uh, of the president, and we came to a different view, but as I say, it's now your judgment. I yield back the balance of my non-time. Yes, I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair will uh, declare a very short recess till five minutes after four to give everyone a little stretch. And if you will please wait and let Mr. Starr, let Judge Starr leave the room first. And then we'll be back at five after four. So the Judiciary Committee remains in recess. Uh, they have asked everyone in the gallery, uh, as he is surrounded by security today, to let uh, uh, Ken Starr leave first, as he is doing through the members' entrance of the room. Uh, we have just seen the uh, first uh, part of the um, active questioning of Ken Starr. We've had a little change uh, in the agenda here. It was uh, decided and announced on the fly without uh, 
uh, much notice, and that is that Mr. Shippers, the uh, counsel for the majority, the Republicans' lawyer, in other words, on the Judiciary Committee, was supposed to start off the questioning. That didn't happen. Uh, we have not seen or heard uh, from Mr. Shippers yet. Uh, the questioning was started off by the Democrats' lawyer, minority counsel, Abby Lowell. Not only did he start off, he got over double what he was supposed to get. He had uh, an hour or so to question Ken Starr. Uh, we have for you now one of the more contentious uh, points of that questioning. Actually, what we're going to do is take a short break, and uh, we'll come back uh, as the uh, committee takes a break right after this. He's been the one asking the tough questions. Now it's his turn to be questioned. Witness Ken Starr's testimony on the impeachment hearings all day today on MSNBC, on cable and the Internet. There are times when you can't afford to miss a message. When you get Skyward Plus from Skytel, you get the message every time, guaranteed. Sometimes the best way to say something is to simply show it with a color photo. Canon Color Scanners. Just click, scan, add your personal photos to anything, and print in beautiful color. It's easy. Starting around $79, the CanoScan flatbed color scanners, only from Canon. Mortgage interest rates have been slashed to some of their lowest levels ever. The time to refinance is right now. Just call Vitek Funding at 1-800-71-FIXED. Today's low 30-year fixed rate is just 6 and 3 quarters percent, APR 6.841 percent. There are no points, no deposits, and rates will never go down to zero. So what are you waiting for? It's smart financing from Ditech Funding. Refinance now to a low 30-year fixed rate of just six and three quarters percent with zero points. Call 1-800-71-FIX. Send your customers two-day packages with FedEx and we'll deliver, even on Saturdays, for an extra ten dollars. Send your customers two to three-day packages with priority mail and we'll deliver, even on Saturdays, at no extra charge. Send your customers two-day packages with UPS and we'll deliver. But not on Saturdays. Sorry. So, what's your priority? Long live Rome and on to victory. There are times when you can't afford to miss a message. Brutus! When you get Skyward Plus from Skytel, you get the message every time, guaranteed. And welcome back. Uh, the uh, House of Representatives Judiciary Committee is in a break right now, a much-needed recess, a uh, break between questioning periods. It's now up to the members themselves of the House Judiciary Committee, most of them remaining pretty close to the five-minute limit asked by the chair, most of them also asking for at least short extensions on their allotted time. As advertised and as mentioned before the break, we have uh, for you some of the back and forth between Abby Law the Democrats' lawyer on the panel, and Ken Starr. Here's how it went. The manner in which you decided to write the referral as one with attitude, your contacts between you, your law firm, and Paula Jones' attorneys, the questions that have been raised about whether or not you got into this case with proper jurisdiction, the way you dealt with Monica Lewinsky and the evidence that came from that, Judge Johnson's orders, which some others will talk to you about, about whether your office has been responsible for leaks, and the contradictions in the evidence between your referral and the statements you agree are in the evidence. Doesn't that undermine the substantiality and credibility of the evidence on something as weighty as impeaching a president of the United States? Mr. Lowell, nothing that you have said, and with all respect, what you have done is go into characterizations as opposed to deal with facts. 
Uh, that was uh, uh, Ken Starr responding to Abby Lowell. Uh, he uh, got, uh, most uh, commentators will agree, uh, mildly defensive at times, but uh, in uh, his defense, he was under uh, a fairly vigorous uh, attack by uh, Abby Lowell, the Democrats' attorney on the panel. Uh, the liberal firebrand, he could be called, on the committee, uh, Massachusetts Congressman Barney Frank, followed Mr. Lowell in his questioning of Ken Starr. You say on page 47 of the testimony, our investigation, which has been thorough, found no evidence that anyone higher than Mr. Livingstone or Mr. Marcesta was involved. When did your investigation determine that? Well, under 595C, we... Me, that's a simple factual question, Mr. Starr. When did you determine that? Determine that... That nobody higher than Mr. Livingstone or Mr. Marcesta was involved? We've determined that uh, some months ago. Okay. Well before the election. Uh, you also have, with regard to the travel office, a statement that the president's not involved. When did you determine, with regard to the travel office, that the president was not involved? We have... Factual, Mr. Starr. When? We... It is not a date certain. We have no information with respect to... I'll take a date ambiguous. <laughs> give me... Give me an... Give me an approximate. We have... First of all, there is an investigation that is continuing. And as of this date of reporting, we do not have okay. any information. Right, that let me the just President say this, and here's involved. what disturbs me greatly. You say on page nine that yes, you should send us this information. Before the election, you sent us a lot of information about the President that was to his discredit in some cases, and you found it very derogatory in, in other cases. You also had been studying for far longer than the Lewinsky case, the FBI and the travel office. You tell us that months ago, you concluded that no, that the president was not involved in the FBI files, and you've never had any evidence he was involved in the travel office, yet now, several weeks after the election, is the first time you're saying that. Why did you withhold that before the election, when you were sending us a referral with a lot of negative stuff about the president, and only now, despite your saying that the statute suggests you tell us as soon as possible, you give us this exoneration of the president several weeks after the election. Barney Frank asking uh, what was more a, a rhetorical question. Uh, the, one of the bits of news from this day is that uh, Ken Starr has said there's no other area he wants to go into, uh, Whitewater, Travelgate, Filegate. Uh, Ken Starr will continue probably for several hours. Some stations will return to regular programming now. Uh, coverage will continue on others of these NBC television stations. And all day long, gavel to gavel, live on MSNBC on cable. We'll have updates on the impeachment hearing throughout the day on this NBC station. And tonight, a complete summary on NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw, originating tonight from here in Washington. As we take a look uh, at the hearing room, uh, now live. NBC News correspondent uh, Chip Reed has been uh, on and off today uh, inside the hearing room uh, watching this. And uh, uh, one of the dynamics we've seen here now is it's no longer a totally friendly audience for Ken Starr. It's one thing to read a pre-prepared statement. It's quite another to take hostile fire from Democrats. Chip? It sure is, Brian. As you said, though, uh, with five minutes, Barney Frank had l time for little more than a long rhetorical question and a few quick answers from Ken Starr. John Conyers found the same thing out. He complained vigorously about this five-minute limit. It is a tradition. It has been lifted from time to time in Senate, he in Senate and House hearings. Uh, they are sticking to it today, though, five minutes apiece. Democrats are very frustrated. It allows for little more than a, a couple of pot shots, basically. Uh, and, of course, the members do most of the talking. John Conyers talked about how, well, it looks like the Republicans don't want a full airing here. Uh, Barney Frank got a little more out of it than that. Uh, but I was saying earlier that they all really wanted to get a piece of Ken Starr, but with only five minutes a piece to do it, they're not going to get very big pieces. Uh, Chip, how big is the White House presence? We just saw Attorney uh, Greg Craig uh, up near the front row. It appears the Charles Ruff, the White House counsel, and... Mr. Kendall, the president's private attorney, are there. Are there any other recognizable White House aides? Yes, there's also Lanny Brewer and one or two others. There are also one of Kendall's deputies here from his law firm. So there's about uh, a team of about six or seven uh, lawyers from the White House or from the private law firm in all. And there was one point where Abby Lowell was uh, striking some punches, nothing devastating, but he, but he was getting in some jabs against Ken Starr on the question of... Uh, Paula Jones and the fact that Ken Starr had some 
uh, peripheral, mostly indirect, uh, some connections to the Paula Jones legal team before he, as independent counsel, ever took jurisdiction in this matter. Uh, and there were some other matters, uh, for example, confronting Monica Lewinsky for that first time, not allowing her to talk to her lawyer, where I saw David Kendall and Chuck Ruff kind of shaking their heads and talking to each other in kind of a can you believe this kind of way. And it will be very interested to, interesting to see if that is where David Kendall picks up, particularly on that issue of Monica Lewinsky not being able to consult a lawyer. They seemed particularly disturbed uh, about that. Of course, I'm reading tea leaves. Uh, I couldn't hear what they were saying. Uh, but judging from the shaking of heads and the smiles from them, they seemed uh, disturbed by it. Uh, Chip, can you help us out on timing at all? Is the committee prepared to go into the evening? Uh, this is running long, 4.03 p.m. here on the East Coast. It could run a lot longer. And is anyone talking about a session tomorrow? They have already said they're leaving open the possibility of tomorrow, and that is actually our outlet here. That at least can be their excuse for not going into the wee hours of the night and the morning. Uh, it's looking now like a distinct possibility that that could happen, and maybe because they do have that outlet tomorrow, they won't go too late tonight, but it is a very perilous activity to try to predict what this committee is going to do. And about Mr. Shippers, the lawyer uh, hired uh, by Henry Hyde, brought in to represent the majority on this committee, the lawyer who took a pass on his official question period, allowing Abby Lowell, there he is on the right, allowing Abby Roll to, Lowell to start the questioning. Uh, do we know whether or not Mr. Shippers is taking a pass permanently? Will he be back, or is he uh, going to make the decision on the fly? We don't know yet, but I suspect he's leaving it in reserve just in case they need it, in case there's a point that they need to respond to or allow Mr. Starr to respond to uh, with his help in some direct questioning, helping lead him along. Uh, but I don't think people were very surprised that he passed because Ken Starr had made his points uh, in his statement, and Mr. Shippers would, for the most part, have uh, only been able to uh, help him repeat some of the things with added emphasis that he had already said. So it may be that they are waiting to see if the Dem Democrats do any damage to Mr. Starr uh, and then give Shippers the uh, opportunity to try to resuscitate him afterward. And Chip, perhaps you can explain how the question process works. Is there a, a Democratic Party and Republican Party team meeting where there is a list of topics, subject matters, and let's say Mr. Lowell was unable to get to uh, any more than 40 percent of what he wanted. Do other members then come in knowing what the, uh, uh, the team message is and fill in? They do, in theory. They do work out ahead of time to a large degree who's going to do what. But if one member says, I want to ask such and such questions because those are the ones I care about, uh, they're not going to crack the whip over them and say, no, you absolutely may not do that. So they try to coordinate. They certainly don't want to waste their time by having everybody ask the same questions. Uh, but on the other hand, once you get into it and once the key questions have been asked at the beginning, it will get a bit freewheeling by the end. Henry Hyde has taken his uh, seat at the uh, head of the committee. You may have noticed as he walked into the room, he passed Congresswoman Mary Bono. There she is on the phone. She made a bit of news this morning, a story being carried by some papers in California and on the wire services, that she is now convinced it was drug use that took her husband's life. Uh, Congressman Sonny Bono, in, in effect, led to his skiing accident. Um, she uh, is quoted in this story as uh, being uh, absolutely absolutely convinced of that, saying he took a dozen to 15 different uh, types of pills a day, citing uh, painkillers and others. So uh, Mary Bono, who has been relatively silent on the subject, now a congresswoman in her own right, and now clearly in the middle of an important phone call, uh, making news on the passing of her husband, Congressman Sonny Bono. We have the chairman back in the room where the Judiciary Committee meets. We have most of uh, the star staff uh, still out of the room, and uh, we are looking at staff and members of Congress uh, converse. Uh, Chip Reed, while we still have you, just uh, the morning session was, well, the, the news was really made by the contentious uh, uh, Democrats. Uh, how rare is it to interrupt um, a speaker, a witness like Kenneth Starr. He was rolling along reading his prepared statement and several points of order were raised by the Democrats. Uh, not all that rare to tell you the truth. There's a lot of chaos, especially when there are politically charged hearings like these. 
Uh, I remember years ago with uh, hearings of Reagan administration officials under investigation uh, and Bush administration officials. Uh, it's not unusual at all uh, for their defenders to, to uh, cut in or for their critics to cut in. Uh, in this one, it, did, it was a bit jarring because Starr was moving along uh, at a very, very slow and leisurely pace, and it felt smooth and uh, easy. Things were just rowing along gently, and she chimed in there, and it did kind of shock the room for a moment. But to tell you the truth, it's not that unusual. Uh, flanked by his uh, security detail, uh, which seems to have grown larger today than custom. Yes, it has. Custom. Uh, Ken Starr has just walked back into the room and is pouring himself some water. This will be a signal to other members that uh, uh, Henry Hyde is about to gavel things uh, back into order and the, and the questioning will begin again. Uh, Chip, he normally has um, security, but this uh, seems extraordinary today. They have stepped it up, no doubt about it. He had a police escort coming up here today, and he has about four or five large and burly guys walk him out of the hearing room, and they do not let us get up from our seats until he has left the room each time he does have to leave. They are taking security very seriously. In fact, I was supposed to talk at 9.30 on camera this morning. We couldn't get out here. None of us could. They closed it off because the bomb-sniffing dogs were out here. Chief Breed outside on the hill. He'll make his way inside. Let's listen to Henry Hyde. Congressional committees have the same situation. We have to give a two-minute warning to the network television, and so that's why we seem to be suspended up here doing nothing. We're waiting for the appropriate time. Uh, the chair would like to announce we're going to finish this evening. Uh, some of you may be wondering how long we're going to go. I have no idea. But uh, rather than come back tomorrow, we're going to do the um, we're going to do the uh, uh, the job today. So I plead with my fellow members: if you have to ask a question, I hope it's a burning issue with you and not something just of idle curiosity. And I'm looking at you, Mr. Delahunt. <laughs> well, I'm not idly curious. Are we going to take a supper break? No, we won't take a supper break. We'll go straight through. We'll keep the jury locked up without uh, food and water, right? Prince was sequestered, I take it. That's right. You may send out for pizza. For everybody. There will be a meeting, there will be a meeting after uh, Judge Starr has com completed his testimony. Uh, we will then have another, we will have a full meeting of the committee to do some business on subpoenas. So uh, just be advised. And now... Will a police officer accompany us? <laughs> I, uh, if, if you're walking around the mall, I would want two police officers. Uh, it is now a, a cons well, a mixed pleasure to uh, ask uh, the senator-elect from the great state of New York and one of our very valuable members, whom we will miss, uh, Charles Schumer, uh, to interrogate, uh, question our witness. Mr. Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For five Chairman. minutes. And I will miss you in this committee. Not so much today, but for many of the other things <laughs> that we have done together. Um, today, uh, Mr. Starr, today after nearly five years of investigation, we conduct today's impeachment hearing, having just received boxes of new documents from your office concerning Webster Hubble, and have just learned from the chairman that we will be voting on deposing new witnesses involving the Kathleen Willey matter. And Mr. Chairman, I would say this to all of us on this committee, uh, maybe we should hang a sign outside the Judiciary Committee that says, out to lunch, gone fishing. We were out to lunch because we're so far afield of what the American people want us to do. We've gone fishing because despite a five-year fishing expedition, which has yielded nothing more than allegations revolving around a tawdry sex scandal, this committee is still trying to bait the hook. What has disturbed me about the twists and turns of this investigation and these proceedings is that instead of seeking justice, too many are intent on winning the war. So when there's not enough evidence for impeachment, you bring in John Wang's name or Kathleen Willey to prop up the case. And I say to my Republican colleagues that the irony is that the harder you try to win the war, the more you lose the hearts and minds of the American people. Now, for Mr. Starr, the OIC has basically made three allegations against the president, three types of allegations, perjury, obstruction of justice, and abuse of power all stemming from the president's admitted improper relationship with Monica Lewinsky. 
To me, as I have said and you have stated in your report, it's clear that the President lied when he testified before the grand jury. Not to cover a crime, but to cover embarrassing personal behavior. And as I have said before, the President's actions deserve to be punished. Not as a political denouement, but because what the President has done is a serious matter that cannot go unanswered. However, it is clear to me that if this case, as it seems to be, and as it seems clear to me, is only about sex and lying about sex, that it will never be in found impeachable by Congress, nor should it be. As I interpret the Constitution in the Federalist Papers, an interpretation that is diametrically opposed to yours, Mr. Starr, it's obvious that this does not reach the standard of high crimes and misdemeanors as set forth in the Constitution. The innate and sound wisdom of the American people that lying about an extramarital affair should not lead to the removal of a duly elected president from office is far more in keeping with the founding fathers' visions of impeachment than your legalistic arguments, Mr. Starr. So thus, if it, se it seems to me that if the charges of abuse of power and obstruction of justice lack compelling evidence, then the vast majority of Americans and a strong majority in this House will not vote for impeachment. So I'd like to ask you a few questions on the obstruction charge, charges. I am not asking you about abuse of power because that has already been rejected as out of hand by even the President's harshest critics in the Republican Party. And I'm going to ask you three sets of short questions for you to answer together. And I will, that will be the end of my questioning, so you'll have the rest of the time to answer. First. On August 20th, 1998, Ms. Lewinsky testified that, quote, no one ever asked me to lie and I was never promised a job for my silence, unquote. That was in response to a question by a grand juror. Let me ask you again, because I know Mr. Lowell asked this, but I didn't find the answer adequate. <clears throat> Why wasn't this statement directly included in your 455-page referral to Congress, not in a footnote and not paraphrased, isn't that relevant, trenchantly relevant information about what we're doing? And if you are so dispassionate about simply producing the facts, why wouldn't you have included the statement verbatim and in quotes, particularly on a matter as important as impeachment? Second, regarding the Lewinsky job search, if the president and his staff began to find Monica Lewinsky a job sometime after December 5th, 1997, the date she first appeared on the witness list, that might lead one to your conclusion that there was an attempt to influence her testimony. But since the job search began more than 18 months prior, doesn't that cast into serious doubt and obstruction argument? You are assuming that once the White House knew of the deposition of Lewinsky, their, to their reason for getting her a job totally changed when it seems at least as logical that the reasons remain the same, mainly that they wanted to get her away from the White House for the obvious re same reason that they did before they knew of any deposition. And again, shouldn't we set an impeachment bar high enough so that a 50-50 proposition like this does not set off a constitutional crisis? And third, and finally, on January the 18th, the president had the conversation with Betty Curry. Isn't it true that on that date, she was not listed as a deposition or a trial witness in the Jones case or any other case? For obstruction or subornation, the president would have to know that she was to be called as a witness. There's a other logical reason that he didn't want Betty Curry to talk about this. He may not have wanted the press to know. He may not have wanted his family to know. Can you wind and up, yes, Mr. Schumer? My list. And again, given the weighty matter of impeachment, shouldn't the be, there be more evidence than just your surmise that the president knew that Curry would be called as a witness? Your, your, your answers, uh, Mr. Uh, Starr. Uh, Senator-elect and Congressman uh, Schumer, uh, uh, question one. We did supply the information. The reason that you're having, of course, these, uh, these questions with respect to the referral is because we produced everything that was relevant to your assessment of Ms. Lewinsky. And I stand by what we said in page 174 of the referral. I think it's fair 
in light of our assessment, but your assessment, of course, may very well be different with respect to that but one I asked item. why you didn't put it in the report, in full, fully quoted. Because because we do not think that that is consistent with the truth, and it would be misleading to say, in our judgment, and I understand you may disagree with this, but we specifically said at page 174, not in a footnote, Ms. Lewinsky has stated that the President never explicitly told her to lie. If one finds that inadequate, then one finds it inadequate. It is your judgment, but we were holding nothing back the referral contains the information. You have also the grand jury transcripts. I'll be very brief. With respect to the December 5, 1997 matter, and again, this is an assessment of facts. Our professional assessment of the facts included such significant things as a great stepping up of the efforts to get her a job, especially once the witness list issued. And the referral speaks to that in fairly elaborate detail and how Mr. Jordan became very active uh, in that effort. Again, it's our assessment of the facts. There would uh, be a reasonable, reasonable assessment the other way, I presume. Well, I've come to my assessment based upon my colleagues who are professional prosecutors' uh, assessment of the facts. It's beyond a reasonable doubt? Oh, no, th that's by no means is that our standard, uh, because Thank as, you. As, as you quite rightly uh, note, the question is substantial and credible. And with respect to, uh, to, to Betty Curry, uh, I would simply uh, guide uh, the Congress again, the House again, to the substance of the President's testimony and how uh, she was injected into the matter by the President in his testimony. And we think that does have significant... With all due respect, sir, that doesn't answer my question, which Sorry. was not how she was injected the, or the, what the substance was. Please, Mr. Chairman, just well, this is, he didn't answer my question directly, but how did you come to realize that the President knew that she would be called as a witness when there was no mention of it at that time? Is this just surmise or do you have any factual evidence that the President knew that she would be called as a witness? We understand he wanted her not to tell the truth, but we don't know to whom. Where's your evidence? The evidence is not that she was on a witness list. You're quite right. She was not on a witness list and we've never said that she was. What we did say is that the transcript of the president, uh, President's January uh, 17 deposition shows that he was injecting Betty Curry into the matter and saying, may I finish? Sure. And saying specifically, you will have to ask Betty. That raises... But nothing to do with the legal proceedings, sir. And that's the heart of subornation. All right. The, the gentleman's time has finally expired. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Coble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Starr, you have become the bullseye of the target upon which several aspiring political gunslingers have fired. <laughs> A recent AP story quoted a Democrat member of this Congress saying, the House Judiciary Committee Republicans are looking for a way to wiggle out of this mess. Now, let me get this straight. President Clinton was involved in an illicit sexual affair, strike that, illicit sexual affairs in the White House with a young White House intern of tender years. President Clinton subsequently assured all America that he did not have an improper relationship with that woman. President Clinton, continuing his denial, spoke untruthfully in a deposition or interrogatory and before a federal grand jury, causing perjury to rear its ugly head. And for all this, you are the bullseye of the target and the House Republicans are trying to wiggle away out of the mess. I obviously missed class that day because <laughs> as I review my material and notes, common sense and reality are conspicuously absent. Judge Starr, if one half of the unfavorable comments leveled at you are true, you probably should be keel-hauled. <laughs> I'm inclined to dismiss most of them and as evidenced by your demeanor today. I think most of that trashing was probably just that, trashing. Now, I'll admit I'm not happy with the cost of this investigation, but some of that must be attributed to the president's uh, delaying and deceptive and evasive tactics. Let me go to, to page 21, Judge Starr. That's sort of what you were referring to earlier, where it says the 
uh, facts suggest that the president was attempting to improperly coach Ms. Curry at a time when she was not a potential witness. Should, shouldn't the word not be deleted there? Y y uh, yes, thank you, uh, and Congressman. And in fact, I think the corrected version, which should have come up this morning, well, should make it clear I, I, that she well, was a potential witness. And, we now reach that she was a potential witness. Yes, and, 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 and I must say, because you've been kind enough to raise that, I would just say in response uh, to issues about potential witnesses, that federal law is clear that these prohibitions against importuning and coaching a witness do indeed go to a potential witness. And I think the word not does appear in many of these of our scripts. I Judge, apologize for that. Judge Starr, what evidence did you find to support your conclusion that President Clinton's action involved public misconduct as opposed to private misconduct, A, and B, what evidence, if any, is there that President Clinton breached the public trust? Well, Congressman, I'll be uh, as brief as I can. In terms of the public uh, nature of the conduct, it seemed to me, as I sought to set out both in the referral and this morning, that the key is this was no longer, and I respectfully disagree, but it's not my judgment that governs here. I respectfully disagree with the suggestion that this is, quote, lying about a private sexual relationship. Rather, this is the integrity of the judicial process. These are courts we're now talking about. These are judges, and a district judge is sitting and presiding, and that is, it seems to me, what made that dimension of it very public. But the other aspect, which we do enumerate, in counts or grounds 10 and 11 of which are before you, is that in a variety of ways, the president used the powers and influence of the presidency to carry out this continued effort to deny and to delay, including, I believe, and this goes back to an earlier comment, when one looks at the pattern of activity that we summarize in grounds uh, 10 and 11, one will see a course of conduct that I believe does, in fact, go to your point, uh, 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 both of your points. Chairman Hyde, it can be done in five minutes, but the red light has not yet illuminated, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman, the distinguished gentleman from uh, Los Angeles, Mr. Berman. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've. Uh, I've read the referral, and I've uh, listened to the testimony uh, with one possible exception. Uh, Judge Starr has answered the 595C other matter issues that I had concerns about, and I'd like to reserve the balance of my time at this point. I'm sorry. I would like to reserve the balance of my You certainly may. Uh, well, you say he can't, but I'm going to let him do it. <laughs> Mr. He, he's, he's a good man. We'll let him do it. <laughs> but I have a short memory. Um, <laughs> the gentleman from Texas, Lamar Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Judge Starr, your friends know you to be a dedicated husband and father and an individual of impeccable integrity. And on the professional level, you have served with distinction as a U.S. Circuit Court Judge, as Solicitor General of the United States, and as an advisor to the uh, Senate Ethics Committee. Uh, those qualities of personal integrity and uh, professional uh, respectability haven't changed, but the rules of engagement have. As a practicing attorney, you are accustomed to legal procedures that put you on an equal footing with the other side. But as independent counsel, you were prohibited from commenting publicly on the details of the case, even as you were unfairly savaged on a daily basis. So I understand why you welcome the opportunity today to testify and to respond to your, our questions as you have done so well. <coughs> Judge Starr, during your investigation, the President claimed executive privilege to withhold information from you and prevent witnesses from testifying. While his claims were ultimately overruled by the courts, they did cause long-term delays and, in fact, as you said, obstructed your investigation. Executive privilege only allows the President to protect national security secrets. It cannot be used to interfere with a criminal investigation. 
Since President Clinton and his lawyers knew the law, they also knew that their claims of executive privilege were not legal. President Clinton's claims were thrown out by the courts, but not before they delayed your investigation by many months and perhaps over a year. Meanwhile, the White House complained that your investigation was taking too long. In short, the president took executive privilege, which is supposed to safeguard our country's national security, and misused it uh, to obstruct the investigation. As you said in your opening statement, this is arguably an abuse of power. Uh, Judge Starr, my first question is this. In your referral, you said that the president had a pattern of invoking and then withdrawing executive privilege to delay your investigation. Could you give us examples of this? Yes. The president would, in fact, uh, through his uh, attorneys, uh, invoke executive privilege with respect to one or more witnesses. And when we would take the issue to litigation, I will be very specific. The president invoked, or the witness, I should say, but had to do it at the direction of the president, uh, namely Nancy Hernreich. Nancy Hernreich does not carry on, a, and by her own admission, a policy role at the White House. She does have an important function at the White House. She manages the Oval uh, Office operations. That's a very important function. But that is not the kind of function that the principle of executive privilege was meant to protect. When we then, shall I say, called the lawyers on that, then it was withdrawn. That has happened to us before. It happened to us in the Arkansas phase of the litigation as well. Moreover, as we point out, the president told the grand jury on August 17 that he had no interest in this save in, and I'm roughly paraphrasing here, having the matter litigated. So it was as if it was to preserve the presidency and presidential prerogative. The history, when one then analyzes the facts, does not support that conclusion. Okay, thank you, Judge Torn. Another question. Uh, President Clinton told the American people several times that he supported the public release of the court documents he used to claim executive privilege. Uh, is that accurate? Uh, th the answer is uh, partially... Uh, I, I would want to review the facts because I want to be fair, but there was, in fact, not, shall I say, a ready willingness to allow, for example, public access to the executive privilege hearings and so forth. So uh, I, I don't want to be condemnatory, but I would say that the president did not show a strong interest in having this re re released uh, quickly. Uh, Judge Starr, a few minutes ago, counsel for the uh, uh, committee read an excerpt from a book written by Leon Jaworski. Let me read some other words that Leon Jaworski wrote in a book called The Right and the Power, which was about his experience uh, as a special prosecutor during the Nixman, Nixon impeachment proceedings. Quote, no government office, not even the highest office in the land, carries with it the right to ignore the law's command any more than the orders of a superior can be used by government officers to justify illegal behavior. There was evidence that the president conspired with others to violate 18 United States Code, page 1623, perjury, which included the president's direct and personal efforts to encourage and facilitate the giving of misleading and false testimony by aides. For the number one law enforcement officer of the country, it was, in my opinion, as demeaning an act as could be imagined." End quote. Do you think that passage from Leon Jaworski's book has application to the case at hand? I do. My own view is Colonel Jaworski, were he here, would say, it is your judgment, but these matters are serious and clearly deserve to be analyzed in terms of the importance to our system of truthfulness and taking the oath uh, of office seriously and the oath of a witness seriously. And yes, I do think that, uh, okay. that, that Mr. Jaworski, were he alive today, would say, if lying to the American people is grounds for impeachment, as he thought it was, I believe, he would say lying under oath is as well. But again, <laughs> it's your judgment. Okay. Thank you, Judge Starr. Thank Gentlemen's you, Mr. Chairman. time has expired. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Boucher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Starr, while you were not a, a witness to the facts which are uh, at the base of your investigation and also your September referral to the House, I note that uh, for a number of years you served as the Solicitor General of the United States and in that capacity represented the United States government in a variety of cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. I know a number of those cases during that period involved constitutional issues. 
So in my opinion, that experience well qualifies you to answer questions on some of the broad matters of constitutional dimension that it will now be the responsibility of this committee to consider. Since your referral was received by the House in September, there's been a, a great deal of discussion about the importance of the rule of law and about the importance of the principle that no individual, including the President of the United States, should be above the law. It's also been suggested by some that the rule of law is only observed and that principle only honored. Uh, if it is found that uh, the President has committed a criminal offense while in office, he must then be impeached and removed from office. But my readings on the Constitution suggest that impeachment was never intended to be a punishment for individual misconduct. Instead, it was intended to protect the country. It was designed to advance the public interest and to remove a chief executive whose conduct was so severe that it fundamentally impairs the functioning of his presidential office. Punishment for the individual can occur in the normal course and through the normal functioning of the criminal justice process. So I have three questions for you. I'll pose these and then you'll have the balance of the time in which to provide your answer. First, uh, Mr. Starr, do you believe that the president would be vulnerable to the criminal law process for whatever crimes, if any, he may have committed while in office after he leaves the office? Would he be subject to the criminal law process after he leaves the office? Assuming that the statute of limitations for that particular conduct has not expired at the time that an indictment is brought. And in answering that question, I would refer you to the provisions of Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution, which states as follows. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. And I would uh, assume from that language that there would be no doubt that the president... Uh, uh, would be subjected to the normal criminal justice process once he leaves office, and I would appreciate uh, your concurrence or, or, if you choose, difference with that conclusion. Secondly, am I correct in assuming that the federal criminal statute of limitations for the perjury and the other offenses that are stated in your <coughs> September referral uh, is five years, and uh, therefore that the statute will not have expired by the time uh, this president leaves office in the year 2001. And third, if you agree that the president could be subjected to the regular process of the criminal law upon his normal departure from office in 2001, just as any other person could be subjected to that process, would you not also agree that in subjecting the president to the criminal law process, the rule of law itself would be well served? And that would also well serve the principle that no person, including the president, is above the law. So there are three questions that I have for you. First, is a president subject to criminal prosecution when he leaves office for offenses committed while in the office? Secondly, would there be sufficient time within the statute of limitations for prosecution of the perjury and other offenses suggested in your referral of September after the president leaves office? And third, uh, does not that process well serve as a complete assurance that the rule of law will be fully observed. Your answers, please. As to question one, I agree with your reading. Uh, I think the plain language uh, suggests uh, exactly that, that the framers did intend for there to be separate uh, proceedings. Uh, and I also agree with your comment, if I could just uh, add this, that it was not intended to be a sanction in the sense of the criminal law serving the deterrent purposes and the like that the criminal law at its best is designed to serve. I also would answer yes to your second question in terms of our, my reading, I should say, of the statute uh, of limitations. Uh, in terms of rule of law of values, I certainly uh, think that there is strength in the uh, proposition that no person should be above the law, but I would also say that there is a fundamental fairness question in my mind 
charged as I am as an independent counsel with opining in any way that could be interpreted as sort of a call as to what the appropriate disposition would be of a particular matter. Uh, I know what my duty is. One may disagree with my reading of my duty, but it was to send you this. And then I think in terms of fundamental fairness to all the individuals involved, one simply has to assess that after this body has done its duty and reached its, uh, its judgment. But it would be, I think, wrong to, to answer that it would be right to vindicate the rule of law for criminal charges to be returned. I, I, I think that before we, let me be very, may I, Mr. Chairman? Please, go ahead. Before we ever seek an indictment, we engage not only, and I would hope any prosecutor's office would do that, a very careful assessment of the facts, the elements of the offense, and the like. We, do, we go through each of the elements. We look at the witnesses and the documentary evidence and the like. And then we have to satisfy, following Justice Department standards, is it more likely than not that, that a fair-minded jury would convict based on these facts with the witnesses, and we take the witnesses as we find them beyond a reasonable doubt. Those are judgment calls that I hope that you will excuse me in terms of fairness and not s speaking so directly to in terms of your third question. Gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from California, Mr. Gallagly. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Judge Starr, uh, this has been a long day and, and we still have a long way to go before it's over. So I really appreciate uh, uh, your effort to address all of the concerns of this committee and, and, and thank you for being here. Thank I'd you. like to speak briefly to the credibility of, of some of the witnesses that you interviewed during this uh, the course of the last several months. Several key, key witnesses provided important testimony under oath before the grand jury. In numerous in instances, their version of events conflicted with the testimony of the president. I'd like to know your observation of the witnesses and in evaluating the corroborating evidence, assess the truthfulness uh, specifically of Monica Lewinsky, Betty Curry, and Vernon Jordan. If you could kind of give us a brief assessment of how you feel uh, they are, their credibility is. It is with some reluctance that I uh, answer this because of uh, fundamental fairness uh, concerns. Um, but uh, let me say this. With respect to Ms. Lewinsky, I think she desperately does not want to hurt the president. And at the same time, she has a very considerable memory, a recollection, a memory bank of relevant facts that is quite significant. With respect to Betty Curry, uh, the would, would the uh, witness withhold for a moment? Those questions are are tough questions. I wonder well, if the, it isn't awkward well, for maybe, the perhaps, witness uh, to assess. Perhaps we, uh, if, if Judge Starr would prefer that uh, uh, I visit another area. Just as we speak, I was handed this pass out that apparently is being handed out in the hall by, there's actually no attribution, but I assume it's from our colleagues and friends on the other side of the aisle. Uh, and it references contradictory evidence as it relates to... Would the gentleman, uh, would the gentleman yield? I don't have a copy of that, so I, I don't know that we've received it. I, okay, I well, I will see that. that we get a copy of it. I, I've I'm never, not going to make... I've never seen that document I, I'll be happy to do that, but what I'm, I, I'm not going to ask specific questions relative to this document other than that there is something being handed out contradicting that uh, the president tr made an attempt to hide evidence of the uh, gifts that he may have presented to Ms. Lewinsky, and I will uh, see this, ask that this be made a record of, of the hearing. But uh, briefly, Judge Starr, if we could revisit the Jones deposition. The President was asked whether he had ever given any gifts to Ms. Lewinsky. Does the evidence gathered indicate that the President gave false or misleading testimony when he answered, I don't recall? And I think that maybe would uh, uh, address this handout that we're receiving. Yes, our assessment, and this was an assessment shared by the 
very experienced and career prosecutors, was that the events of December 28, 1997, must have been so clear and vivid in any reasonable person's recollection that the president would naturally have recalled that on January 17, 1998, less than one month later, given the nature of the events which are undisputed of what happened during that Oval Office visit by Ms. Lewinsky to uh, the president over the holiday period. So the recollection was so clear, or the, or the events were so clear, that to suggest that one doesn't recall a Rockettes blanket and the like, the, uh, the various gifts that were shared between the two uh, just, in our view, defied credulity, especially in light of the fact that we did have testimony, which is now before you, that the president is blessed with one of the most powerful uh, memories that many people uh, who have come in contact with a wide variety of people have, have ever seen. So we're told the president's memory is extremely strong. But, Judge Starr, would you say that it would be reasonable to say that might be selective recall? Well, I don't like to get into characterization, but I would simply That's say I would not resist such a characterization. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, participate and yield back the balance of time, and I would like this to be made a record to the hearing. <coughs> uh, there is some objection to that. Can we discuss that? That's fine. I Thank would, you. I would withdraw that request, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The distinguished gentleman from New York, uh, Mr. Nadler. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Starr, we all agree on the paramount importance of the rule of law. Now, Section 594 of t Title 28 of the U.S. Code requires an independent counsel to comply with the written or other established policies of the Department of Justice. Section 77.5 of t Title 28 of the Code of Federal Regulations states in relevant part, and I quote, an attorney for the government may not communicate or s cause another to communicate with a represented party who the attorney for the government knows is represented by an attorney concerning the subject matter of the representation without the consent of the lawyer representing such party." Close quote. Now, I would point out that with respect to Monica Lewinsky, uh, her, her attorney was Frank uh, Carter, who is a criminal as well as a civil attorney, who uh, ran the public defenders program in the District of Columbia's criminal courts for a number of years. And he, the subject matter of the representation, he was the one who developed the affidavit in the Paula Jones case, which was one of the subjects that you were uh, going to question her about, which was the subject of the investigation. Now, these regulations are intended to ensure that a person's right to counsel is respected. Under this policy, your office never should have contacted Monica Lewinsky directly on January 16th without the consent of her attorney, Frank Carter. I have two questions. My first question, but I'll ask you to withhold till my second is asked, is why did your office violate the law and the Justice Department guidelines by contacting her directly on January 16th, since your answer to Mr. Lowell's question is obviously not correct, given what I just said about uh, Mr. Carter's representation in the uh, Jones affair and his being a criminal attorney. Second, under the Justice Department guidelines for all federal prosecutors, it is unethical uh, to keep criminal suspects from calling their lawyers. The evidence suggests that Lewinsky was told by your office not to contact her counsel and that your office in fact suggested that her immunity deal was contingent upon her not count contacting him. Here are some excerpts from Lewinsky's grand jury testimony. Lewinsky. I said I wasn't going to talk to them without my lawyer. They told me that if my lawyer was there, they wouldn't give me as much information, and I couldn't help myself.